You're listening to Bible Truth Feed, a podcast by Christadelphianvideo.org for Christadelphians and all those seeking the truth about the Bible message. Join us now as we present our latest episode. A few things that we know about Peter before we get started. Um, We know that Andrew brought him to Christ. Uh, We won't go there, but I'm just going to give you a few points because we're summarising really uh, a considerable length of material. Uh, It's John 1, 41 to verse 42, and we'll look at that a little bit when we uh, discuss Andrew. Of course, as we know, that was the time when the Lord changed his name from Simon, which means hearing, to Peter, which means rock. Now, Peter and Andrew were sons of Jonah. We know they were fishermen from Bethsaida in Galilee. Uh, And uh, in Luke 10, verse 13, if you take a note of that, Bethsaida had a reputation. So the town that Andrew and Peter came from had a reputation, and that reputation was resistance to Christ. So if we think, uh, brethren, sisters, and young people, that we live in a challenging age because in our environment, There's a challenge to the truth and challenge to accepting Christ. Peter and Andrew came from a town that was known for its resistance to Christ. And Jesus said, woe to thee, Chorazin, woe to thee, Bethsaida, because if the mighty works that I'd done in you were done in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented long ago in sackcloth and ashes. Amazing, isn't it, to think that these towns, which were Jewish towns, uh, had Uh, uh, had greater resistance and weaker acceptance of Christ than the Gentile towns of Tyre and Sidon. So we uh, know that Peter and Andrew were fishermen. They were in partnership with um, James and John, and we'll deal with that also. Uh, That's Luke 5, verse 7 and verse 10. So the four sets, uh, the four uh, brethren, the two sets of brothers, uh, Peter and Andrew and James and John were partners in a fishing business. We know uh, that in uh, Acts 4 and verse 13, that these lower class socioeconomic fishermen from a region despised in Judea, which Galilee was, um, known for poor education, maybe illiteracy, that these men were absolutely outstanding in being able to stand boldly and preach the gospel. And this is what we read of them in, um, in Acts 4 and verse 13. When they saw the boldness of Peter, and John's included in this statement, and perceived that they were unlearned and ignorant men, they marveled. And they took knowledge of them that they had been with Jesus. What an amazing testimony to the transformation of these men. Because these men came from the lowest of social, economic, uh, and despised by those who were the educated and the religious, of course, which was all really um, centred around the temple in Jerusalem, the religious and educated men. They were amazed that these men who were fishermen that had no theological degrees or no experience or certainly weren't seen around the nobility of Jerusalem, how they could just stand up and actually speak like rabbis could speak. And they realise that the difference between those men's past lives and their present boldness was that they had been with Jesus. I wonder if people could look at us and say, this doesn't make sense. These people, I can't explain why they can just confidently just quote the scriptures and preach the gospel. And they should know, brothers and sisters, that it is because we have spent time with our Lord. Peter was one of those men. And, of course, we know that Peter was also not just elevated to become an apostle of the disciples of Christ. He was also elevated to become part of the Peter, James and John trio that were even closer to the Lord in his ministry and were privileged to see things that the others were not. The raising of Jairus' daughter, the transfiguration, the Olivet Prophecy, being part of the Lord's uh, innermost uh, feelings of preparation for um, his ordeal in the Garden of Gethsemane. But Peter was also the first of the 12 to see the risen Christ. And if we have time, we'll consider that. Uh, 1 Corinthians 15, verse 3 to 5, in the list of the appearances, Paul records Peter as 
being uh, visited by the Lord before the 11 and Luke 24 and verse 34, when the two on the road to Emmaus come back to the 11 in Jerusalem, they're met with the news that the Lord is risen and has appeared to Peter. So let's come to Luke chapter 5 and uh, Peter's uh, draft of fishes. You know the story, and we're only going to sketch this very briefly. But just to draw some of the lessons of the progress of Peter's development. Luke 5 and verse 4 to 11, we have that incident of the draft of fishes. And uh, it's an amazing record. You know, you know the story. And we're going to, of course, just focus on a couple of things. Uh, we know in verse 5, um, well, let's start in verse 4. Um, when the Lord had finished speaking, he says to Simon, Simon, launch out into the deep and cast your nets down for a draft a draft of fishes. And Simon says in verse 5, and I hate reading between the lines, but you can imagine an experienced fisherman saying to a carpenter turned preacher, <laughs> you know, Master, we've toiled the whole night. Like we've spent one whole night in the sea fishing and have taken nothing. But look, you know, I don't want to disappoint you or you know, be seen to not, you know, be taking, you know, your position and your words, you know, lightly. So, look, just because you've said, I'll let you, I'll let the, uh, let the net down. And verse 6, and when they had this done, like it doesn't say that they went out fishing and they came back. Like as soon as they had dropped the net down in the deep, they enclosed a great multitude of fishes and their net break. And, of course, they beckoned to... Uh, to James and John to help them and they filled both ships and the ships were beginning to sink under the load of the fishes. And what's Peter's response in verse, verse 8? When Simon Peter saw it, he falls down at the knee, knees of he falls down on his knees before Jesus and says, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. Because he was astonished, and all that were with him at the draft of the fishes which they had taken. And Peter learned a lesson that we need to learn too, brothers and sisters, and that's why he felt so unworthy. He learned a powerful lesson. When the master speaks, don't take any of his words lightly, any. And we've got lots of words that the master has spoken to us, brothers and sisters, and let none of us, Take any of those words lightly or say, well, you know, uh, you know, we're happy because we pretty well follow about 50% of what Jesus had, has said. This was about casting. This is not a, a command to live the truth. This was just simply a direction about catching fish. But Jesus was going to teach him a powerful lesson about this. But I think for, for, for Peter, the thought that he had minimized or underestimated his Lord's words in his reaction, he felt so unworthy of his master's respect when he had treated the Lord's directive, go out into the deep and cast your nets down for a draft. He felt so bad about how he responded. And he did what the Lord had said, but he didn't do it with the right attitude, did he? He did it reluctantly and, well, nevertheless. Just because you've said, I'll do it. But I'm telling you, I'm an experienced fisherman. And I'm, don't tell Peter when you meet him that I embellished this and just suggested what he was thinking. But you can almost read that into the record. But certainly, Peter's response is, depart from me. And, you know, Peter's going to learn a great lesson. Because here's Peter over, overcome with his own guilt, saying to the Lord... We need to be separated from each other. And Peter's going to learn, brothers and sisters, that when he's in a predicament of sin and disappointed with his performance and his loyalty to his Lord, he needs his Lord nearer than ever before. And that's a powerful lesson for us. And that's really the difference between Peter and Judas. Not in this situation, because Peter was thinking that he was unworthy of the Lord's presence, he came to learn that the greater his sin, the more he needed his Lord. It wasn't about saying, I'm not worthy enough. 
Peter understood that his master could be entreated by a contrite and a humble spirit and a confession of wrong and that there was no need for separation. And don't whatever you do, brothers and sisters or young people, when you are disappointed with your performance, you failed your Lord, don't for any moment think that the solution is to walk away from the master or to ask the master to walk away from you. That's the last thing we need to do. We're in a position like Peter's and Peter's going to learn that lesson. And that really is the difference between Peter and Judas, as I mentioned. Judas was not able to return from failure, but Peter was. And, of course, as we know, the Lord was going to say to him, um, from, fear not, Simon, for from henceforth thou shalt catch men. And, of course, that's what's going to be a challenge uh, for uh, for Peter, because uh, that expression, catch men, in the Greek is to catch alive. And we're in the Sea of Galilee, and you know from Matthew 4, verse 14 to 16, that the Lord described the Sea of Galilee as Galilee of the Gentiles, the region of darkness and the region and shadow of death. And Peter was going to find it a challenge to take men alive out of the sea of Galilee of the Gentiles and bring them to the truth. This was going to be a challenge for him, but he was going to do it, and he rose to that challenge. He was Simon, son of Jonah, the same spirit of Jonah, a patriotic spirit, but a spirit that made, that made it difficult for him to accept Gentile converts to the truth, but he rose to that challenge also. Okay, Matthew 14. This is... Um, an amazing record. This is the story of Peter walking on water. A most amazing record. And again, I'm uh, just simply going to take a few things from the record because it's just not possible for us to deal with the record in any detail at all. Uh, but just let's look at from verse 22 onwards. We know the circumstance, so I'm not going to even uh, sketch the background. But you you realise that here we are finding the 12, in verse 24, a ship was in the midst of the sea, tossed with waves, and the wind was contrary. It was blowing against them. And our Lord Jesus Christ appeared to them walking on the water. In verse 26, they were troubled, saying, it's a spirit, and they cried out in fear. But the Lord quelled their fear in verse 27, and straightway he spake to them, saying, be of good cheer, it is I, be not afraid. And if you want to take a note, that's, the exactly, that's exactly the same comfort that he gave them when he appeared to them after his resurrection, when they were troubled at his presence and thought he was a ghost and he comforted them, be of good cheer, it is I. And so Peter responds in verse 28 and says, Lord, if it is you, bid me to come unto thee on the water. And he said, come. And I love the way that Matthew then describes Peter's action. So you don't need me to paint the scene. You're in the scene. If those of you who haven't been uh, out in the sea in a storm, you have to use some imagination. You may have seen uh, film clips of, 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 uh, of sailing boats in storms. But it's a pretty terrifying thing. Like, and it's pretty well a near-death experience. And so here's a fierce storm. And Matthew says, when Peter was come down out of the ship. I mean, think about a storm and the ship is is absolutely with the waves and the winds in a terrifying experience bobbing up and down and going all over the place and Matthew says that Peter comes down out of the ship and the water holds him up and then it says and he walked on the water to go to Jesus I mean for me that just describes a man of great courage and a man of great faith. No one else stepped out of that boat. They were probably hanging on to that boat for fear of death, not to be cast overboard and drowned, and probably their knuckles white holding on to the ship for safety and security. And Peter steps out of the security of the ship. Not only that, he's not only just stepped over the side of the ship, He's actually left the ship and he's holding on to nothing but his faith because Jesus said, come. What an amazing, so Peter is not a coward. 
Peter is not a man who is, you know, in some ways, you know, scared and intimidated. We see him sometimes in the wrong light because of his denial of Jesus. But this is a man of great courage and great faith. He steps out, he lets go, and he's walking towards Jesus. Because we see an amazing testimony of the faith of this man. But, verse 30, when he saw the wind boisterous, he was afraid and beginning to sink. He cried, saying, Lord, save me. And immediately Jesus stretched forth his hand and caught him. The word caught is a beautiful word. In the Greek, it means to seize and to securely grasp. So it wasn't just a reaching out of the hand. The Lord grabbed hold of him. The word means to seize upon something by the hands, to lay hold and to take it into possession. And there were the two of them, the Lord and Peter in the Lord's arms, walking back to the ship as we see. An amazing situation. And, of course, Peter was going to learn a great lesson. He had said, depart from me, I'm a sinful man. But when we're in a storm, brothers and sisters, and life will be a storm, the one thing we must never, ever, ever do is take our eyes off the master. He's the last person to walk away from or to turn away from. We need to recognise, brothers and sisters, that in the storms we can walk on water. And we're walking on water because of our faith and trust in the master who says, you can do this. But we can't take our eyes off of him, brothers and sisters, because if we start focusing on the who said and the what did and all of the circumstances of the storm, which are the winds and the waves, we've taken our eyes off the master. And you'll hear people say, but do you know what that brother or that sister said to me? Or do you know how that ecclesia treated me? We've taken our eyes off the master. And that's what Peter did. And we can't do that. He's in control. And he'll save us. But take your eyes off the wind and the waves. Keep your eyes on the master. This is a lot. Peter would have sunk if he hadn't realised the importance. And the Lord reached out his arms, grabbed hold of him and took him in to the ship and, of course, as we know, rescued the whole lot of them in that storm. And that's why when uh, in verse uh, 31 the Lord responds to him, he says, O thou of little faith, wherefore didst thou doubt? Yes, there was a storm. And it wasn't because... Peter saw the size of the waves or felt the ferociousness of the wind that was the problem. The Lord says, why didn't you trust that I could have kept you up and stopped you from drowning? And that's what we doubt, brothers and sisters. In those moments when the storm engulfs us, that's why we sing, because we don't trust that the master who has kept us afloat till now can continue to keep us afloat until the whole storm goes away and there's ceasing of the wind and a great calm. That's the story of life, brothers and sisters. Matthew 16, we know this record extremely well. Um, and this is, of course, Peter's statement uh, and his great confession. When the Lord said um, to the disciples, um, who do people say that I am? And, of course, they um, proffered some suggestions. Some say you're John the Baptist. I'm reading from verse 14. Some say Elijah. Others say Jeremiah or one of the prophets. And he said to them, so he's talking to the 12, whom say ye that I am? And it's Peter that answers in verse 16. Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Blessed art thou, Simon, son of Jonah, for flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. And, you know, there's something very important for us just to note here, that we have been given secrets that are not from flesh and blood origin. They have been revealed to us by our Father in heaven. And, you know, when the disciples asked Jesus, why do you speak in parables? 
Why don't you just speak in plain English because people are listening to you and have no idea what you're talking about. He said, the reason I'm speaking in parables is because it is given to you to know the secrets of the kingdom. It is not given to them. And we ought never to underestimate, brothers and sisters, the blessing of the opening of our eyes and divine enlightenment that has revealed things to us which people have spent lifetimes studying from the scriptures and will never see the true identity of Messiah. The, the apostasy believes in a Messiah that does not exist. Well, he does exist. He exists in the figment of their imagination. But they don't know the real Jesus Christ, nor do they believe in the real Jesus Christ. And the Lord had said, hadn't he, it's life eternal to know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom thou hast sent. That does not come from flesh and blood. All of our studying in the scriptures will never yield that, brothers and sisters. That comes because God has opened our eyes and given us the secrets of the kingdom because we have sought to understand the truth, not what's popular, the truth. And God has opened our eyes to see that. Flesh and blood has not revealed this unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. And, of course, upon that statement, there's the foundation of the building of the ecclesia and the keys of the kingdom, which will um, hopefully, well, I can see that it's already 10 o'clock, so I'm going to struggle to get through the keys. But anyway, um, but you know the, uh, the way that that, um, that that statement ends up uh, by leading into the keys of the kingdom. Uh, and those keys are going to be important for Peter to understand. And so that's why the first key is outlined in verse 21 when Jesus from that time forth began to show to his disciples, so I'm still in Matthew 16, verse 21, that he's going to go to Jerusalem and suffer many things of the elders, chief priests, scribes, be killed and raised again the third day. Peter needs to understand the keys of the kingdom. You're going to follow me? You need to know where I'm going. That's where I'm going. And, of course, as we know, Peter took him and began to rebuke him. Peter's reaction to the first key was very strong. He, we read, took him. You imagine Peter taking Christ. So that expression doesn't necessarily mean that he grabbed hold of him, but by his response, he grabbed hold of Jesus and his words and started to rebuke him. And said, be it far from thee, Lord, this shall not be unto thee. Wow. Was Peter well-meaning? Of course he was well. Peter is always well-meaning. But he had made a terrible mistake in challenging the words of his master. He did it, of course, out of sympathy. He did it out of loyalty. He took Jesus, he began to rebuke him, saying, Be it far from thee, Lord, this shall not be unto thee. And we know the Lord's response. He turned and said unto Peter, Get behind me, Satan. You are an offence unto me. The word offence means you are causing me to stumble. You want to trip me up in my walk. That's what you're trying to do, Peter. You've become my adversary, my enemy. You're opposing me. You're standing in my way. And what had Peter done that had manifested him as the Lord's adversary and as someone who was trying to trip the Lord up in his walk in the truth? What he had done was he was looking at things from the human perspective. Thou savourest the things that be of, sorry, thou savourest not the things that be of God, but those things that be of men. You want to cause your friends to stumble in the truth and to fall over in their walk of faith? View their circumstances from the human perspective. That's how you do it. And they'll fall every time. Oh, well, we're being sympathetic. Brother Con, we just need to understand, you know, have you been in the situation? It's not about whether I've been in the situation. It's not about the fact that the human experience is going to encompass every single one of us. That's not the point. 
You look at things from the human perspective, you will cause people to fall on their face in the truth. That's what Peter had done here. We need to retain the divine perspective. How does God see the situation? What does God say of this situation? That's the only way to see things from the right perspective. And that's the only way to support people who understand what it means to follow Messiah to the cross in order to achieve the crown. A, an important lesson for us, brothers and sisters, when we're dealing with challenges in life, don't cause your friend to fall over in the truth because you have just given them human sympathy and human support and you're looking at the circumstance and validating their human experience. Don't do that. You'll make them stumble in the truth. And the other thing we need to do, like Peter did here, which he did, as we know, Peter was prepared to accept, and this is another difference between Peter and Judas, Peter could accept a rebuke, and it was a strong rebuke. Get behind me, Satan. You're an offence to me. That's a strong rebuke. And there are some people who cannot accept rebuke. They will hold a grudge, and they will never let you forget what you said. And it might have been true, but some people cannot be told. Judas was one of those people, but not Peter. And we have the words of, of the proverb, if you reprove, sorry, don't reprove a scorn because he'll hate you. <laughs> and I've had that experience. You've probably had it too. It's an unpleasant experience because out of the goodness of your heart, all you're doing is bring to bear the principles of the truth on a situation. A scorner will hate you for that. But you rebuke a wise man, and he will thank you and he will love you. And that's Peter, a beautiful example. Um, the next one is Matthew 18. So I'm going to just try and be very brief here because I can see that I'm uh, certainly not going to get through what I had planned to get through, but that's fine. So Matthew 18, we have the record of Peter's question about whether seven times in one day was sufficient for him to show forgiveness. And you can imagine you know, someone comes to you and um, in some way uh, uh, sins against you. So we're not just talking about somebody, you know, not uh, being pleasant or polite or courteous. Someone actually trespassing. So they're actually doing something wrong, right? They might, I don't know, steal $50 out of your wallet. I don't know. Or they might um, uh, they might do something that is a trespass. So, so, um, so Peter now wants to ask the Lord's question, and he says to him in verse 21, how oft shall my brother uh, sin against me and I forgive him till seven times? And the Lord says to him in verse 22, I say not unto thee until seven times, but until 70 times seven. Uh, and the Lord had said in uh, Luke 17, if you're taking notes, verse three to four, the Lord had said, take heed to yourselves. If thy brother trespass against thee, rebuke him. If you repent, forgive him. And if he trespass against thee seven times in a day, seven times in a day, turn again to thee and say, I repent, you'll forgive him. So the Lord had said that in that situation, you should forgive. Peter's question was, is seven times enough? Like, is that all I have to do? Like on the eighth time, I can pay him out. And Jesus was saying, don't count. 70 times seven. And Peter needs to learn this lesson because he's going to get to a situation where he's in desperate need of mercy and forgiveness. And the difference between Peter and Judas is that Peter understood the extreme, unlimited mercy that flows from the Father. And he came back from a very, very big mistake from which Judas could not. And if you're taking notes, um, there's also the reference, which we won't go to now, but Psalm 103 and verse 8 to 14 is a beautiful psalm. Uh, and it describes how Yahweh's mercy uh, is without limits from east to west. We haven't got time to deal with it, but it's a good one uh, to put alongside of that, uh, as is the uh, proverb 
a just man falleth seven times and riseth up again. That's going to be Peter. And I'm suggesting that the reason Peter could get up from a major failure in his life, a public failure, and recorded for us, as we know in the scriptures, was because he believed in the mercy of the Father and the mercy of the Lord. Judas did not believe in the mercy of the Lord. And so, sadly, Judas chose the wrong path. But it is important for us to recognise, brothers and sisters, we're going to fall. The proverb says a just man. A just man is a righteous man. And a just man falls. And he falls seven times. But the thing is, he gets up. And that's the key thing. It doesn't matter how many times we fall. That's not what you count. What you count is that after the fall, you get up. And in the Lord's words, you make amends. You accept the consequences, you confess, and you try again. And that's what Judas was uh, Judas was uh, unable to do, but Peter was able to do. Okay, we might need to... Um, oh, okay, so the next slide is probably um, uh, in the same vein and a reference to the way in which um, that psalm, the beautiful psalm 103, shows that our transgressions will be removed from us as far as the east is from west. A beautiful scripture. I've got that little um, compass there because, as you know, east and west is if you travel east, like when do you stop travelling east? Or when do you stop travelling west if the globe is your compass? But if you travel north and south, you get to the North Pole and then you'll be travelling south. So there's limits to north and south. There's no limits to east and west. And it's quite a powerful psalm that helps us to appreciate how amazingly gracious the mercy of God is. And Peter understood that mercy until 70, no, not seven times, till 70 times seven. Okay, so we're going to move now to um, Luke 22. This is the upper room, and you'll know the situation well. Um, so I just want to point out uh, the involvement of Peter um, concerning the washing of the disciples' feet. Now, um, please forgive me for uh, being brief, but, of course, the lesson uh, that the Lord was going to learn from this situation uh, was that the Lord uh, wanted the disciples to understand that he was among them as one that served. I wanted to come here because um, if we put all of the records together, we know that um, it was Peter and John that went to prepare for the Last Supper. And the Lord's instructions was that they were to follow a man bearing a pitcher of water. And that pitcher of water happened to land in the upper room on that night. And there was a pitcher of water and there was a bowl and a towel there at the entrance of the room. But, of course, none of them were prepared to do what ought to have been done had the servant been there to perform that task as they entered into that room, and that was to wash their feet. And I'm sure that all of them sat at the meat at the table, and John records that while supper was in progress, so they started eating, but the Lord got up and washed their feet. But what is quite amazing is the Lord gave them space to see if any of them would step in and fill in the role of the servant who had obviously somehow forgotten to come or wasn't able to come. And you can imagine each of them saying, and particularly Peter, who was the one that protested his loyalty to the Lord above all of the others, saying, well, mate, I'm going to be a king tomorrow in the kingdom when it's going to be established because that's what their expectation was. I mean, that's not my job. And none of them got up. And, of course, we know it took the Lord to say to them, that you need to do what I have done. I've given you an example, and you need to wash one another's feet. Well, of course, Peter responds, as we know, to this situation um, by saying that the Lord needed to wash his, uh, his, uh, his whole uh, body. You need to wash um, all of me. And, of course, the Lord says um, you don't need to, um, you know, to, no need to be washed again, but just your feet and Peter was going to understand understand a lesson that the Lord wanted to teach him. And he was going to uh, express this beautifully in his epistle. Whosoever will be great among you, let him be your minister. Whosoever will be chief among you, let him be your servant. 
And the Lord wanted them to understand that the Lord came not to be ministered unto, but to minister and to give his life for many. And we might sort of think, oh, well, the Lord really made the mistake in elevating Peter because his arrogance was as a result of his elevation. But elevation is not really to be blamed. Arrogance is bad, irrespective of whether a person has been elevated or not elevated. But Peter was going to come to understand that elevation was an elevation to service, not an elevation to a position of status. And when you come to um, Luke 22 and verse um, 31, and um, because we know that there was a strife among them in verse 26, Luke records who was going to be the greatest and Peter, of all of them, protested that though all these shall be offended because of thee, yet will not I, arrogance had taken over Peter. But the Lord says to him in verse 31, and I'm just going to do you, um, um, I, I can probably do this quickly. I'm going to um, uh, do an experiment um, because some of us uh, may not be aware of uh, just the value of the King James translation. And in this section, it's one of many sections where you can show the benefit of the King James translation. I'm going to read to you the ESV and the NIV, and I'm just going to ask you to tell me what you think is being said, and then I'm going to read the, read the KJV. So this is the ESV for verse um, 31 and 32. ESV, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan hath demanded to have you that he might sift you like wheat, but I have prayed for you that your faith may not fail. And when you have turned again, strengthen your brothers. I'm going to read the NIV now. Simon, Simon, Satan has asked to sift you as wheat, but I've prayed for you that your faith may not fail. And when you have turned back, strengthen your brothers. So the NIV leaves out, Satan has desired to have you. Now, because of time, I'm not going to ask you to tell me what you think the Lord said, but we could conclude that this was a discussion about Peter. Now, the King James translation, some people mistakenly think that the King James translation, which has a combination of these and thous and yous and yours, is actually just using the language of the day. And if you want to know whether that's true or not, just read the preface to the King James Bible and the letter of the translators to King James, and you will know that thee and thou was not the language of the day because they talked to King James using you and your. So thee and thou was not the language of the day. But thee and thou, which existed in the English language, could faithfully translate the distinction that the Hebrew and the Greek makes between singular and plural pronouns. And that gives us critical meaning. So now that we know that whenever the King James translation says thee and thou, we're talking about one person, and when the King James translation reads you and your, it's talking about a group of people, more than one, because that's the consistent translation of the King James. Let's read it and then you tell me what is meant by these verses. The Lord said to Simon, the Lord said rather, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan hath desired to have you. What's that, singular or plural? Plural. That he might sift you as wheat, singular or plural? Plural. But I have prayed for thee, singular or plural? Singular. That thy faith fail not. When thou art converted, strengthen thy brethren. Now, this is powerful, brothers and sisters and young people, and it's powerful because the Lord is telling us I mean, the Lord prayed for all of the disciples in John 17. That was a prayer on behalf of the whole lot of them. This is a different prayer. And the Lord is telling Peter, Satan has desired to have all of you. And the Satan is the adversary of the Jewish elders who are going to arrest the Lord Jesus Christ. And the Lord was saying to Peter in verse 32, but you are the one at greatest risk of sinking in this storm. You're the one who I fear will lose his faith and never return to the truth. And I want you to know, Peter, that in this storm, I have made a special prayer for you, Peter, singularly you, Peter, because you're the one at the greatest risk of losing your faith because of the storm that's coming, and we know the storm. 
and we know how it engulfed Peter. And Peter could have been a Judas, brothers and sisters. The Lord tells us that in these verses. He could have been a Judas. And the Lord feared that and interceded on his behalf because he wanted Peter to survive the storm. Okay, I'm going to miss that. Uh, Hebrews 7, verse 25. The Lord was making intercession. He was praying on Peter's behalf. And that's why Peter could be saved from the uttermost dire storm as Peter was, because the Lord was there. And I'm not going to go to the uh, incident of the, uh, the uh, Garden of Gethsemane. Um, you know the story of the Garden of Gethsemane. In the Garden of Gethsemane, Peter stands as a hero prepared to defend his Lord with a sword when there's at least 600 Roman soldiers there to arrest a whole lot of them. Who of, who of the others would have dared to do that, to defend his Lord, even if he had to die for it? And were it not that the Lord condemned him, Peter would have, of course, been captured there and then for his, uh, his violence. The Lord saved Peter by rebuking Peter in front of them all. Peter had lost the keys. Ought not all the things that the prophets have said concerning me be fulfilled, Peter? He lost the keys. I've got to suffer. And Peter, because of his blindness in understanding Bible prophecy, the Lord had been at pains to give them a prophecy of everything that he would go through, including being mocked and scourged and crucified and rise again the third day. But their eyes, Luke tells us in Luke's gospel, were blinded to the reality of those words because they had an expectation the kingdom of God should immediately appear. They wanted the kingdom. He was not following Christ. He wanted the kingdom, which is why I said to you last night, the mark is Christ. And they wanted the kingdom and it blinded them to the journey that they had should have set in their GPS that the destination was Jesus Christ. And that's why Peter sadly lost his faith because he didn't follow the scriptures as the Lord said he should have followed. So I'm summarising, I know, because I can see that I've run out of time. Um, let me just see where we can go from here. We, we know about Peter's denial and his denial was, of course, because he was totally disoriented because he had lost his focus on the keys of the kingdom. The Lord had clearly told him that. And he was blinded to that because of his expectation that the kingdom should immediately appear. But, of course, what happened, we know that the Lord's eyes met Peter's eyes in the trial of the Lord Jesus Christ after Peter had thrice denied that he knew the Lord. And what was that look? It says that the Lord looked on Peter and Peter remembered the words that he had spoken. And it wasn't a look of, I told you so. It wasn't a look of disdain. It wasn't a look of disappointment. It was the look that was conveyed in these words that we've just read in verse 32. I'm anxious for you, Peter, that your faith doesn't fail because I know what's coming. You say all of these will uh, deny and be offended because of you, but not me. Peter, I know what's coming. And because I know that this could be a failing point in your life, I have made a special prayer for you. And when, not if, when you are converted, I sort of think converted? I mean, he was three and a half years a disciple and for some of that time an apostle of Jesus Christ with the power of the Holy Spirit preaching the gospel, the most prominent of the apostles and the most prominent of the select three of the apostles. And when you're converted, because conversion doesn't happen at baptism, brothers and sisters. Conversion happens when the circumstances and experiences of life make us realise exactly what the master meant when he called us to serve him. That's the point of conversion. That's the point at which the Peter becomes Christ, becomes as his master. When you're converted, and when you're converted, your brethren need you, Peter, and strengthen your brethren. And, of course, Peter did that. An amazing recovery from a near failure 
of his faith, an amazing recovery to see Peter there in John 21. So let's finish in John 21. So I hope you forgive me for being um, quite brief uh, because each of those episodes uh, can obviously be explored in greater detail. So I was just hoping that you would allow me just to summarise until we get to this point. And you know this discussion between Jesus and Peter uh, in John chapter 21. And the Greek helps us to appreciate the, um, the drama of this experience. Because when the Lord speaks to um, Peter, and we'll, we'll come, uh, come in at verse um, 15, we, and you may have these uh, words marked in, in your margin. The first word in, in verse 15, love or lovest, is the Greek word agape. And so the Lord's question, the first question of three, the Lord's first question of three to Peter is, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me, it's the word agape, more than these do? So here's the question. This is like the judgment seat, isn't it? And we're going to be in a situation like this where the Lord's going to ask us, do you really love me? And, of course, Peter had boasted that his love for the Lord transcended the love of the other of his um, fellow apostles. So the Lord's question is, do you have an agape love for me, a divine love that would even go to the sacrifice of self for me more than that of your fellow disciples? And Peter's response, the word love there is the word filio. So it's like someone saying, um, do you love me? And Peter says, I like you. So it's a very, very deliberate conversation that is not uh, unfortunately conveyed because the translators have used the same word love for both agape and filio. But a simple um, look in the concordance will pre help us appreciate what is being said. So Peter now is not boasting above what he knows his limitations are. He's accepting that he would love to say yes, but he can't say yes. Here's a man humbled and converted and not prepared to protest his loyalty or love to his Lord beyond what he knows his failures have led him to conclude. Yes, Lord, you know that I have a filio love for thee. And then the Lord says, well, if that's the case, you need to feed my lambs. So the second question comes in verse 16. Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me? So let's just put the other apostles aside for a minute. Let's not compare you with them like you did. Let's just say, do you have an agape love for me, Peter? And Peter says, you know that I have a filio love for you. What an amazing conversion has happened to this man who would have loved to have protested in this interrogation or this, this discussion, protested his loyalty for the Lord. But in doing so, he is showing the true spirit that the Lord wanted him to reach in his conversion. And so the Lord says, feed my sheep. Now, the third time is the most painful of all questions. The Lord says to him the third time, Simon, son of Jonas, do you have a filio love for me? And you can imagine how painful it would have been for Peter to have had that question. Do you have an affection, a friendship for me, Peter? And here's a man who had come to understand that the judgment and the word of his Lord was always right. Peter was grieved because the third time his filio love for the Lord was questioned. And he said to him, Lord, thou knowest all things. But please, please, you must know that I love you as a friend. And Jesus said, well, if you love me, then you need to feed my sheep. And we're comforted by that response, brothers and sisters, because, do you know, when we are asked that question, how will it be determined that we have loved the master? In that day, it will be because inasmuch as you have done it unto one of the least 
the least of these, my brethren, you have done it unto me, quoting from Matthew chapter 25. That is how he will know whether we have loved him or not, brothers and sisters. This room contains brothers and sisters of our Lord Jesus Christ. Do an assessment, grade them from one to, I don't know how many are here, 100. Grade them. And find the one who scores last, the least in your estimation. And your love for your Lord will be determined by what you've done to that brother or sister. And that's why Peter finishes uh, his, um, his epistle. And I'm just going to read this in conclusion. I hope you forgive me for going over time. Just, I'm just going to read a couple of verses from Peter's first epistle, uh, chapter 5. And just verse 5 to 16, five, sorry, 5 verse 1 to 6, just six verses. But just it helps us appreciate that all of those experiences shape this man and they're expressed in, in the words that he wrote as he did follow the Lord's request to um, feed his sheep. And as we read in verse 19, uh, when the Lord finished the discussion, he followed it by saying, follow me. Because now Peter was ready to follow. Now Peter was behind. He had repositioned himself and he was now in a position to follow. How encouraging. You can't follow me now, but you will follow me afterwards. And that was certainly true. And so Peter says, the elders which are among you I exhort, who am also an elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ and also a partaker of the glory that shall be revealed. They are the two keys, aren't they, of the kingdom? Feed the flock of God which is among you, taking the oversight, not by constraint, but willingly, not of filthy lucre, but of a ready mind. The flock of, a God, of God which is among you, not beneath you. Take the oversight. Be a carer of your brethren. Have an oversight of their welfare. That's your job. That's your job description. Neither as being lords over God's heritage, but being in samples to the flock, that when the chief shepherd shall appear, ye shall receive a crown of glory that fadeth not away. I like, likewise, ye younger, submit yourselves unto the elder. Yea, all of you be subject one to another and be clothed with humility because God resists the proud and gives grace to the humble. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you in due time. Um, his name uh, from the Hebrew Yohanan means Yah is gracious. And as we know, names uh, are important in the scriptures. Names have meanings and names do actually bear um, some resemblance to the characters. Uh, and John is no exception to that. Now, we know from a number of references, uh, I'm just going to put up a, a summary of some of the key things that uh, I suppose we know about John. And I'll um, tell you the justification for uh, most of those, hopefully, uh, during the course of the introduction. Um, I think he was probably fairly young. Um, he was definitely a fiery person. Um, he was ambitious, and we'll see that. And obviously, one of the beautiful things that um, he recalls for us in his gospel concerning himself is when he describes himself as the disciple whom Jesus loved. Now... Just putting uh, a few of the uh, key references in the Gospels together about his family connections, John, along with James, uh, was the sons of Zebedee and Salome. Now, Salome, and I'm, uh, I've got a number of references. If you are interested in piecing together the family, uh, I can definitely give you those quotes. But I'm just going to ask you to accept for now uh, the conclusions, which are that Salome and Mary, the Lord's mother, were actually sisters in the flesh. So Salome, who's the mother of John and James, 
his sister to the Lord's mother, Mary. So as a result of that, uh, James and John were actually the Lord's cousins. And I think it helps us to understand the dynamics of the family, which obviously prevailed in relationships during the Lord's ministry. Now, we know if we compare Mark 15, verse 40 to 41, which records the women that came to the uh, sepulchre where Joseph and Nicodemus laid the Lord to rest. Um, in that scripture, Mark makes a reference that Salome was amongst the women who followed Jesus during his ministry and ministered to him of her substance. And those women are actually recorded also in Luke 8, verse 2 to 3, uh, as women that followed the Lord during his ministry, ministering to him. So from that, we can conclude that Salome was a very devoted disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, he and James, therefore, shared some disappointment about the estrangement that had happened with the Lord's own family, so that is their cousins, because Mary, the Lord's mother, and his brothers and sisters became separated from the Lord during his ministry and were not followers of him during his ministry. And you and I would therefore be able to conclude about the dynamics in the relationship between Salome and Mary and following down to the next generation, James and John and their cousins who are recorded for us um, were not disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ. And one of the places uh, is the Lord's discussion uh, recorded in Matthew 12. And you'll know the story when Jesus' mother and his brethren, and we need to understand when the term brethren is used in the New Testament, the Greek word encompasses both brothers and sisters. So when you hear people say brethren in Christ, it's not brothers excluding sisters. Brethren is inclusive of brothers and sisters. Now, in that story, you remember that Jesus' mother and his brethren, so brothers and sisters, stood outside when Jesus was in the house discoursing with those that were within, and the message came to him that was passed down from the outside of the house to where the Lord was. Behold, your mother and your brothers and sisters are outside desiring to speak with thee. And you remember how the Lord responded. He said, who's my, who's my mother and who are my brethren? And he pointed towards his disciples and says, behold, my mother and my brethren. Have a look. They're here, inside, not outside. And then he said, because whosoever doeth the will of my father, the same is my brother and sister and mother. Quite an amazing thing to think that the Lord publicly disowned Mary and his brothers and sisters during his ministry. And the reasons for that was that they were offended as a result of the course of his ministry and no longer followed him. The animosity in the family got so bad that John records in John 7 verse 5, neither did his brethren believe in him. So they had actually lost their belief that he was the Messiah. And that dynamic continued until, of course, we know one of the most amazing reunions, family reunions, and restorations to the truth was recorded by Luke in Acts chapter 1 when the ecclesia first gathered, numbering about 120 people, and Luke records that in that ecclesia was Mary and the Lord's brothers and sisters. What You imagine the reconciliation between Salome and Mary and James and John and his cousins as a result of them coming into the truth. Because, of course, as we know, Paul records in 1 Corinthians 15 that when the Lord was risen, he appeared unto James, which is his half-brother James. And as a result of that, the testimony of his resurrection filtered through to the family and that brought them into the truth. So for three and a half years, an estranged family that was separated over the truth became reconciled and John was part of that process of restoration because as we know, at the foot of the cross, the Lord commissioned the care of Mary into the hands of John and we'll deal with that briefly, hopefully this morning. So that's Acts 1 verse 13 to 14. If you're taking notes and what the scripture references, the reference to Mary and the Lord's brothers and sisters in the ecclesia, that would have been an amazing conversion and reconciliation. Now, John was called by the Lord at Bethsaida on the shores of the Sea of Galilee. We talked about the partnership that James and John had with uh, Peter and Andrew as they were partners in fishing uh, in the region of Galilee, which was, of course, hostile to the Lord Jesus Christ. In Matthew 4, verse 21 to 22, 
in the call uh, of the Lord uh, of um, John and James, we're actually told that not only did they leave the ship, they also left their father and followed him in responding to the call of Jesus Christ to follow him. Now, we're not told whether Zebedee was a follower or a disciple of Christ. There are hints to me, and I'll, I don't like making assertions or assumptions where there's no ground, so I'm, I'm not going to be definitive about things that we don't know. But I am, um, I am uncertain as to whether Zebedee was an actual disciple. And uh, when we come to um, the request of Salome for James and John uh, uh, in their positions in the kingdom, I think the record almost hints at that. However, the record is absent as to whether Zebedee was a disciple or a follower of Christ. However, it is very clear that Salome was. So maybe when um, Matthew records that James and John left their father and the ship and the fishing business to follow the Lord, maybe that's telling us that the Lord was requiring John to place the relationship uh, that he had with the Lord Jesus Christ above that of his own family. And sometimes that is required, as we know. I think that James, James and John, who were the two brothers of them, I think John was the younger, and I can't be dogmatic about this, of course, but Mark 5, verse 37, in just talking about Peter, James and John, as we know, they were selected amongst the apostles who were given special um, experiences and privileges that the other uh, the other of the apostles were not. But in that reference, Mark 5, verse 37, when Jesus suffered no man to come into the house when he raised Jairus' daughter, we read, save Peter and James and John the brother of James. It's almost as though uh, John is the younger of the three. Uh, and maybe he was younger than Peter. And this is, again, complete supposition. But you know the story in John 20, of Peter and John having been told by Mary Magdalene that the, that the stone had been rolled away, Peter and John run to the sepulchre, and, of course, John outruns Peter. So it either means that John was fitter or he was younger than Peter. Be that as it may, I have a sense that John may have been younger amongst the apostles. Um, John was sent to preach with James, his brother. It's interesting when you read the way in which the Lord sent out the apostles two and two, and they're almost grouped in groups of twos, and the word and separates the, the groups. They were sent out in twos. Uh, and it's interesting that Peter is sent out with Andrew and James and John were sent out together. And it's beautiful, isn't it, when you see the Lord wanting to cement or build upon family relationships in the truth and lift them to a, a, a greater level of service. And uh, we, we delight to see brothers in the flesh united, of course, together in the truth. And it's sad, therefore, conversely, to see when family friction occurs within the brotherhood. It's really nice to see brothers in the flesh working together for Christ. And James and John, as were Peter and Andrew, are examples of that. Um, we listed the times in which, of course, Peter, James and John were able to uh, enter into um, experiences unique to them, which was a wonderful privilege. We talked about that in our study uh, this morning uh, on Peter. Maybe if you can come with me to Mark 3, verse 17, where we have the record of Jesus surnaming James and John, because the title, John the Son of Thunder, um, that really John shared with James, his brother. Now, remember we said that names in the scriptures are significant. Well, this is not just a name. Remember, Peter was given um, a surname. He was Simon and he was surnamed Peter. Well, James and John are also surnamed. So we would therefore assume that a surnaming by the Lord held greater significance about the life of the person than even their name, which, were the, which were, was named, um, uh, named them by birth. And so we read in verse 17 of Mark 3, James, the son of Zebedee, and John, the brother of James, and he surnamed them Boanerges, which is the sons of thunder. 
And I think that's because of their temperament and their character and their personality. You know what thunder is? Um, and a person that is a thunderous person is a person of great dynamic character, maybe fearsome in the way in which anger can rise up. Um, and you can imagine passionate uh, men like James and John uh, would be like a thunderstorm that could erupt if the circumstances um, the circumstances in their life are the same as the um, circumstances that uh, prevail when a thunderstorm is created. And these two brethren, we believe um, there, are, there are evidences in the record were actually very fiery and very passionate and very strong characters. Now, when you come to Matthew chapter 20 and the request that we referred earlier um, that Salome made on behalf of her, her sons, so this is Matthew 20 and verse 20, it's just interesting the way that Mark, uh, sorry, Matthew records this incident and think about the language as we read it. Then came to him the mother of Zebedee's children with her sons, worshipping him and desiring a certain thing of him. Now, this must have, um, uh, this must have been uh, indicative of a close relationship or a respected relationship that Salome um, experienced with the Lord Jesus Christ. For her to be comfortable making this request, and, you know, she's... She's the mother of grown sons who are not only disciples but empowered with the Holy Spirit, healing and preaching the kingdom, and mummy's making this request on behalf of her baby boys who are grown men. Uh, so to me there's an indication here of Salome's um, relationship to Christ that she can make this request on behalf of her sons, and obviously uh, it, did, uh, it, it, did, uh, it didn't come from James and John when it could have. It came from uh, it came from Salome, and maybe the, the uh, James and John were too apprehensive to make this request, even though they desired it. And Salome said, "Well, I'm going to make the request on your behalf." So, um, what was the thing? Jesus said to her, "What wilt thou?" And she said, "Grant uh, that these my two sons." And there's again a hint that they were her sons, as distinct from Zebedee's sons, because of course they were. Uh, disciples and apostles. Grant that these my two sons may sit, the one on thy right hand and the other on the left in thy kingdom. And of course, the Lord, um, and you know the, uh, re the reference that John makes at the end of John 2, that the Lord needed not that any should testify of man, for he knew what was in man. The Lord could see that this request came from James and John because he directs his attention to James and John in verse 22. He says, ye know not what ye ask. Are ye able to drink? Uh, are ye able, sorry, yes, to drink of the cup that I shall drink of and to be baptised with the baptism that I am baptised with? And they say unto him, so they're straight in on the conversation, and the they being James and John, we are able. And, of course, then the Lord says unto them, ye will indeed drink of my cup and be baptised with the baptism I am baptised with. However, to sit on my right hand, and on my left is not mine to give, but it shall be given to them for whom it is prepared of my father. Now, you can understand then, because this was done in the hearing of the 10 in verse 24, that when they heard it, they were moved with indignation against the two brethren. And, of course, the Lord then launches into a discussion about humility and service, which concludes then in that beautiful reference in verse 28 that we quoted this morning. The Son of Man did not come to be served by other people. He came to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. And this rivalry between the apostles continued right through to the upper room, because we read about that this morning, in the upper room of all places, when the Lord was seeking to prepare them for what was happening and the significance of his sacrifice uh, on their behalf. There's a strife that breaks out, which of them should be the greatest? And they had to learn humility and they had to learn that it wasn't about status. It was actually about following Christ for the right reason. And we need to also be uh, mindful, brothers and sisters, that we seek the kingdom, yes, but the, sin the kingdom can be sought for the wrong reason if it's all about us. 
and it's not about us. It's about whether we are following the master and the keys um, are outlined here, baptised with the baptism that I am baptised with. And of course, that baptism we know was uh, symbolised in what we call the act of baptism. But baptism, real baptism, is being crucified with Christ, being buried with Christ and being risen to a new life in Christ. And the Lord was going to go through that experience in the physical reality of a crucifixion and a burial and a resurrection. And therefore, baptism for us, brothers and sisters, is not being dipped in water after believing the gospel. Paul tells us that very clearly in Romans chapter 6. Baptism is actually a life that commences at the ritual of baptism, which is a life by which daily we crucify the flesh with the affections and lusts thereof, where we daily have to bury the past, even if that's the immediate past, bury it and move on, and we have to get up, rise up, and walk in newness of life. And James and John uh, were therefore focused on what it was really all about. The kingdom will come later in its time. Focus on what it means to follow me. These are the keys of the kingdom. One of the beautiful things, of course, that we know of John um, is that expression that he used, that he uh, didn't record himself by his name uh, in his gospel. He referred to himself as the disciple whom Jesus loved. Now, I counted five times where that is recorded in John's gospel, and it's interesting that his name, which means the grace of Yahweh, um, corresponds with the five occurrences of that expression, the disciple whom Jesus loved loved now of course he loved all of the disciples john 13 which records the last supper says he loved them to the uttermost them being the 12 including judas so how did this distinguish john as a means of identifying himself when it's clear that jesus loved all of his disciples well it didn't distinguish him as being the only person Jesus loved. It distinguished him as a person who treasured being loved by the Master. That, to me, is a beautiful expression of the closeness of John's relationship to Jesus. We all would say, if someone questioned us, does the Lord love you? But fancy for John that being such a precious thing that he actually recognised and appreciated the privileged position he was in. And I don't think we always appreciate just how much the Lord loves us. And that was expressed in John's affection for the Lord Jesus Christ. John records in his 13th Gospel in the Last Supper that John was lying in the breast of Jesus. They were very close as two friends in the truth. Like David and Jonathan, and remember David said of Jonathan that his love for me was great, surpassing the love of women. It was an amazing, deep love, and John felt loved. It's one thing to like, academically know that God loves us and the Lord loves us as our master. It's another thing to actually acknowledge that and to describe yourself as someone who Jesus loves. And we need to, brothers and sisters. We must never forget we are the disciples whom Jesus loves. We forget that we've lost, we've lost a key component to the principles of God manifestation. We really have. Because the whole purpose of the kingdom is to unite a family. And if this is not about our relationship, that we want cemented for eternity, why would we want to be in the kingdom? It's all about our relationship, our relationship to our Father who loved us and our relationship to our Lord who loves us. It is important, and John recognised that, and those sorts of expressions then help us to appreciate just how important uh, affection is in, uh, in the truth. Affection is an important part of being a disciple. 
amongst fellow disciples. And the Lord wanted his disciples to feel that. Certainly John was comfortable in the Lord's presence in, ver in a very tender and intimate way. In fact, the relationship that John had with Jesus, lying in his bosom, lying against his chest as they were lying, reclining on those couches in the Last Supper, is the way in which Jesus described his relationship with his Father. I'm going to read you the words of John 1 verse 18. No man has seen God at any time. The only begotten Son, which is in the bosom of the Father, he hath declared him. That's John 1.18. The Lord felt that he was in the embrace of his Father during his ministry. That's how he felt. And John felt the same way, that he was in the embrace of his Master during their friendship in the truth. And that's why he could comfortably express that in uh, being kindly affection. And, of course, Paul tells us that in Romans 12 and verse 10. Uh, and it is important for us to understand the necessity of showing uh, and being kindly affection, uh, of showing affection one to the other. Of course, we're not talking about the sensual uh, uh, affection of the world. We should never mistake the holy kiss from the sensual kiss or even the kiss that is uh, sanctioned within a marriage union. A holy kiss is totally distinct. And it is important, therefore, that our kisses, if we use that, extending uh, that to an embrace or even the shaking of a hand, that needs to be done in a holy manner, not a suggestive manner, not an inappropriate manner, but that which becomes purity and holiness. And John could feel comfortable in the Lord's presence, in his embrace, and that is recorded for us as an expression of the deepness of their love. And John was absolutely, totally appreciative of how special the Lord made him feel. And we should feel the same. So we come to Luke chapter 9. And here's an incident which really does um, highlight just how strong a character John was. And John, uh, sorry, John, Luke chapter 9 and verse 46 And we're going to start here because, of course, this reminds us of the, the continual strife and competitive nature that sadly uh, was manifested amongst the 12. Then there arose a reasoning among them, which of them should be the greatest. And we can appreciate, um, we can appreciate can't we, just the basis upon which those arguments could have been put forward as to why Peter was the one that should have been the greatest. Because, I mean, it was Peter, James and John. And John could have said, well, I'm the disciple that Jesus loved. And we could, uh, we could see each of them advancing justification as to why uh, one of them should be greater amongst the 12. And, of course, then the Lord, um, again, counsels them, taking a, child in his, uh, uh, taking a child as an example uh, and saying to them, if you want to be um, great, you need to humble yourself. And you need to understand that he that is least among you, the same shall be great. And that leads us into verse 49. And here's John um, as a spokesman for the we, which I'm assuming is James and John. John says, Master, we saw one casting out devils in thy name, and we forbade him because he followeth not with us. So you can see the emphasis in the record. And John is taking... Um, a very protective, but probably, as we know, um, uh, uh, sadly, lacking understanding, uh, an approach to thinking that he needs to make sure that the truth is policed. And I think it is important when we think about uh, the lesson that Jesus was trying to teach John here by his response, that the truth does need protecting and defending. It had the need of protecting and defending from the very beginning when the serpent first spoke his lie and Yahweh declared enmity between truth and error. However, we are not the policemen. That will be done in due time by the power of Christ and the saints when they are given that authority. And so Jesus said to him, forbid him not, for he that is not against us is for us. Now, I do recognise that the apostate church takes this as a justification for ecumenism and unity amongst all 
uh, religions, Christian denominations I'm talking specifically, because, you know, here's the apostles recognising that there were others that were claiming to be Christians or following Christ, doing um, miracles and preaching in his name, and they were not part of our church, not part of our community. And, of course, that can never be the case. And I think it is important for us to stress, particularly for our young people, that when we're talking about unity amongst the followers of Christ, and he was a group that uh, were definitely not part of the 12, we only actually have to look across to chapter 10 and realise that they were not the only ones appointed and commissioned to preach. In ver verse 1 of chapter 10, there's 70 that the Lord commissions, again by twos, and there's no restriction for this group uh, that they would not enter into the city of the Gentiles or Samaritans. They were able to go out and uh, represent the Lord in regions of both Jew and Gentile with no restriction. So the 12 were not the only appointed ambassadors of Jesus Christ. Obviously, John was not aware of that. Um, so this is not a justification of saying all Christians should unite. The Lord had commissioned other uh, other apostles in addition to the 12. And uh, if you take a note of Exodus 15, verse 27, I like to think that the 12 wells and the 70 palm trees uh, at Elam were actually a prefiguring of these two groups, one sent to the Jews and one sent to the Gentiles, because, as you know, the palm represents the Gentiles. But just coming back to my point earlier, we need to understand that there is a distinction between the true followers of Christ and the apostate followers of Christ. And we must never think that the seed of the woman is the ecclesia and the seed of the serpent is the world. Please don't think that because that's not biblical. The seed of the woman is the ecclesia. So I wasn't um, leading you <laughs> into a, a, an alternative um, description or definition of the seed of the woman. And the seed of the woman represents the truth. And in Abel, we can see that that is true worship, true understanding and acceptance before God. The seed of the serpent needs a bit more clarification than just generally saying it's the world. Now, God's put enmity between the two. And he's placed that enmity for a reason. Because the true definition of the seed of the serpent is religious opposition to the truth. Because that's what the serpent represented. He expounded the Bible. He had an opinion about what God said. And Cain, who was his first offspring, was a worshipper of God. Let us not think that the world is the seed of the serpent because we might think, well, that's what you've got to be careful of. Of course, the world has always been bad. But there's something more dangerous to the truth than the world at large, and that is constituted, organised religious opposition to the truth. And that's what the apostate Christian church, and we might say broadly beyond that, but I say Christian because, of course, the other religions don't really believe in a God and the Lord Jesus Christ, as we broadly uh, would say that the term Christian uh, encompasses. But it is important for us to understand, and John is going to be passionately defending the truth against the lie, the error, the light and the darkness, the life and the death, and they are the two opposing forces, and that's why I fear when I hear expressions used in teaching the truth that have come from the apostasy, which sound amazing. You can actually go back to the false prophets in the days of, uh, of the end of, of Judah's commonwealth before the Babylonian captivity and actually find the same message being perpetrated by the false prophets who are protesting to the people that you are saved because you're the ecclesia of God. And, of course, that was the apostasy within the ecclesia because the apostasy was born out of the ecclesia as it has in uh, all uh, epochs of its history. And, of course, that animosity and that enmity and that warfare which God declared is going to continue between truth and error, between true falseship, true worship and false worship, that's going to continue until the seed of the woman destroys the seed of the serpent once and for all time. And John's going to be part of it. So that's why the Lord was able to say to him that um, um, he that is not for he that is not against us is for us. So let's not make 
false conclusions about this being either open fellowship or ecum the ecumenical movement of the church. This has nothing to do with what the Lord was saying. There were others that were commissioned, uh, and we've just seen an example of that in chapter 10. Now, we can keep going in this record because then the Lord approaches Samaria, and we see in verse 51, um, it was uh, for the Lord uh, a time when he was going to be received up, and that's, of course, the joy that was set before him. That was a promised position that the Father had promised him as a result of his faithfulness, and that's the joy that was set before him by which he was inspired to endure the cross uh, and, and the shame. So he steadfastly set his face to go to Jerusalem, and this, of course, is his last journey to Jerusalem. And he sent messengers before his face, and they entered into a village of the Samaritans to make ready for him. And the Samaritans in verse 53, unlike the record of, uh, of John chapter 4, so the fame of the Lord in John 4 in Samaria had died away on this visit, they did not receive him. Why? They did not receive him because they could see in his face that he was determined to go to Jerusalem, and they took that as an insult. So when his disciples, James and John, saw this, they were mortified that the Lord should be given this kind of treatment by the Samaritans. And look at their response. Here's the sons of thunder, <laughs> you know, breathe fire from heaven like Elijah did. Lord, wilt thou that we command fire to come down from heaven and consume them even like Elijah did? Here's our sons of thunder, surnamed Boanerges. Of course, the Lord had said, so if you take a note of Matthew 10, verse 14 to 15, the Lord had said when he commissioned the apostles to go and preach, he said to them, if people don't receive you, if they don't hear your words, depart from that house or city, shake off the dust of your feet, Truly I say to you, it will be more tolerable for the land of Sodom and Gomorrah in the day of judgment than for that city. And so the Lord had definitely told them that judgment was going to be meted out to those that had not accepted Christ or not accepted his ambassadors. However, that day of judgment was not now, and John needed and James needed to understand that. What is interesting if you take a note of um, Acts 8 and verse 16, well, actually verse 14 to 17, you know the record um, about Peter and John who were sent to Samaria, and they were sent to Samaria so that they could impart the Holy Spirit to the Samaritans, uh, which, of course, as we know in Acts chapter 2, came down upon the apostles like cloven tongues of fire. And isn't it interesting to think that you know, there was a different fire from heaven and there was an opportunity in the Acts for uh, Peter and John, John, of course, being included in this, to actually bring down fire from heaven, not the fire of judgment, but the fire of the Spirit of God uh, down from heaven. And it is therefore important for us as uh, James and John and Peter who were commissioned to uh, impart the Holy Spirit. Uh, it's interesting in, eight, uh, in Acts 8 verse 16, it says, For as yet the Spirit was not fallen on uh, on any of them so we've sort of got the fire from heaven and we've got the falling from heaven uh, but of course a very different kind of fire and that's the kind of fire that we need to call down from heaven we don't of course have the power of the holy spirit and we don't have the power of the holy spirit gifts but we have got the spirit that is uh, expressed in the scriptures of truth which is that which is perfect which has uh, replaced that which is in parts and that's the fire we need to call down from heaven. The instructive, empowering word of God, because judgment will come. Make no mistake, but now's not the day for us to call down the judgment of fire from heaven. Now is the day for us to impart the fire from heaven that can empower and, and give people a flame that can ignite a devotion of discipleship to the truth enter the master before the day of judgment comes. And that's why, of course, the Lord in verse 55 turns to um, James and John and rebukes them. Here's another rebuke. Ye know not what manner of spirit ye are of. The Son of Man is not come to destroy men's lives, but to save them. 
And that needs to be the, the burden of our gospel proclamation, brothers and sisters. We, we don't go out there like Jonah and say, in 40 days, Nineveh is destroyed, even though that was a successful preaching mission because we know the response. But that's not the gospel that we preach. The gospel we preach is that the Son of Man is come to save the lives of people ahead of the day of judgment, which is coming. That's the good news of the gospel message. And John was going to come to understand that very thing. Just come to uh, John 13 now. We're moving into the uh, upper room where uh, John has a discussion with the Lord Jesus Christ concerning Judas. And again, I'm not telling you anything you don't already know, but it is important for us to just see um, the development of John's appreciation of the Lord's control of the circumstances of his experience and how a tempted response could thwart that purpose. And John's response to the Lord identifying Judas is quite telling. Um, so we're in John 13, and we know, of course, the Lord um, had announced that one of them uh, would betray him as they, uh, as they met. So verse 21. When Jesus had thus said, he, um, and of course he was talking to them about um, the tragedy of Judas, uh, when he says to them, I'm just going to go back, um, when he says you are clean, um, happy, if you, happy um, verse 17, if you know these things, happy are if you do them. I speak not of you all, I know whom I have chosen, but that the scripture may be fulfilled, he that eateth bread with me hath lifted up his heel against me. And I tell you before it come to pass, so that when it is come to pass, you may believe that I am he. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that receives whomsoever I send receives me. He that receives me receives him that sent me. And when Jesus had finished this discussion about the prophecy of Judas, and he says to them uh, in verse 21, sorry, John records that he was troubled in spirit and testified as a witness. And he had done that because all of his attempts to redeem Judas from his treachery had failed. And we're going to look at that tomorrow, God willing. So troubled in spirit, he gave his verdict as a witness. Truly, truly, I say unto you, one of you shall betray me. It was inevitable now. The Lord could see. And his disciples looked one on another, doubting of whom he spake. And there was leaning on Jesus' bosom one of his disciples whom Jesus loved. And we've spoken about this unique relationship that John shared with Jesus. So Simon Peter beckons to John that he should ask the Lord who it is of whom he spake. So then he lying on Jesus' breast, so this is twice recorded, that John was lying on Jesus' breast, says to him, Lord, who are you talking about? Who's the one that's going to betray you? And the Lord gives John the answer in verse 26. It's the one that when I dip a sop, I give it to him. And having said that to John, he dipped the sop and he gave it to Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon. Now, what would you do if you were in John's position? John, a son of thunder, who wanted to call down fire from heaven, just because the Lord was insulted, did not act. Nor did he respond to Simon Peter, who cut off the earlobe of Malchus in the Garden of Gethsemane. Judas would never, survive, would never have survived if, if Peter was told that Judas was going to betray Jesus. And none of them knew because John records in the arrest in Gethsemane in John 18, that they had no idea. All of a sudden, Judas is standing with them. How did that happen? They had no idea. In fact, if you look at verse um, 28, when Jesus said to Judas, that thou doest do quickly, no one had any idea. They thought, oh, Judas is obviously buying something for the feast of Passover. The Lord had not spilled the beans on Judas. Nobody knew. They had no idea about Judas' treachery. And now there's only two people that know. Ju Jesus knew. Now Jesus and John know, and John does not tell Peter. That, to me, is um, an ex 
a, a, an expression of the royal law that Jesus taught his disciples. <clears throat> and think about these words. You know, when we, when we read there's two great commandments, and hear, O Israel, the Lord thy God is one law. We know that's Deuteronomy chapter 6. Very often we don't realise that thou shalt love thy neighbour as thyself comes from Leviticus 19. And this is what it says. Don't avenge yourself. And don't bear a grudge against the children of thy people. Now, that is not easy. You and I know that that is not easy. But John's composure and his acceptance of who the, treachery, who the treacherous disciple was and the fact that he could see the Lord was in total control, I'm telling you before it comes to pass, so that when it comes to pass, you will know that I'm he. The scripture is going to be fulfilled. We read of that in verse 18. And John has come to trust that the Lord will have the judgment in his own time. And the Lord was prepared to share that secret with John. And John, of course, kept that secret from Peter. And uh, we, know, we can understand why. But that, to me, tells me that John had come a long way. The son of thunder who would call fire down from heaven had come a long way to control his temper and to control his anger and his sense of seeking justice now and leaving it in the Lord's capable hands. Now, that, that makes me ashamed when I read, Thou shalt not avenge. How many times do we feel like getting justice? And it eats us out when we're not fairly dealt with and we want to make things right and we take matters into our own hands to make things right. This, these are hard lessons to learn. The scriptures are not dealing about fairy tales and, and hypothetical situations. The scriptures deal with the real life issues that you and I face, brothers and sisters, and young people. And John had to face this. And his amazing example shows that he was prepared to follow the master and have the same attitude towards Judas as Jesus had. To me, that's a very, very telling scripture. Um, we can come now to the foot of the cross in John 19 just to um, look at that uh, beautiful interchange between the Lord, Mary and John at the foot of the cross. And you know that I'm just um, summarising uh, just to pick out the key points. Uh, that help us to build a picture of John and his journey of discipleship and transformation. And we have in verse 25, this is John 19, uh, the Lord Jesus Christ on the cross, and there stood by the cross Jesus, his mother, and his mother's sister. And as I said, if we put all of the records together, you'll see uh, Salome is actually named as well. So we know that this is actually Salome, who's Mary's sister in this record. I thought I might have been able to give you this, the uh, verse in my, and I don't have it in my notes, but I, um, that's fine. Um, so that's where we, uh, that's one of the scriptures that we build together the picture of uh, the fact that Mary and Salome were sisters. And there's also Mary, the wife of Cleopas, and Mary Magdalene. So now when Jesus therefore saw his mother, and the disciple standing by whom he loved, and of course that's John, he says to his mother, woman, behold thy son. And here's his last will and testament that he leaves uh, for his mother. And uh, in, it's, in, it's, it's summarised in that expression, uh, woman, behold thy son. Mary's destiny was going to be determined by how she looked at her son on that cross. The Lord had said to Nicodemus, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. And Mary was in the same predicament. She had to behold and live. Woman, behold thy son. And we know, of course, that allegory in Numbers 21 was an allegory uh, so beautifully um, expressive of the atonement and the way in which we would be saved from the bite or the sting of the serpent. I'm not going to say any more about that because of time. We're focusing on John. But then 
we read in verse um, 27, Then saith he to the disciple, Behold thy mother. And from that hour, that disciple took her unto his own home. And the word home, you'll see, is in italics. It's not there in the Greek. The Greek should read, he took her unto himself. So he took her as his own mother. And the Lord was able, therefore, to place Mary, his mother, in the custody of one of his most trusted disciples, which was John. Of course, the relationship was um, auntie and nephew. But John was the perfect disciple who remained there, of course, as we know. So he didn't take her to his own home there and then, even though he may have provided um, accommodation in Jerusalem while they were there. Because John is there right to the very end and records the testimony of all that the Lord experienced right through to his piercing and his um and um, with verse 35, he saw it with his own hands. He that saw it bear record, and his record is true, and, and um, he knoweth that he saith true that ye might believe. All of these things were done that the scripture might be fulfilled. And John would have very carefully and delicately gone through the significance of all of those scriptures mm -hmm. and how they were fulfilled in her son. And that led her, of course, to a point of belief and conviction that we saw. Um, was evidence in her being part of the ecclesia uh, in Acts chapter 1. But isn't it interesting to think that of all of the disciples, we're, we're told in verse 25, there stood by the cross of Jesus. And in verse 26, Jesus saw his mother and the disciple standing by. And to me, that's a beautiful testimony of John because he was at hand to be called upon when a need, a great need was, was made manifest in the ecclesia. He was standing by. He was standing by the Lord's side. And, you know, brothers and sisters, if we think about why we are called into the truth and, of course, ultimately, above all else, it is to actually magnify and glorify our heavenly father and further his purpose. But one of the responsibilities that is given to us in order to do that is to stand by the master and to wait for his call. And you don't do that when you're absent from the ecclesia, when the ecclesia meets. Because the Lord said, where two or three are gathered in my name, there am I in the midst of them. And we can't do that if we're not here. I'm not saying Pinjara, sorry, don't get me wrong. When we're not with our ecclesia, when the ecclesia gathers and when our Lord is there in the midst, when needs are made apparent to us of brothers and sisters, and he was a man standing by that the Lord could call upon to assist his own mother when he couldn't because he wasn't able. And the Lord is able, brothers and sisters, to work, but he works through people. He works through you and I. And one of the responsibilities of discipleship is to be standing by the master so that we can be at his call when he draws us into his service, in this case, to take care of a close member of his family. And, of course, all of the members of his family are disciples whom he loves. He cares for all of them. But the service that we can render, brothers and sisters, as extensions of our Lord Jesus Christ are described in those words. John, behold thy mother. And in that was a commission and a responsibility that John took very seriously. And that, of course, helped to lead the family into the truth. Maybe we'll just now move to John's epistle because I, um, I wanted to just deal a little bit with the resurrection of Christ. But um, we can probably do that retrospectively from 1st of John chapter 1. Um, I'm sure we would be familiar uh, with the record of John 20 and Peter and John coming to the sepulchre. Uh, my personal belief, looking at the words that are described, um, that, that describe Peter and John's visitation to the sepulchre in John 20, when John says that he saw and believed, 
that John could see from the linen clothes in that sepulchre that the Lord had risen. Peter couldn't. Peter looked and observed all of the details, and he didn't come to the same conclusion, but John did. He was a very spiritually astute brother. He was very, very familiar with the scriptures, and he was able to draw on the Lord's words and on the evidence that he saw, and he believed in the resurrection. But when the Lord uh, appeared to the apostles and um, with many infallible proofs, we read in Luke chapter 1, um, to absolutely convince them beyond all doubt that he was risen, he said, handle me and see. And that's a beautiful expression. It's Luke 24, verse 36 to 39. Handle me and see. And I think John actually is, um, uh, I think John has that in mind when he opens this beautiful letter. So this is his first letter, chapter 1. And I just love the way he writes this. That which was from the beginning, we've heard and we've seen with our eyes, we've looked upon and our hands have handled of the word of life. Because to us and we've seen it and bear witness and show unto you not just life, the life, that eternal life, that divine nature, which was with the Father, was manifested to us. I think that experience must have been an amazing experience for John as he describes touching eternity, touching the very eternity of God's divine existence that now was evidence in the risen and glorified Christ. We touched immortality, says John. We actually touched it with our own hands. That immortal eternal divine life that was with the Father was manifested and we've heard it, we've seen it, and John calls it the word of life. And brothers and sisters, let us never, ever take for granted that we have seen and heard and touched the same divine eternal nature of the Father. It's called the word of life. We sometimes refer, it, refer to it as the Bible, the Scriptures. It's the Word of God. It's not just a book. It's not just writings. It is the Word of life. And the, word, the Lord was that Word made flesh, embodied in human form. And we touched immortality. And so have we, brothers and sisters. Let us never take for granted that this book we have, generations before us have not had the scriptures. We've actually got a copy of the scriptures that we can read for ourselves. And do we really appreciate that this is actually like touching the divine nature of God? Because it's God breathed. It's the word of life. Let us never take for granted, brothers and sisters. We don't need any more infallible proofs than what we've been given. And when the Lord gave that parable of the rich man and Lazarus, you know the parable? There was the, the rich man's protesting to Abraham saying, look, I've got five brothers. They're going to end up where I am. Just send Lazarus from the dead. If they saw a miracle, they would believe on him and they won't end up with me. And in the parable, the Lord gives Abraham a voice and Abraham says, they've got Moses and the prophets. And you can imagine the rich man saying, Moses and the prophets. I mean, that's ancient history. We live in a modern world. We've got, like, we've got the Olympic Games and we've got a university and we've got, we're, we're, we're technologically advanced. Moses and the prophets, like, they lived thousands of years ago. That's ancient history. Get real. Get with the current, the current times. You're out of date. Moses and the prophets will be, will be totally powerless to persuade my brothers. And that's how the parable concludes. If they don't hear Moses and the prophets, yes, black print on white paper, but not just any black print, the word of God. Because without that, our life makes no sense. World events make no sense. All the people that study world events, do you think they have any idea what's happening? Absolutely not. Why do we know what's happening, brothers and sisters? There's only one reason we have the word of life. And it will be vindicated. 
It's God's word. Nothing can challenge it. It will prosper in the thing where to it God pleases and it will fulfill that which it's sent to accomplish. It's the word of life, brothers and sisters. And John was captivated by that word and he took it seriously. And that's why he's such a passionate, loving brother who would never compromise the truth for anything. Because everything was measured by that word. And he talks about fellowship. Let's just look at two. Well, I'll quote you two parts of, of his letter. Um, just so that we understand how serious John was about this word of life, as loving as he was, as affectionate as he was, he was uncompromising when it came to the truth. So this is First of John 2, verse 18 and 19, where he tells us that Antichrist will come out of the ecclesia. And we need to be warned, says God, that apostasy is going to come out of the brotherhood. There's going to be brothers and sisters they're going to corrupt the truth and they will be part of a system that will oppose the truth and oppose Jesus Christ. And then he says to us in 2 John 1 verse 9 to 11, take a note, we haven't got time to deal with it, that whoever, does, whoever transgresses and does not abide within the doctrine of Christ does not have God. He, abideth, he that abideth in the doctrine of Christ, he has both the Father and Son. So if anyone comes to you and bring not this doctrine, don't receive him into your house, don't bid him God's speed, because that he that bids him God's speed is partaker of his evil deeds. There was John's uncompromising love of the doctrine of Christ, the word of life, and he never compromised that, brothers and sisters, and in his epistles, his absolute black and white, uncompromising nature is seen uh, beautifully expressed. So let's just go to Revelation chapter 10 and we'll finish here. Because a thunderstorm is coming, brothers and sisters, and it's recorded for us in the apocalypse. And we know, of course, that John was imprisoned for his faith. He was exiled on the Isle of Patmos. He was taken away from his family. He was taken away from his ecclesia. And he was isolated in the four walls of a dungeon. And in that dungeon, his best friend paid him a visit. In the loneliness of that isolated place on the island of Patmos, he had a friend that never, never stopped caring, never stopped loving. And he sent his angel to transport John out of the four walls of that dark and dingy dungeon into the future and gave John an amazing picture of the future age and John's place in that future age. And in one of those um, visions in chapter 10, John is personally involved. And we know we've got the rainbowed angel, which foretells the comfort of the shining of the sun after the rain and its beautiful um, uh, beautiful display of the co colours that are um uh, that are um, dispersed by the pure light shining through the clear um, droplets of water that form like dew after the thunderstorm has passed. It's a, it's a picture of the future as the refracted glory of Yahweh is seen in this rainbowed angel. That's the promise of the aftermath of the thunderstorm. But this angel has, as we see, pillars of fire for feet, and those feet are going to execute the judgments of Yahweh. 40 years of judgments on the nation, the nations from Armageddon to the establishment of the kingdom of God. And that is divided into two parts. Ten years judgment uh, of the nations called the harvest of the earth in Revelation 14 and verse 15 to 16. And then 30 years of judgment on the system of apostasy that developed out of the ecclesia. And that's uh, for the harlot and her daughters. That's called the vintage of the earth in the balance of that chapter, chapter 14. But that's not the only time when the fire of judgment will fall until the kingdoms of this world become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ. Because at the end of the thousand years, Revelation 20 and verse 9, fire will come down from God out of heaven to devour the uprising of the apostasy when the, the, the uh, Satan is loosed for a season. So John's going to be involved in this because when John is now given uh, to see the thunders of the judgments that are coming, 
Uh, and, and this thunderstorm, of course, we know is so apt because this is this surname. John is a th son of thunder. And when John goes to write, we, we read in verse 4, when the seven thunders uttered their voices, I was about to write, and I heard a voice from heaven, and that's the voice of the Lord Jesus Christ saying, John, don't write. Seal up those things which the seven thunders uttered and write them not. And John, brothers and sisters, as we know, eats the scroll. We read of that in verse 9. Uh, the angels gave me a little book, and uh, he said, take it up and eat it. It will make thy belly bitter, and it will make thy mouth sweet as honey. And he took the little book out of the angel's hand, verse 10, and he ate it up, and it was as, as, as sweet as honey to my mouth. And as soon as I'd eaten it, my belly was bitter. And he said to me, this... These judgments are going to be inside you, John, and they're not going to happen until you rise again. What an amazing way in which John is personally involved in the thunders of the judgments to come. He said to me, you will prophesy again before many peoples, nations, tongues and kings. And he's talking about John's role in the future. John, you'll get your day. Judgment will come. Fire will come down from heaven. It's not now. You're suffering now under this evil system, which was the, the uh, pagan Roman Empire, which became Christianized and became the Holy Roman Empire, you are suffering under the persecution of that system. But, John, I am closeting the judgments on that system inside you until I rise, raise you up from the dead and you're going to stand and you're going to utter those seven thunders. And when you utter them, they will be executed. What an amazing promise John was given so that he could be personally involved in the fulfilment of God's purpose until that enmity is totally, totally uh, removed because the kingdom of God will be the only entity that remains. And in a beautiful way, the scriptures and, of course, this letter finishes with John's prayer. And let's just come to Revelation 22. Here's how the Bible finishes the word of God, the scriptures finishes. It's the prayer of John. Revelation 22, verse 20. He that testifieth these things saith, surely I come quickly. That's, of course, our Lord Jesus Christ speaking through his angel. And John's prayer in response in verse 20 is, even so come Lord Jesus. And we finish with his name, don't we? The grace of Yah. John. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. Well, Andrew is one of those uh, beautiful characters, and obviously we don't have the uh, record of uh, enough detail of all of the apostles in order to do a character study of each one of them. Of some of them, nothing is mentioned. However, there is some detail that is given to us in the gospel records concerning Andrew, and uh, it does highlight just the diversity that existed within the apostles, and, of course, that diversity is so typical of human nature and encompasses us uh, in marriages, uh, in families, and in ecclesias. So a little bit about Andrew, uh, some of the uh, summaries of what we know about him before we look at the record um, of the events that contain him. His name uh, in the Greek, Andreas, uh, means manly. So it's a it's a, a, a name which has a significant meaning because, as we know, when we go right back to Genesis 1 and verse 26, we know that God's purpose revolved around man because man was made after, in the image and after the likeness of the Elohim and the role of man was to have dominion over all of the lower forms of creation. And that was a mission statement of the destiny of man. And, of course, that man ultimately became the Lord Jesus Christ, the, the one that did have dominion. And in Psalm 8, David celebrates in writing up the victory uh, that he 
was blessed to have through divine strength over Goliath, he wrote a, a psalm, which, of course, Paul picks up in Hebrews to tell us that that man was Christ. And all men who would have dominion, and we know that that um, expression man, of course, uh, encompasses male and female because we know in Genesis that when God made man, he made them male and female. So we know that the term man um, is expressive of mankind and uh, men and women come under that uh, responsibility uh, to have dominion. And that, of course, is the preparation for uh, the, the saints who will have dominion over the uh, nations in the kingdom age. And that is a responsibility of both brothers and sisters. So let's not think that being a man in that sense, defined by the scriptures, is just well, just males excluding females, because it isn't. Because the kings and priests of the future age are going to be brothers and sisters who in their mortal life, with, of course, the structure of the divine headship that has been established by the order of creation and by the fall, we know that there is the capacity for both brothers and sisters, male and female, to develop dominion and control over the lower forms of creation, which represent the carnal thinking that is in each one of us that we battle against. And that dominion has to be fought and won by brothers and sisters. So uh, Andrew becomes typical of the man who's going to reach the maturity of Jesus Christ, the perfect man. Now, he's called, and that's where our title comes uh, from, and we saw that in, uh, in verse 40 of the uh, chapter that uh, our brother Jason read for us. And incidentally, it was nice to see you up reading, uh, Jason. Um, we lived a stone's throw from your house at North Haven when you guys were, Ben and, and Jason were little. Um, Abby was born later. I think Abby might have been born in Mildura, I think. Yeah, so we shared um, a common friendship with the family because, of course, they were also, well, being of oh, German and Polish extraction, we were Greek, so we saw ourselves as not typical Aussies, but um, we brought some uh, colour culture into the Woodville Ecclesia. Not sure that it was, not sure that it was very welcome by the staid Australians who were very conservative. And anyway, it was, it's just lovely to see you again and. Uh, Certainly, it was uh, with great tears and sadness that we uh, watched on Zoom the, uh, the memorial service for our sister Lydia, who we had great affection for. I'm sorry, I got distracted. But um, in verse 40, Andrew's called Simon Peter's brother and almost hints at Andrew's, um, you know, humility and a lack of uh, 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 being known. And to be identified, he's Simon Peter's brother. Oh, of course, right, we know who Andrew is now because he's Simon Peter's brother because everyone knows Simon Peter. Simon Peter was a significant person of great presence and he was notable because he was forthright, always mentioned first in all of the lists of the apostles, very forthright, always forward. Andrew is very quiet, he's very reserved and obviously not well known and so for identification, Andrew, who are you talking about? Oh, it's Simon Peter's brother. Oh, gotcha. Okay, so we know who you're talking about now. Now, we, we spoke about some of the background um, in dealing with Peter. So we know that they, uh, as brothers, were the sons of Jonah. Um, we know that they were from Bethsaida, a town in Galilee, which was known for its resistance to Christ. Luke 10 and verse 13 tells us that. And we know uh, from Luke 5 and verse 7 and 10, we're not going to go there, but if you're taking notes, you may already have that, that Andrew and Peter were in partnership with James and John in a fishing business in the region of, or the, the Sea of Galilee was their um, hunting ground, their fishing ground. So they were partners. And the word partner in the Greek, metochos, is a word which means uh, to have a partnership, to be in fellowship, to be an associate. So it's very evident that the record wants us to know that there's two sets of brothers that make the fishermen four. And the record is at pains to tell us that they were partners. And twice in that record, verse 7 and verse 10 of Luke 5, we're told that they were partners. They were in a partnership. And so you've got two brothers who are bound together because they have the same parents. And uh, then 
the two of them become a set of four partners who are in business together. And I think it's important for us to establish that relationship of the closeness that they were as two sets of brothers and in a partnership of, uh, uh, of a fishing business because they were a close-knit group of men. Now, we're told of Andrew in, in today's uh, reading that he was a disciple of John the Baptist. And um, that also, I think, is quite insightful because John, of course, led a preparatory reformation to welcome and to introduce the Lord Jesus Christ to the nation of Israel. And it's interesting, he had a group of disciples that actually continued through the Lord's ministry, even though John was in prison <laughs> shortly after this, um, shortly after he directed his disciples that followed him to Messiah, he was in prison and he was in prison for some time. But we know, of course, that during the Lord's ministry, the disciples of John that still existed, even though John was in prison, came to the Lord asking, are you the one that should come or look we for another? And of course, we know the Lord responded by quoting Isaiah and sent back a message to John to encourage him before, sadly, he met his death. So he was a disciple of John the Baptist. He was part of a, a reformation in the nation that was really a radical reformation. But as of, as of course we know, he was directed by John the Baptist to follow the Lord Jesus Christ. What did John learn? I'm just going to uh, let's go to my, um, my eyes are not that good. Um, what, did John, what did John teach Andrew? And I'm just going to summarize a few parts of John chapter 1 that highlight the spirit of John the Baptist and his relationship to Messiah. Verse 15, John said of Messiah, he was preferred before me. In verse 19 to 21, there was an expectation that he might have been Messiah. He said, I am not the Christ. Verse 23, well, who are you, John? I'm just a voice. I'm nobody. I'm just a voice. Don't worry about me. Just listen to what I say. Verse 27, I am not worthy. And, of course, um, he, uh, uh, he was very, very clear about the fact that he who's coming after me, verse 27, is preferred before me. I'm not even worthy to un unloose the latchet of his shoe. Verse 36, he directed his disciples to follow the Lord Jesus Christ. He said to them, and Andrew was one of those, um, uh, behold the Lamb of God. And the two disciples, one, of course, is Andrew. We know that. Um, I think, and I'm only going to suggest this as a suggestion, that the other one is John, um, the brother of James. However, that's a suggestion only. Uh, and then in verse, uh, in chapter 3, sorry, in verse 29 and 30, we have that discussion of John where he says concerning Christ, he must increase and I must decrease. So if you think about the message of John and John's humility in positioning himself as very, very humble, uh, a humble, not even a servant because a servant could when his master came home, untie the shoes of his master and wash his master's feet. And John said, I can't even do that. I'm not even able to be a servant to Christ. So high had John placed Christ. So humble was John. Even though John was the greatest of all the prophets, John was a man of great humility. And he drew attention to the Lord Jesus Christ and drew attention away from himself. And that's the spirit, of course, of the Messiah who came, as we know, and made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant. This is a divine quality. And if ever we want examples of humility, John and the Lord Jesus Christ are outstanding examples of humility. And we have a challenge, don't we, because... We have just seen in our first two studies just how the strife that existed amongst the apostles that went right through to the Last Supper, how that was a plague that plagued them because they were striving amongst themselves. There was rivalry. There was competitiveness about who was going to be the greatest. And sadly, that ruins most relationships. 
And they had to learn a lesson from the example of the Lord Jesus Christ. And some of them took a long time to learn that lesson. I think Andrew learned it before a lot of them had learned that lesson. They did learn it, but I think Andrew learned it earlier than most of them. And it is important, brothers and sisters and young people, don't just give lip service to some of the deep and meaningful scriptural principles. If you want a relationship, any relationship, whether it's a friendship, whether it's a marriage, whether it's relationships within the ecclesia, you need to esteem other greater than self. You really have to do that. You've got to esteem others better than self. Now, that doesn't mean that they are. That means to, to esteem means that's how you that's how you perceive them, that's how you treat them. It doesn't mean that they are. They may not be as intelligent as you. They may not be as capable as you, but we are to esteem them. That's an attitude of mine. And I can tell you, brothers and sisters, most of our problems in relationships stem from a person who thinks of himself more highly than he ought to think. John and the Lord are pinnacles of humility. How many times did the nation want to make Jesus king? And they would have. And if he had allowed them, of course, that would have happened prematurely. Paul says in Philippians 2, he made himself of no reputation. Like he actively prevented a reputation building amongst the nation despite all of his miracles and despite all of the incredible like, ex exhibitions of his just outsmarting of his adversaries, in, in particular the chief, uh, chief priests and the Jews and the elders and the scribes, he made mincemeat of them. I mean, he was a living, walking, amazing miracle in every respect. He was the most popular person in the world, and yet he made himself of no reputation. He resisted the temptation of allowing people to call him Messiah. He made himself of no reputation. And it's the spirit of John the Baptist. It was the spirit of Christ. And I believe it's something that Andrew really understood. And he was a man of great humility as a result. Now, we just looked at verse 35. And you can see just um, in those two words that are used of um, the position of John, and the motion of Christ in verse 35 and verse 36, John stood and Jesus walked. I mean, that tells us, doesn't it, that John's ministry had come to a, a point of a standstill. He had completed his mission because Messiah was now manifested from his baptism and John had announced him to the nation and now Jesus commenced his ministry. And that was a, that was a, a, a transition from John to Jesus. And in doing, in doing so, as John came to an end, his, as far as his introduction of Messiah to the nation, two of his disciples were there and looking upon Jesus as he walked, he said, there is the Lamb of God. The word behold means have a look at this. It's a statement, an exclamation of note. Behold, have a look. Here is the Lamb of God. And, of course, they all knew that the Lamb was the Messiah prefigured and had been prefigured uh, right back from Genesis 3.15. He was the Lamb of God, verse 29, that taketh away the sin of the world. And in response to that, the two disciples which heard him speak, they followed Jesus. So Jesus turned and saw them following and said, What seek ye, verse 38? They said unto him, Teacher, Rabbi, Master, where dwellest thou? And he said to them, come and see. And they came and saw where he dwelt and abode with him that day, for it was about the 10th hour or 4 p.m. in the afternoon. Now, I'm going to suggest to you that the place that Jesus took them to was the Mount of Olives. Um, Luke 21 and verse 37 reads that in the last four days when Jesus came into the city of Jerusalem to be crucified, 
And you know, of course, the story. Jesus came on the 10th day of Abib, the, the day that the lambs were penned up for inspection at the Passover. And then on the 14th, he was crucified as the lambs were slain and prepared to be eaten. And so for those four days, he subject, subjected himself to interrogation and investigation by those that would offer him as a sacrifice, exactly as the Passover. And when he was there, we read that at the, in the daytime, he was teaching in the temple. And at night, he went out and abode in the mount that is called the Mount of Olives. Because he had said, Luke 9 and verse 57, um, when uh, a certain man came to him and said, Lord, I will follow thee whithersoever thou goest, he said, foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man hath not where to lay his head. And you can imagine if it is John, and I'm only going to suggest that, but it is definitely Andrew because we, uh, we know in verse 40 that it, uh, John records one of the two which heard John speak and followed him was Andrew, Simon, Peter's brother. But you can imagine Andrew sitting there for the day listening to Messiah, listening to his teaching, listening to him expounding the scriptures. No miracles. No signs, no wonders, just he spent the day. Now, just going to check. He spent the day in the company of the master. Where dwellest thou? Come and see. And he abode with him that day, for it was about the 10th hour. And that conversation absolutely transfixed Andrew to the point that his allegiance now not that he had uh, disassociated himself with John the Baptist, but he could definitely see that what John was saying about Messiah was true. And now his loyalty was directed towards the Lord Jesus Christ. And he remained in the master's company as one of the master's disciples. Having been John's disciple, that was now transferred to the Lord Jesus Christ. And we need to spend time in the company of the master and in the company of the master's disciples, we spoke about that yesterday, the need to be in his company. That's the place where we will learn about him, where, we'll be, we'll, where we will be convicted of him. Stop doing the daily readings. Stop coming to the meetings. Try and live a life, an isolated life within the ecclesia and you'll die a spiritual death. The place to be the place to come to a conviction of who Messiah is, is to be in his company. And we are blessed, brothers and sisters, greatly blessed with the ability we have to be uh, amongst the disciples of the master and in his very presence, which we said yesterday is confirmed because where two or three are gathered in his name, there he is in the midst of them. So in verse 40, we have, of course, um, uh, John uh, recording for us that Andrew, Simon, Peter's brother, was one of those. And in verse 41, John says the first thing that Andrew did, the first, the first thing that he did after spending a day with the master was he went to find his brother Simon. I've got to tell Simon. Simon has to know what I've found. And he says to Simon, Simon, we found the Messiah, which is being interpreted the Christ. And you can just sense the excitement in Andrew's voice. Like this is like finding, finding the greatest thing on earth, the Messiah, the long expected Messiah that all of Israel had been away. We found him. Andrew says, I've got to tell Simon, my brother, that we found the Messiah. And in verse 42, one of many occasions where Andrew is bringing people to Christ. I think it's one, one of the beautiful things that characterizes Andrew. He is always in the record bringing people to Jesus, bringing people to the Messiah that he had found. It's a wonderful trait. And uh, Andrew, here he is. He brings uh, Simon to Jesus. Now, it doesn't say that he said to Simon, behold the Lamb of God, because that's what John had said to him. 
and left it up to Andrew to respond. And Andrew went and followed Jesus. Andrew <laughs> grabbed hold of Peter and said, Peter, you're coming with me. We're going to the meeting. <laughs> We're going to hear a lecture. We're going to meet the speaker. It's the Messiah. It's the teacher. You're coming. So it doesn't say that he told Simon, here's where you need to go. It says he grabbed hold of him and he brought him to Jesus. And having done that, the attention now is focused on Simon. And we looked at that in our study yesterday. Simon, his brother, was going to be elevated to a place of great position and prominence in the ecclesia. Uh, a, a, a brother of great potential and a brother whom Jesus rightly placed uh, at the head uh, of the development of his ecclesia, which we see in the early chapters of Acts. So let's just come to uh, Matthew chapter 4. Uh, no, we prob- I, can, I can quote that. I can quote that. That's fine. I just want to uh, make sure that we cover everything this morning. But that was where the two brothers were called. Um, so I'll just quote Matthew. You can turn it up. That's fine. I'm just going to quote Matthew 4 and verse 18 to 20. Um, and we spoke about this in the call of, uh, in the call of Simon Peter. But it does actually um, uh, help us to appreciate that they were brothers. Um, so Jesus saw two brethren. Simon called Peter and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishers. So twice we're told that they were brothers. And, of course, he said to them in verse 19, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. And they straightway, verse 20, left their nets and followed him. Now, if we just come to Luke chapter 5, I just want to um, highlight the incident that we spoke about um, yesterday Um, in the story of Peter. I just want to highlight something different from the record. It's quite um, noticeable if you take the time just to do some underlining or highlighting because this is a record of the two sets of brothers who were in partnership, who worked together, the four fishermen, And when Luke records this record, it's quite evident that Andrew is not mentioned, even though he is included. I'll just read the the section because it'll uh, help you appreciate just how evident it was that um, Andrew was seen and not heard. And this obviously is a record of the, um, uh, we we saw the, um, the, the draft of fishes from Uh, yesterday's um, discussion on Peter. But you notice like in verse um, 2, when Jesus saw the ships standing by the lake, but the fishermen, so there the fishermen, were gone out of the nets and were washing their nets and were told in verse 3 that it was uh, Simon's ship. We're told in verse 4 that Jesus spoke to Simon, launch into the deep and let your nets uh, down for a draft. Verse 5, of course, it was Simon who spoke. And then in verse um, 6 and 7, you'll see the plural pronoun, um, when they had this done, they, uh, when they had this done, they enclosed a great multitude of fishes and their net break and they beckoned with their partners as to help them. You see the, um, the emphasis on uh, just a group of four fishermen, Simon Peter being prominent because of his involvement in this story, as we looked at yesterday. Verse 9, he was astonished. Again, this is focusing on Peter. And all that were with him, still haven't seen Andrew's name mentioned, um, uh, they were astonished at the draft of fishes which they had taken. Okay, so we've got some names now coming. Verse 10. And so were also James and John, the sons of Zebedee, which were partners with Simon. And Jesus said unto Simon, fear not, from henceforth thou shalt catch men. And when they had brought their ships to the land, they forsook all and followed him. Look, I don't know about you, and I don't like reading into things, things that are not there. But Andrew is part of the action. He's got his shoulder to the work. He's working. He's involved. And he's not mentioned. Not once. 
And yet we've got Simon mentioned because he's the leader of the story. Uh, he's the main character of the story. We've even got James and John mentioned. And Andrew is seen and not heard. For, for me, it's just an emphasis of the kind of person Andrew was. And you probably know people like Andrew who just get in there, they're part of the action, they do the work, but they're not in the forefront. They're not the people that are recognised as the people that are part of the action uh, and highlighted as the, the drivers of the activity. He is definitely in the record seen and not heard. Now, take a note of Matthew 10 and verse um, 5, uh, and it's also repeated in the other records. But when, and I think we mentioned this yesterday, when Jesus sent forth his apostles, he sent them in twos or in pairs. He paired the two sets of brothers together. And it's beautiful to see the Lord recognising the value of brothers in the flesh having their friendship and their service elevated to divine things. It's lovely to see that in the truth. And so, you know, Peter and Andrew went together preaching and James and John went out together preaching. And it's a lovely thing to see that. The Lord definitely wanted to strengthen the, the brotherly ties between these two sets of brothers and elevate those, of course, to a greater level of service. Now, there's an interesting um, uh, story in Mark 1 and verse 29. We're building a picture, as you can see. So Mark 1 and verse 29. And, of course, this is the time when um, Simon's wife's mother was healed by the Lord Jesus Christ. But there's um, just, I just love the way some... Uh, some of the uh, um, expressions are written, just particularly verse 29. Forthwith, when they were gone out, of, come out of the synagogue, they entered into the house of Simon and Andrew with James and John. And that might be a very insignificant thing, but we're just told that it's the house of Simon and Andrew. And James and John accompanied them. Now, Simon and Andrew may have lived in the same family home, and it may have been large enough to accommodate both of them. And, of course, their families. Obviously, Simon is married. Uh, we're not told about Andrew. Uh, but James and John accompanied them. So this was obviously a, a family home. And it was a home, of course, that was frequented by James and John. So we're very clearly told that these brothers got on really well. They were in a fishing business together. And they frequented a family home together. And I think the record has really helped us to see the closeness of these two sets of brothers and these four brethren. Well, that's all fine up until the Lord selects three, and we spoke about this yesterday, so you know where I'm going with this, selects three of the apostles to be granted a privileged status. And we spoke about that, so you know the records of the uh, raising of Jairus' daughter. He suffered no man to go in. This is Luke 8, 51. Save Peter James and John. Put up the next slide because it'll um, it'll help you appreciate uh, where Andrew has been positioned by this appointment of the Lord Jesus Christ. You put yourself in Andrew's position, and you think to yourself, "Okay, so here's all of the apostles with the Lord Jesus Christ." And you know this whole story, so I'm not going to spend time developing the story, but you know the story, the drama of the story, as Jairus pleads for, for the master's help. And then the wo woman with the issue of blood interrupts the story and detains the Lord. And there's the dramatic record of the message coming to the Lord that the daughter had died. And you can imagine the whole crowd thinking, oh, no, what a terrible tragedy. And the Lord comforts Jairus with a, a word of assurance and they journey to Jairus' house. And you could just imagine the anticipation of the crowd thinking, what's going to happen? And amongst the 12, and they get to the house. And you would think that the 12 would be given the privilege of accompanying the Lord in this amazing miracle. And the Lord says, no man is coming in except Peter James and John. What about the transfiguration? We know the story of the transfiguration. He took P 
Peter, James, and John. And in fact, he also said to them, don't tell any man this vision until the Son of Man be risen from the dead. And of course, we know about the Garden of Gethsemane. When the eleven accompanied him and he desperately poured out his heart to his, to his disciples and he took with him Peter, James and John further into the garden and opened up himself and, and uh, expressed to them his innermost feelings of anguish and concern that he had about what lay ahead for him. And of the two sets of brothers, of the fishermen four, of Peter and Andrew and James and John, always recorded in that order in all of the lists of the apostles, well, not always, we'll see an exception. You can't tell me if you put yourself in Andrew's place, you can't tell me that that would have been easy to take. It would have been very difficult. A very difficult thing for Andrew to appreciate the Lord's elevation of Peter, James and John, because by virtue of that elevation, you can, you can describe it any way you like. If you were Andrew, you would say, I've been deliberately left out. And, you know, when that happens in life, and it might not happen in exactly the same way, because our life will take twists and turns, and it might not be exactly like this, but you may have been in a situation where you have felt like Andrew would have felt. And it's very easy to become disheartened and to feel offended. And I don't need to tell you that because I'm sure that you can uh, appreciate the situation. Andrew has been just moved out of a very close group of four brothers and put aside. And you know, when that happens in life, sometimes it is very, very difficult to come back from that position and to feel as though we are of any value. You've just been demoted one place is enough, even if we are apostles of Jesus Christ and if even if we are disciples of Jesus Christ and we're all still brothers and sisters, though life might, in ecclesial life particularly, might place us in situations similar to Andrew's, we can all say, well, we're still in the truth, we've still got the hope, we've still got M Messiah's redemption, and but we don't, do we? We say we've been moved from there <laughs> to, to there and we don't actually think about the blessed and the privileged status we have of being elevated among the nations and being elevated into uh, the heavenlies in Christ Jesus. But that's human nature. That's the human response. So we come to John chapter 6, and we're going to see how the Lord is going to help this wonderful um, apostle, help him appreciate his value. And you know this story. This is the story of the feeding of the 5,000. And it's a story in which <clears throat> Philip and Andrew are involved. So we'll just go through, through this quickly. But you know the story, so I'm not going to embellish and put you in the scene. You can put yourself in the scene. We've got 5,000 men beside women and children, possibly 25,000 people, a lot of people. And, of course, the Lord puts, uh, puts out the challenge to them uh, when they say, look, send the multitudes away. The Lord says, wait, 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 wait. We're not sending these people away anyway. Uh, we, need to find, um, we need to find food for these people. They've been listening to me all day preaching, and the Lord healed the sick. We're not sending them away. And Philip, in verse 7, says, look, even if we had 200 penny worth of bread, it's not even enough for each of them to take a little. And so he sent them out to find food. And we read in verse 8 of John chapter 6, one of his disciples, Andrew. Who's Andrew? Oh, uh, he's Simon Peter's brother. Okay. Well, Andrew is the one who finds a little boy. And in the Greek, the word lad is a small, young boy. And 
Of all of the disciples that went to search and to find food, it's Andrew that brings a little lad to the master. He's always bringing people to the master. But, of course, he comes with a very small boy who had five barley loaves, and barley is the smallest grain, much smaller than wheat. So look at the emphasis of John's record. You've got a nobody disciple or apostle because he's Andrew, and no one knows who Andrew is except that he's Simon Peter's brother, and there's a little boy and there's barley, not wheat, there's barley loaves, and there's two small fishes. And Andrew makes a fundamental mistake when he summarises a nobody apostle with a small boy with two barley loaves and two, sorry, five barley loaves and two small fishes. Andrew makes a fundamental mistake of not valuing that contribution because he says, what are they among so many? And that's where he was wrong. The Lord was going to teach him that even small contributions when given in the master's service are not just enough for what is needed, is more than is needed and there'll be leftovers. Now, I think when the Lord said, tell everyone to sit down because we're going to have lunch or dinner, I'm sure Andrew and this little boy would have been absolutely gobsmacked to see what the Lord did because the Lord is a Lord of multiplication. He can bless and increase the smallest of contributions, even though we might despise them and say, I mean, I can't even read, let alone get up and do a reading in front of people. If the master says, make a contribution, make a contribution. I remember a brother in our ecclesia who uh, is challenged with uh, many things uh, and he's no longer able to perform a service in the ecclesia because of his uh, personal awareness of his limitations. Um, I remember him giving a lecture in the days where he did have the confidence and uh, I don't need to mention him, but he's a lovely brother in our ecclesia, but severely limited in his ability because of um, the uh, afflictions that he's, uh, that he's uh, encompassed by in life. And he gave a lecture one day and he just said in passing when he was talking about Isaiah 9 verse 6, and, you know, you could look at him and say, oh, look, you know, what is he doing on the lecture platform? We, we, we would hardly want to have a brother like him with his limited ability uh, giving lectures, you know, particularly when we're presenting the truth to the public. Not a presenter, but obviously love the truth, accepted this opportunity. He just said in passing, and you could have blown me away, when he was quoting Isaiah 9 verse 6, he said, you know, when we read, unto us a child is born, and unto us the son is given, of course we all know that that's referring to the child that was born of Mary and the son that was offered by his father as a gift. And you could have, you could have, blown, me, you could have blown me over with a feather. All of my years in the truth, I had never understood what Isaiah was talking about in that verse about Christ. Unto us a child is born, that's his birth. Unto us a son is given. That's the offering and the sacrifice that the father made of that son. You could have bought, like, the exposition of the Bible that that brother gave, I have never forgotten in my life. Never, ever, 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 ever underestimate a small contribution made because the father can multiply. You make a zero contribution, Multiply that by the biggest number you can think of. Do it in your head. What's going to be the sum <coughs> of multiplying the biggest number by zero? Zero, exactly. You make the smallest number, whatever the smallest number is, 
point a trillion zeros and put a one at the end. Can you multiply it and make it bigger? Yes. Any contribution, however small, made to the master of multiplication can be magnified and multiplied so that it is more than is necessary and more than enough. Andrew learned a lesson that day, and so do we all, brothers and sisters, and therefore we do not despise small contributions to the truth. And Andrew, I think, came to appreciate that his contribution and the contribution of this little boy was very valuable to the Lord. And uh, it was more than enough, an amazing story. And it's so true of life, isn't it? And I'm sure you've got many examples um, that you could add to that in your own personal experience. So John 12. Here we are at the uh, Passover feast. Um, our Lord's sacrifice is imminent. And as our Lord spent those four days in Jerusalem, we read in verse 20 that there were certain Greeks. That's a nice word to read in the Bible. <laughs> there were certain Greeks who I believe were proselytes who came to the Passover, international guests who came to celebrate the Passover. And they came to worship at the feast. Now the same came therefore to Philip, which was of Bethsaida, because Philip came from the same town as Andrew um, of Galilee and desired him saying, sir, we would see Jesus. And what a wonderful thing that they sought an opportunity to meet the Lord Jesus Christ. And Philip was not sure how to handle this. Well, I, I suppose I'm assuming uh, that um, that was his first response because he could have certainly arranged a meeting of the Greeks with Jesus. But look at his first response. Um, Philip speaks to Andrew because Andrew was one of those people that was always seeking opportunity to bring people to Jesus. I, I remember um, those of you who know the story of how we came into the truth, a brother uh, whose name is Colin Beard. He was a member. He was a member of the Cumberland Ecclesia, and um, so talking about um, Greeks wanting to meet Jesus, uh, he was never a speaker. I don't. I don't know a lot about his service in the Cumberland Ecclesia, but I know he wasn't a speaking brother. But he was a cashier at the uh, Municipal Tramways Trust, as it used to be called uh, in those days. And uh, my dad got a job as a bus driver after. Um, finishing a job in less than desirable terms with Clark shoes. But anyway, um, Brother Colin Baird just used the opportunity that he had to interact with the bus drivers as they brought in their takings on a daily basis of speaking the truth. And as a result of Uncle Colin's, he's now sadly fallen asleep and awaiting the resurrection with our Artie Joan. But, you know, as a result of his preaching, I'll give you the names of the Greeks he brought into the truth. So Nestor Legizos, Consecratus, Georgia Minus, Nick Mitsos, Terry Athanasiadis. And as a result of that, other groups were brought into the truth. And there's families that have flowed from those people. Talking about bringing Greeks to Jesus. A brother who was probably not very highly esteemed as a brother who, you know, might have been a speaker. But, you know, when you see brothers and sisters um, that either are engaged in preaching work, and it might be, you know, personal preaching, it might be Sunday school work, that's a preaching, that's a gospel proclamation activity, or in the mission fields or other areas uh, of ecclesial service. You know, bringing people to the master is the best thing that we can ever do, and the joy and the fruits that can come from that are amazing. And so Andrew is consulted by Philip. And together, Andrew and Philip. And Andrew is, of course, mentioned first in the uh, in, in the, the the list of the two brethren who come and, and say to Jesus, and look at the Lord's response. The hour is come. The man of the Son of Man should be glorified. And he talks about the blessings that will come and the increase that will come when he is the seed is planted in the earth, earth and it will bring forth much fruit, which will be inclusive of Jews and Gentiles. What a beautiful thing to have a reputation like Andrew. And I remember Brother Colin uh, and Sister Joan very fondly and are indebted to them because that's the instrumentality through which 
our family came into the truth. So Mark chapter 13. Excuse me, it's not a nice thing to do on a platform, I know. Mark chapter 13. You know, of all of the um, amazing parts of the Lord's ministry and all of the unique experiences that Peter, James and John had, I, I would say that the Olivet Prophecy would stand out as being one of the most amazing uh, parts of the Lord's ministry. We refer to that probably more than uh, many other parts of the Lord's ministry because, of course, of the significance of the Olivet Prophecy and what it means to us in terms of the signs that our Lord, our Lord Jesus Christ is near. Now, of course, we know um, that um, the gospel records that record this, um, Matthew, uh, Mark and Luke, are just coming to Mark's record because Mark gives us um, quite a, a beautiful little um, introduction to this. Um, and in verse uh, Mark 13 and verse, um, well, you see the, um, uh, the Lord's discussion uh, about the um, uh, response to the temple and, and the manner of stones and the buildings that were just so awe-inspiring as they sat on the Mount of Olives um, and just glanced over the um, valley of the Kidron and looking at this beautiful temple in the city of Jerusalem. And the Lord said to them in verse 2, See these great buildings. There shall not be left one stone upon another that shall not be thrown down. And as he sat over the Mount of Olives, over against the temple, Peter and James and John and Andrew asked him privately. The Olivet Prophecy was not a prophecy that Jesus gave to the Twelve. This was a private disclosing of an amazing prophecy. It was a private discussion. And to have Andrew included in the list of these three brethren, Peter, James, John, in that order, and Andrew, to me, is just outstanding, brothers and sisters. And to me, it illustrates the spirit of Andrew, who was not just simply going to throw in the towel and say, well, if it's Peter, James, and John, well, then you can have the Lord to yourself. He's included, brothers and sisters. And it's not Peter and Andrew, James and John, as is the case in the lists. The lists of the apostles. There's a respect to the divine appointment of Peter, James and John in this record. But Andrew is not excluded. And I think that speaks volumes of the spirit of the humility of Andrew and there's one other place where we see that, and it's Acts chapter 1. In the formation of the ecclesia, in Acts chapter 1, as the ecclesia gathered together, we have the same structure of names. <laughs> and there is a testament, the testament to the spirit and the humility of Andrew, who accepts the placement of Peter, James, and John, but is not excluding himself when there's opportunity for him to be included. Acts 1 and verse 13 and look at the order of the names, and I'm not going to make something that's not there out of the order of the names, but it's so different. It's not like it normally is when the apostles are listed, Peter and Andrew, James and John. Acts 1 verse 13, they were come into the upper room where are both Peter and James and John. So the three are mentioned first. And who's next? And Andrew. Isn't that beautiful? Isn't it beautiful to see the way in which Andrew was a brother who was prepared to accept the appointment of Peter, James, and John, but he was there with them whenever the opportunity was al allowed and granted him, and those two are examples of that beautiful spirit. Well, our time has gone, so I might just have to leave um, the parable of the talents and maybe just conclude in um, 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Just um, And this is an exhortation that the Apostle Paul has given and probably the best exhortation that we can uh, summarise the story of Andrew by, and I don't need to expound this section of the scripture, I'm sure you would appreciate um, how significant the exhortation of Paul is in 1 Corinthians 12 uh, and 13. But we know, of course, 
chapter 12 is all about the challenge of diversity and the challenge that diversity um, presents itself uh, to unity. But that is, of course, until we come to the unity of the spirit, which is a phrase coined by the Apostle Paul also, but um, in Ephesians uh, in Ephesians chapter 4. But it is important for us to understand, and I'm not going to um, highlight this, but if you um, want to do some Bible marking just to make sure that it stands out in 1 Corinthians 12, you see the diversities and the differences highlighted and the unity and the same, 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 one, 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 and the unity in diversity that is a necessary lesson for all of us to learn in ecclesial life. There is diversity, but diversity is not an impediment to unity. It is, of course, if we don't appreciate the unity of the spirit. And Paul's um, exhortation is beautiful uh, in helping us to appreciate that all of us are going to be different in terms of our character, our background, our um, capabilities uh, as the body is, which is such a perfect simile for the body of Christ. And you can look at your body and you can see all of the different parts of the body. And you tell me, brothers and sisters, if the body is the simile for the ecclesia, it speaks diversity and unity. That's the theme of the simile of Paul's exhortation in 1 Corinthians 12. And there is no way. I mean, God has tempered the body together and he has fitly joined it so that each of the parts of that body are in absolute perfect connection to each other and they are interdependent and they work as an amazing unit. That's how the ecclesial body should work. And Andrew learned that lesson probably ahead of the other apostles. Each of them wanted to chop themselves out of the body and stand apart from the body. Peter was an example of that. Though all these offend thee, yet will not I. Andrew was a brother who might have been disheartened a little bit and thought that he was not able to be, you know, a 2,000 pen or 200 penny worth brother like Peter. But the Lord made him appreciate that his small contribution was of great value. And this is the burden of this exhortation. And so, brothers and sisters, we would encourage you all to consider the value that each of you have in the Lord's service. It doesn't matter about diversity. Diversity is a fact of creation. But unity is not an option in the body of Christ. Let's finish in Ephesians 4. And I'm sorry that I just had to briefly cover that, but that's, I think, I think we would appreciate the message. There is no single part of the body of Christ that can or has any justification to want to or seek to live outside of the body of Christ as an independent member. Can't do. Just impossible. Cannot be done. And so when Paul um, gives this exhortation, a beautiful exhortation, uh, in Ephesians chapter 4, we see that term that he uh, coined um, in Ephesians 4 and verse um, 3. We need to endeavour to keep the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. That is not unity, brothers and sisters and young people. Don't mistake unity with what Paul's talking about. Paul is not talking about unity. He's talking about the unity of the spirit. That is not just people working together. That is people who have understood the spirit's unity and been united with the spirit, with the father and the son through the spirit. And as a result of that, are united with those of like mind. Our brother Paul spoke about the wonderful blessing and joy that is, and we should appreciate that, brothers and sisters, because there is only one body and so forth. But I just want you to come to um, verse um, uh, 11. The Lord Jesus Christ's victory has given us spoils of power of, and, and of his victory and spoils of, uh, of his uh, victory over sin and death. And those spoils are opportunities for service 
And we can be sent on the master's service. We can speak in the master's name. We can preach the gospel. We can provide pastoral care and we can educate. That is something that every single one of us can do, brothers and sisters, in verse 11. They are the spoils of his victory. And what are they for? For the perfecting of the saints, because we want to reach perfection in Christ. For the work of the ministry in which we are engaged and for the building up of the body of Christ till we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect end. The perfect man. That's what his name means, doesn't it? That's the destination. To be as the master, to a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Verse 15, speaking the truth in love. We can all do that, brothers and sisters. Andrew could do that as much as Peter could do that. Speaking the truth in love, we can grow up into him to become Christ because he is the head from whom the whole body, verse 16, fitly framed together. Sorry, I should read. Um, I'm being distracted. Fitly joined together and compacted by that which every joint supplieth, according to the effectual working in the measure of every single part, Peter and Andrew, maketh increase of the body unto the edifying of itself, the building up of itself in love. I just want to read you the dialogue translation of verse 16 from Christ the whole body being fitly joined and united by means of every assisting joint the body is joined together and according to the proportionate energy of every single part of that body when we learn that lesson like Andrew we can affect the growth of the body for the building up of itself in life. All of the apostles were chosen by our Heavenly Father for his Son. We read of that in Luke chapter 6. They all had strengths and weaknesses. They had all previously to be appointed as apostles, had of their own volition chosen to be disciples of the Master. Fatalists say that the traitor had to be Judas because his namesake, Judah, one of the twelve, sons of Jacob, sold Joseph for 20 pieces of silver. However, Zechariah prophesied that Israel would value Messiah for 30 pieces of silver. And Ahithophel was the greatest, undoubtedly the greatest foreshadowers or types of Judas. And in much more detail than Judah, his name's sake. He was David's closest friend in the truth before becoming offended and defecting because blood was thicker than water. Beware of Hollywood. Filmmakers are just as apostate as the church. So beware of their storytelling because it's based on lies and false doctrine. We shouldn't either prejudice ourselves against Judas as we commence the study of his life just because we know the end of the story. Uh, and we must remember that the gospel records were written well after the event, well after all of the events, including the treachery and the betrayal of Judas, had occurred. So what do we know about Judas? Well, do you know, if I, if I could um, say this, and I, I haven't done a study on Judas any more than just a single study, <laughs> I reckon that you could actually do a series on Judas. If you take into account all of the scriptures that have to do with, um, uh, you know, uh, all of the background, so the story of Judah and Joseph and Ahithophel and David and, of course, the prophecies concerning uh, 
Judas in Psalm 109 and Psalm 41 and 51. And, and you could you could actually, Zechariah, you could actually build quite uh, a series on Judas. However, we're just going to pick out just a few things uh, and hopefully those things will help us as we develop uh, an understanding of who he was and the lessons which are the important things for us, the lessons that are there in the record for our learning and our admonition. His name, first of all, um, so um, his name uh, in the Greek, Judas Iscariot, uh, comes from the Hebrew ish Kerioth. And ish, as we know, means a mighty man or a man of status. And Kerioth is a city um, that's recorded for us in the book of Joshua. Um, and that city was in Judah. Uh, and the city's name, um, Kerioth, actually means the city. So we could say, uh, by extension, Judas Iscariot is praise because Judah, uh, Judas is the Greek of the Hebrew Judah. Praise the man of the city. He's certainly very streetwise. He's very shrewd. He's very observant. He was wise as a serpent. But sadly, he didn't prove to be as harmless as a dove. Now, it is important that we understand that he was chosen by the Father. And the Lord actually also acknowledged that in his prayer of John 17, when he said, while I was with them in the world, I kept them in thy name. Those that thou gavest me, I have kept. And none of them is lost, save the son of perdition. The word perdition meaning ruined that the scripture might be fulfilled and the Lord expressed with great remorse the fact that his mission uh, for Judas had failed but accepted that that was in fulfillment of the scripture concerning uh, one of the 12 that could have betrayed him any of the 12 I believe could have been traded because they all had strengths they all had weaknesses and as I say just because Judah is Judah is the namesake of Judas uh, Hithophel is a greater type of Judas and so it doesn't necessarily have to be that he had to be Judah because his, uh, Judas because his name was Judah and there was uh, a story told in the life of Joseph. Now, of course, there came a point at which the Lord understood who Judas was becoming and if you're taking notes, John 6 and verse 70 to 71 the Lord says, have not I chosen you 12, and one of you is a devil, is. So at some point, it became evident that the character of Judas was showing itself. And John goes on to say, he spake of Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon, for he it was that should betray him, being one of the 12. Now, of Judas, uh, or of the traitor, I should say, um, but, of course, it was known to the Lord, at least, that Judas was the one. In Matthew 26 and verse 24, the Lord said, The Son of Man goeth as it is written of him, but woe unto that man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It had been good for that man if he had not been born. That's quite a strong statement. And it is important for us to take into account all of the elements of this story and we know of course of the uh, transition um, of uh, Judas in the last supper in John chapter 13 because um, John starts the record uh, with Judas being possessed by the devil and we know that the term devil is a false accuser so Judas had falsely accused his master he had a personal issue with the master and Later in that chapter, in verse 27 to 29, John records that Satan entered into him. And you know that the word devil and Satan have different meanings in the Greek. So the false accuser became an enemy, became an adversary. And that happened in the very last supper itself, which we will cons consider as we work through the story of Judas. Of course, Judas was given a great honour. I mean, to be... Um, associated with the Lord Jesus Christ and the other 11 would have been the best possible environment to place a person in. And you think of what it would have been like to have been selected amongst the disciples to be a personal ambassador of Jesus Christ and to rub shoulders with people of great calibre and great potential. 
But of course, sadly, John tells us that um, in John 12 and verse 6, that Judas was a thief. And he had the bag and he bear what was put therein. And we'll see, sadly, uh, this weakness of Judas took over uh, his life and he became, uh, sadly, uh, characterised as a thief. He was given the power of the Holy Spirit, nonetheless, despite a weakness that he had. And that was, of course, an amazing thing to think that a man like Judas was given a great privilege to be able to go forward to preach the gospel of the kingdom and to actually be able to impart the healing hand of the power of the Spirit to people that were sick. And, of course, when we read that scripture yesterday concerning um, healing the sick, uh, the Lord actually also included raising the dead. They were given the power to do that. It's an amazing privilege. Uh, and, of course, um, we know that uh, in Matthew 20 and verse 28, the Lord had, had clearly um, outlined the destiny of the apostles. Twelve of them were chosen because there were set 12 thrones in the kingdom for them to judge the 12 tribes of Israel. So there was a position reserved for Judas, a position of great honour and of great responsibility in the kingdom. Now, Judas is always mentioned last, but as we said, um, we have to be careful not to prejudice ourselves against Judas because the gospel, written, the gospel records were written after the event and, of course, under inspiration. And, uh, but the under inspiration has, um, uh, has been seen in the way in which Judas is always last in the record of the lists of the apostles. Now, Paul wrote in Hebrews 6 and verse 4 to 6, Concerning those who were part of the ecclesia of the first century, who were actually part of the uh, availability of the Holy Spirit gifts, he said these words, and we might think of these in relation to Judas. He said, it is impossible for those who were once enlightened and who've tasted of the heavenly gift, were made partakers of the Holy Spirit and have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the age to come, if they shall fall away to renew them again unto repentance, seeing they crucify to themselves the Son of God afresh and put him to open shame. That is a very serious statement concerning those who were given the privilege of being part of the ministry of Christ, being empowered by the Holy Spirit, which um, Paul here describes as tasting the heavenly enlightenment tasting the heavenly gift, made partakers of the Holy Spirit, tasted the good word of God and the powers of the age to come. That's Hebrews chapter 6 and verse 4 to 6. What an amazing privilege Judas was given, but what a great responsibility. And Peter says, it's impossible. Oh, sorry, Peter, I'm getting my brain fried. It's impossible, says Paul, for those who were once enlightened to be um, if they fall away, to be renewed again unto repentance. <clears throat> because they've crucified to themselves the Son of God afresh and put him to open shame. They're repeating what Judas had done. So here's the reality of the scriptures that bear upon Judas Iscariot. Now, just want you to come with me to John chapter 12 because there's an expression used of Judas that I think... Um, is quite insightful, and it's the expression, Judas Iscariot, Simon's son. So we're in John chapter 12, and this is the record of the Lord um, the night before he enters into Jerusalem on the ass and the colt and, and the four days that we spoke of earlier this morning. And this is the night before when he's anointed uh, by Mary in Bethany. Now, I'm going to suggest, and this is only a suggestion, so... I just want to stress before I tell you this, um, that this is a suggestion, a possible explanation as to why Judas is the only apostle not selected from Galilee. The only one. Because as we had just mentioned in Joshua 15.25, the name Kerioth, a city of Judah, was where he came from. So this is a suggestion. I just want to stress that because I don't want you to think that um, I'm stretching the truth or trying to um, make assertions of things just to be 
known as someone who makes radical statements. This is a suggestion. And a suggestion as to why he's called um, Simon's son in this record. Now, um, you'll see then in verse 4, um, the first time Judas speaks, uh, incidentally, he's called Judas Iscariot, Simon's son. Now, he's also called that in John 13 and verse 2, just come across to John 13, verse 2. We talked about the devil becoming the Satan. You see verse 2, the devil having now put into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son. And the Satan is in verse 27. The Satan entered into him the spirit of the adversary uh, after the sop. However, Simon's son, that's interesting because if we put together Matthew's record and Mark's record, we find that he's in a place where Martha's serving, verse 2 of John 12, and you would think that if Martha is serving that this is her house, well, Matthew tells us that it was actually in the house of Simon the leper. Now, that's interesting, and that could be why he's called in this house, which is his house, Martha could be his mother and Simon the leper could be his father, and that may be why we're being told in his house that he's Simon the leper. So Matthew has told us we're in the house of Simon the leper and Martha serving. So we've now connected a possible marriage between Simon the leper and Martha and Judas becoming the son of this beloved family because, as we know, Mary, Martha and Lazarus was a very much loved uh, family to the Lord Jesus Christ. And maybe it was because of the love of the Lord for that family that Judas was given uh, that opportunity by the father to be one of the apostles. And maybe that explains why he was the only exception, uh, because all of them were Galileans apart from Judas. Anyway, it is important for us to think about um, the possible suggestion and the, the reason why maybe he's called Simon's son in Simon's house, because, of course, if it was that his father was Simon the leper, uh, that maybe explains that there was a spirit of leprosy that had started to spread, spiritually speaking, throughout um, his, uh, his life, which had developed to the point where, um, sadly, it took him astray from the truth. Now, this is the first time he speaks, and he speaks out against Mary because Mary had wasted a lot of money. She'd wasted 300 penny worth of bread, uh, uh, th sorry, 300 penny worth of ointment, which was very costly, very expensive. And Judas protested that this ointment uh, could have been sold and given to the poor. And John says, of course, he didn't know this at the time, but writing under inspiration after the event, John records through the spirit which sees all things, which are naked and open unto the eyes of him with whom we have to do, that he didn't care for the poor. He was a thief. He had the bag and he bare that which was in the bag. And the Greek word bear means um, to take for oneself. And we told in Acts 1 verse 18 that this man, referring to Judas, purchased a field with the reward of iniquity. And the reward of iniquity was not the 30 pieces of silver. The reward of iniquity was the money that he had extorted from the common funds that were entrusted into his care. And uh, we know, we, you know, if we had time to develop the story of Joseph and see the, the foreshadowing, we know that Joseph trusted his brethren with money because money was an issue that led to his betrayal. And uh, so the Lord gave Judas an opportunity to be trustworthy, and he, of course, was not trustworthy. I actually also think, and I'm telling you this as an assertion, but I'm assuming, uh, that the Lord did try to appeal to Judas on many occasions. And on one occasion, I believe the parable Jesus gave in Luke 16 uh, uh, was actually spoken about Judas. And uh, that servant... Uh, who had been accused of wasting his master's goods, uh, that didn't want to beg, um, and went to make a deal with one of the Lord's creditors so that when he lost his job, 
he would be uh, respected as one of the uh, persons that had done a favour to one of the creditors uh, that owed his Lord money, that that represented the transfer of loyalty from Jesus to the to the elders of the Jews. And the Lord was appealing to Judas about a man that could not be trusted. And so the Lord said in that parable, if, if you're faithful in that which is least, you'll be faithful in that which is much. He that is in, unjust in that which is... Uh, uh, in that which is um, much, how can he be trusted uh, if he can't be trusted with unrighteous mammon? Who can trust him with true riches? And if you've not been faithful with, with that which belongs to another man, who will give you that which is your own? So no servant can serve two masters. He will either hate the one and love the other, or he will hold to the one and despise the other. You can't serve God and mammon. I think that's one of the parables that Jesus gave in order to appeal to Judas. Because it's one thing to fall through weakness. It is another thing altogether to live a lie. And I think there are challenges for us, brothers and sisters, because Judas is an example of someone who was overcome by his own deceit. Because, you know, living a lie can even deceive the liar himself. Just come back with me to Jeremiah chapter 17 and verse 9 and 10, and we know these words extremely well. But when a person is self-deceived, it is very, very difficult for them. Unless something drastic happens in order for them to actually see that they have actually become deceived in their own deceit. And we know these words well, but it, because it's common to us all, it is necessary for us uh, to think about this exhortation given by Yahweh through Jeremiah. As, I, as I've come to study the life of Judas, I actually have come to see uh, how relevant the warning and the exhortation of Judas's life is to me in my own personal life. We can live a lie, brothers and sisters. We can be self-deceived. This is what Yahweh said through Jeremiah in verse 9 of Jeremiah 17. The heart is deceitful above all things. The heart is the most deceitful thing in the world. Nothing is more deceitful than the human heart. Not only is it deceitful, not only will it lie to you, not only will it misrepresent the truth, not only will it misrepresent who you are and your standing before God. In addition, it is desperately wicked. <coughs> Our heart. Who really can know it? And the answer is, if we don't accept divine help to see ourselves as God sees us in reality, we will be self-deceived until the day when the Lord says, depart from me, ye workers of iniquity, I never knew you. I, Yahweh, search the heart, try the reins to give every man according to his ways, and according to the fruit of his doings. And the Lord was at pains to try and help a man who was self-deceived come to the reality of who he really was. And the same exhortation is there for us, brothers and sisters. We need to be aware that if we are relying in our own assessment of who we are, forget about self-assessment. Without God's help, brothers and sisters, without divine help, we will never see ourselves as we really are. And that's why we desperately need the words of our Heavenly Father, the words of our Master to help us really analyse who we are. We can't do it ourselves. It is not possible. We will be self-deceived. We need divine help. And Judas needed divine help. Come to Matthew 26. And here is another uh, expression of the man Judas had become, the thief that he had become. 
and a challenge that he faced like all of us have challenges and issues and maybe even addictions that we struggle against. If we don't seek divine help, brothers and sisters, they will eventually overcome us. And so when we come to Matthew chapter 26 and we read in verse 14, the treachery of uh, Judas, we read in verse 14, then. Now that is a really important word. Because the then tells us that Judas, who now was going to go to the chief priests, did it when Jesus condemned him for his response to Mary. And remember we talked about this when we discussed the life of Peter. How many times was Peter rebuked? I mean, we read it in, tonight, in today's chapter. We read about how in the Garden of Gethsemane, Peter was given another rebuke. And we didn't have time to consider that in our study of Peter. Peter was rebuked many times and very harshly. There's only one recorded rebuke of Judas and look at his response. He goes to the chief priests and he said to them, what will ye give me? And I'm going to suggest that he was, that he was on a frequency called WIIFM. What's in it for me? That was his radio station. Do you still have radios? No, I don't know. <laughs> you still have radios? Um, but that was the frequency that he was tuned into. It overcame him, sadly, brothers and sisters. What do I get out of this? What's in it for me? And, you know, that was the very spirit of the servant who was accused of, of um, stealing his master's goods. He wanted to go and secure his future. And so he did a, de a cheap deal in order to get into favour with who he thought would be the winning party because he always wanted to be with those who could offer him a position. And he thought that he was running into a dead end as he listened to the Lord saying that he would be martyred and his apostles would be martyred for his sake also. And maybe his astute understanding of where the Lord was heading with his specific prophecies about what was going to befall him in Jerusalem, maybe that was the reason, in addition to this rebuke, that turned Judas against his master he had a false accusation and that fueled that fueled his deceitful nature as a thief who wanted the kingdom for himself uh, it was all about what's in it for me what will you give me and i will deliver him unto you the jews had failed on many occasions to arrest the lord jesus christ and they were running out of time because they had tried many times and failed. And in the end, as you know, in uh, John 11, in that council after the raising of Lazarus, they were all wondering what they were going to do until Caiaphas stood up and says, you know nothing at all. It's expedient for us that one man should die, that the nation perish not. Because they were worried about what was going to happen. This man doeth many miracles. And if we leave him alone, the Romans will come and take away our place. And our nation was all about them. And they were seeking opportunity, but they failed until Judas gave him a unique opportunity as a traitor from the inside. And they covenanted with him for 30 pieces of silver. And who was in control of that transaction, brothers and sisters? Zechariah tells us that God was in control of that transaction because the deal was actually determined by prophecy, and in Zechariah, I'm just seeing where it is in my notes, 11, verse 12 and 13, it was the value that they were to place upon Messiah. So sometimes we think we're in control of negotiations. God is always in control. And from that time, he sought opportunity to betray him. And, of course, the first opportunity was the Last Supper, which was completely concealed in the Lord's cryptic instructions to Peter and John, when the Lord said to Judas, give us the bag, Judas. Peter and John, you're going to arrange this. 
And you're going to go into the city and you're going to see a man bearing a pitcher of water. He's going to take you to upper room and they're prepared. You can imagine Judas thinking, oh, no, this would have been the perfect opportunity. But, of course, Judas was prevented from knowing where the Lord would keep the Last Supper with his disciples. He saw an opportunity. And maybe even that question in verse 17, where wilt thou that we prepare for thee to eat the Passover, maybe that was precipitated by the accountant of the group because that would have been his job. I mean, in John 13, when Judas left the room, the disciples thought, okay, well, he's obviously gone out to buy something for the feast because that was what Judas always did. He was the finance brother and he always did the procurements and the arrangements. Maybe he was the one that precipitated this question and the Lord, of course, obstructed Judas's purpose to have him arrested because the Lord wanted one last chance to appeal to this man, a man who was a friend. So we come to John 13 and the Last Supper. And we've already uh, considered that the uh, transition that Judas makes from someone who had falsely accused his Lord to his adversary. And maybe it was that he had thought that apostleship was a ticket to the kingdom. They all thought that the kingdom of God should immediately appear. And we know Luke 19 um, in that chapter, uh, it it opens up, the Lord added and spoke a parable uh, as he entered into Jerusalem because they thought that the kingdom of God should immediately appear. That was public opinion. And sadly, the apostles were all influenced by public opinion. They all thought that the kingdom of God would immediately appear. And maybe Judas was the one that uh, understood that that may not have been the case. And uh, because he was so shrewd and observant, maybe he did take the Lord's words very seriously when he specifically told them of a six-part prophecy that would befall him as he entered into Jerusalem for the last time. So John 13 commences, uh, now before the feast of Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour was come, that he should depart out of this world unto the Father, having loved his own which were in the world, he loved them unto the end. And that expression in the Greek means that his love to them was to the uttermost. It had no limits. And that, of course, includes Judas, despite the fact that Supper being in progress, as the Greek should be in verse 2, supper being in progress, the devil having now put into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him, and Jesus knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands and that he was come from God and went to God, as we had discussed yesterday, when nobody had took up that responsibility of the servant because it was beneath all of them, Jesus rose up from supper and laid aside his garments and took a towel and girded himself and began to wash his disciples' feet and wipe them with the towel wherewith he was girded. And we might wonder how he felt when Judas's feet were in his hands. And we actually know, actually, I missed a slide. We actually know Because John actually quotes from Psalm 41 in verse 18. When he says um, uh, uh, in verse 18, I speak not of you all, that is, you are blessed or happy if you know these things and do them. He says, I speak not of you all. I know whom I have chosen, but that the scripture may be fulfilled. He that eateth bread with me hath lifted up his heel against me. That's Psalm 41, verse 9. I've got it on the screen, I think, on the next slide. That's what David wrote about Ahithophel. Mine own familiar friend, he said. And David talked about how, how he had wonderful memories of entering into the house of God together taking sweet counsel together. David and Ahithophel were very close friends. And you'll see as you look at the screen that I have um, blotted out the words in white 
which are recorded by David of Ahithophel that the Lord excluded when he applied them to Judas. And those words that Jesus excluded when he quoted Psalm 41 verse 9 are, in whom I trusted. Because Judas could not be trusted. He had betrayed the Lord's trust. And yet, brothers and sisters, what did the Lord do? As he held the feet of Judas in his hand with that bowl of water and the towel wherewith he was girded, he removed every single trace of the dust that Judas's feet had collected on the road and back as he had slipped out of the Twelve's company and slipped back into the Twelve's company, hopefully, he thought, without being recognised, there was dust on his feet. It left tracks. And the Lord washed all of that away. It was washed away, brothers and sisters, because the washing of the feet represented the extension of the forgiveness of sins. Peter protested and said, well, if this is all about cleansing, I need my whole body cleansed. The Lord said, no, if you've been washed, you save not. You need not save wash, washing feet. We've been baptised once. We don't need to be baptised again, but we do need to have our feet washed. And we need to wash one another's feet. We need to remove the memory and the traces of treachery from one another as we meet together to break bread and drink wine because this was the first memorial meeting. And the Lord, having done that, brothers and sisters, was extending to Judas a great expression of love to the uttermost, being prepared to forgive him for the thought and the plans that he had of a deed that had not yet been done. It could have stopped here for Judas. And the events may still have transpired. He had betrayed him, as prophecy said he would. And the Lord, brothers and sisters, was seeking to save a lost sheep. And he was even neglecting at some points the 90 and 9 to focus in on the one who needed his greatest help when he called out to them and said, one of you will betray me. And John records a natural response. There's a human response any time someone stands up and gives us a, a, a conscience-stimulating exhortation or message. You know what we start to do? We think, oh, he's obviously got somebody in mind. We look around and think, I wonder who he's speaking about. And that's what John says in verse 22. When the Lord said in verse 21, one of you shall betray me, the disciples looked one on another, doubting of whom he spake. In fact, the Greek that um, uh, is used in Matthew's record when the disciples said, Lord, is it I, is in the negative in the Greek. It's, it's not me, is it? Or it's not me, is it? It's in the negative in the Greek. How could it be me? I couldn't do such a thing. And in the end, Judas, not to be seen as being excluded from a statement uh, of exclusion, says, uh, well, Lord, it's not me, is it? And the Lord said to him, thou hast said. But none of the disciples uh, were aware of that conversation. And my conclusion is that Judas must have been right alongside them. Obviously, John was in his bosom. So John was facing the Lord. If, if the Lord was lying side on, but Judas was right behind him, as close to the Lord as was John. And we know what happens in verse 26 about the sign that was given to John and the sop that was given to Judas. Now, just a little bit about the sock. Um, I've skipped that. That's okay. Because we referred to that expression um, about the Lord's prophecy about what was going to befall him in verse 19. But it's probably a good thing for you to tuck that away before we go to John 18. The Lord says, I'm telling you what's going to happen before it happens so that when it happens, you may believe that I am he. Two words in the Greek, 
Ego in me. So remember those expression, that expression, I am he, because we're going to see that again in John chapter 18. Sorry, I just missed that in my notes. But the sop, now that expression sop is used in the Septuagint translation, which is the Greek translation of the Old Testament. And do you know of all places where it's used? It's actually used in the story of Ruth. It's the word morsel in Ruth 2, verse 13 to 14. It's the word sop. It's a little piece of bread that the Lord dipped in the wine and put in the mouth of Judas. And that's another reason why Judas must have been right next to the Lord if they reclined on couches around a centre table. Now, the word morsel is used in Boaz's extension to Ruth, who was a reaper, sorry, a gleaner, not a reaper. Now, gleaners picked up the leftovers after the reapers, who were the employees, gathered the harvest. And because she gleaned after the reapers, Boaz, in order to make her feel welcome as part of his fraternity and his family, said to Ruth, dip thy morsel, that's the word sop, in the vinegar. He wanted to bring her into his table. And he welcomed her to eat at mealtimes with his servants so that she felt included. That's the word. The inclusion of someone who is outside. And, you know, the Lord actually went beyond the gesture of inclusion of Boaz because Boaz said to Ruth, dip thy morsel. The Lord, John records, dipped the morsel and he put it into the mouth of Jesus. What an amazing gesture of love and friendship to a man that had determined to betray him. And look at Judas's response. After the sop, Satan entered into him. And when we read in, um, uh, in that expression, um, the, the, um, uh, after the sop, Satan entered into him, this is a spirit that is adversarial. The Lord had determined to try and turn Judas around at the very last minute. David had done that, haven't he? Hadn't he? When David went to uh, engage Goliath in battle, Saul said to him, you can't do this, you're a lad. And he told Saul the confidence that he had, that even at the very last minute when he, uh, he was facing a lion and a bear who had taken one of the flock from his fold, he was able to rescue that lamb out of the mouth of the lion and out of the mouth of the bear. And here is the Lord Jesus Christ, the very last minute, Judas had been overcome. He was being influenced by the lion and the bear of the adversary and the Satan. And the Lord was trying to rescue him. And Judas was determined to continue his treachery. And therefore the Lord said to him, that thou doest, do quickly. And no man had, in verse 28, no man at the table knew what intent he spake this unto him. And there, brothers and sisters, is an amazing, an incredible example of a true friend. Because the Lord never spilt the beans about Judas to anybody. Nobody knew what Jesus knew about Judas. We talk about confidentiality. And we talk about how to preserve someone's reputation that might be going down a wrong path in the hope that when they recover, the fewest amount of people that need to know have to wrestle with just living with the memory of the deceit of that person. But nobody else has to. What an amazing friend. Wouldn't you want a friend like that when you're in trouble and you're going down the wrong path? And we just delight in gossiping about people's uh, misdeeds and, and their failures, and we think, oh, you know, we're, we're going to get credits for knowing information. That's not the spirit of Christ. That's not the spirit of a true friend. It was all revealed in the end because Judas did not respond to the love of Christ. He was not constrained by the love of Christ at all. And we go now to John chapter 18, and he's now gone, and he has prepared as he had arranged a band of men to arrange the to arrest the Lord Jesus Christ in Gethsemane. And I'm going to have to skip some of the detail of this story, but just to focus on Judas. So 
So we know the story, so I'm just going to be brief in sketching um, what happens. But the band of men in verse 3, the, the Greek word band, um, is a, a Roman cohort of a minimum 400 soldiers and maximum estimates have been 600 soldiers. So you imagine this scene in the darkness of Gethsemane with the olive trees around. You imagine 600. Let, well, let's take the conservative number. And there was also, in addition to the band of Roman soldiers, uh, representatives of the high priest, the, the temple guard, and the Pharisees that had come fully armed. The word weapons is panopla. You've heard the expression panoply. Well, that comes from the word panopla. Pan means above all. So they were fully armed. And they encircled the Lord Jesus Christ and the 11 with a ring of fire. You imagine 400 men. You know, I mean, how many, uh, how many rings of soldiers there were and they were completely trapped. And we read in Acts 1 verse 16 that Judas was guide to them that took Jesus. John says he received a band. This was his, his um, arrest. He was, he was the one that was going to be recognised as a national hero to achieve what the Jews had never been able to achieve to this point. And they were fully armed. John 10, verse 10 to 11, speaking about the good shepherd, the Lord had said, the thief, the thief cometh not but for to steal and to kill and to destroy. I am come that they might have life and have it more abundantly. I'm the good shepherd, and the good shepherd gives his life for the sheep. And we know what was going to happen. Zechariah prophesied of it. When Zechariah in 13, verse 7, <coughs> said, Awake, O sword, this is Yahweh speaking through Zechariah, against my shepherd, the man that is my fellow, saith Yahweh of hosts, smite the shepherd, and the sheep shall be scattered. But I, says Yahweh, will turn mine hand upon the little ones. It's like David who left his sheep with a keeper when he went and engaged Goliath in battle. Our Lord Jesus Christ was the shepherd, brothers and sisters. And you know what happened. You know, of course, Judas had given them a sign because in the darkness of night and with the, tor the, the illumination of the torches, it may not have been clear who was the, the Lord Jesus Christ in that garden. So Judas had given them a sign that whoever he would kiss, the same one is the one that they had to seize. But they came for them all, brothers and sisters. And when, Jesus, um, when uh, Judas came forward out of that ring of fire, and came close to the Lord Jesus Christ. We read in John, uh, sorry, Matthew 26, verse 49, he, and forthwith, straightway. So the, 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 uh, the band of soldiers had, had, play, had placed themselves, they were in position. Judas comes forward, and forthwith he said, Hail, Master, and kissed him. The Greek word kissed, katafilisen. It's not the normal word, filisen, it has kata in front of it. And the word kata is a prefix that intensifies a word that could mean repeatedly kiss or earnestly kiss. And Proverbs 27 verse 6 said, faithful are the wounds of a friend, but the kisses of an enemy are deceitful. And that Hebrew word actually is the same as kata filisen. It can mean multiplied, abundant or plentiful. And you can imagine Judas in a show of feigned uh, friendship starts kissing the Lord. You've seen the Greeks kiss on both cheeks, either intensively or repeatedly kissing him. And Jesus said to him, friend, why have you come? And then Judas steps back and Jesus takes over. And in verse uh, 5, uh, sorry, uh, sorry, let's come back at verse 4. Jesus, knowing all things that should come upon him, went forth and said unto them, Whom seek ye? Now, Judas had obviously just identified him, and I believe, placing all the records in chronology, the Lord goes forward to them and say, Who are you looking for? They said, Jesus of Nazareth. And he repeated those words that we just considered in John 13. Ego, emi, I am he and as soon as he had said that brothers and sisters 
all of those 400 soldiers fell backwards and flat on the ground. Flaming torches and weapons, he flattened a lot of them, including Judas, who the record tells us stood with them and he fell with them. They all went backwards and fell to the ground. We read that in verse um, in verse um, six. As soon as he'd said those two words, they went backwards and fell to the ground. And they get up and compose themselves and try and rearrange themselves and regroup and reposition. He says to them a second time in verse seven, who are you looking for? They said, Jesus of Nazareth. And he said, I've told you that it's me. If you seek me, let these go. And he who never used the divine power for himself, he just said to Peter, I could call down 12 legions of angels, but how else can the scriptures be fulfilled? But he threw them to the ground, brothers and sisters, because he was not going to let Judas or those men take his sheep. They were under divine protection and he secured their release in the presence of Judas. I am he. Now, if that wasn't a sign to Judas and to all of them that he was the Messiah, of course, we know that they all forsook him and fled. But John says that the saying might be fulfilled, verse 9, which he spake of them which thou hast given me, I have lost none. It was always about protecting and saving his sheep. The son of man is not come to destroy, but to save. The thief has come to destroy and to kill. What a tragic story, including Judas, that this was. And we know the story that from there involved Peter and Peter's rebuke and the Lord's healing of Malchus's ear and the Lord surrendering to them as the disciples who were given a way of escape and the soldiers parted were given the opportunity to flee to safety, which they did. So we come to Matthew 27 and the, the repentance of Judas. So Matthew 20, uh, 27 and verse 3. We read that it was then, and the then directs us to the verses previous which tell us what had transpired after the Jewish trial and our Lord being uh, delivered to Pontius Pilate, the governor. Now, the Lord had, on a number of occasions, given to them a seven-part prophecy of what was going to be for him when he entered into Jerusalem. It's recorded in Matthew 20, verse 17 to 19. He was going to be betrayed. He was going to be condemned to death. He was going to be delivered to the Gentiles. So there's three of the seven-part prophecy that's already been fulfilled. We read of that in verse 2. They're going to mock him. They're going to scourge him. They're going to crucify him. And on the third day, he will rise again. And it was when three of the seven-part prophecy, three elements of the seven-part prophecy was fulfilled that Judas could see the inevitability of what would transpire following that. And it was then that Judas, which had betrayed him and saw that he was condemned, repented himself and brought again the 30 pieces of silver to the chief priests and elders saying, I've sinned in that I've betrayed the innocent blood. And they said, what is that to us? See thou to that. And he cast down the piece of silver in the temple and departed and went and hanged himself. What a tragic end for a man for whom the ending could have been very different. We, we read there that he repented. And there's a beautiful quote that the Apostle Paul in 2 Corinthians 7 verse 10 has recorded for us in the response of the Corinthian brethren to the challenges that the Apostle Paul presented to them in his first epistle. He said to them, Godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation. And that is not to be repented of. 
but the sorrow of the world worketh death. We can only think, brothers and sisters, that the word repent, which means to um, think again uh, or to reflect back with remorse about what had happened, was not the true repentance of turning around and going in the opposite direction, which is necessary for the forgiveness of sins. It's not enough to be sorry when we see the consequences of our actions. The world is sorry when they get caught. That's not the sorrow that leads to repentance, that leads to salvation. That's godly sorrow. Sadly, Judas did not have godly sorrow because if he had, that would have lead, led him to repentance unto salvation. Now, um, in verse, um, uh, I'm just going to paraphrase verse um, 10 and 11. Well, verse 11 of 2 Corinthians 7, I know I don't have it on the screen. Um, Paul says, talking to the Corinthians who he challenged uh, on a, a moral issue that they had not managed properly in their ecclesia, he says, have a look at this very matter that I challenged you on. You sorrowed with godly sorrow. You responded to my challenge with great care to clear yourselves of past guilt. You were angry about how you had acted. You feared God. You earnestly desired with great zeal to redress your actions and to find approval and to clear yourselves of any blame. That's verse 11, which follows verse 10. That's the godly sorrow that leads to repentance and salvation. And the Corinthian brethren had done that. And Paul commends them for their amazing response. But that was not, sadly, the response of Judas. And we have to be careful, brothers and sisters, that our remorse about our past is not remorse about being caught out or being found out because we know our sins will find us out. We need to have godly sorrow that leads to repentance, that leads to salvation because we have turned about and we have regrouped and we have done what Peter had done in turning back and showing fruits meet for repentance. Come to Acts chapter 1 as we conclude our, our study of the, the grisly end of Judas that's recorded in Acts chapter 1. Now in Acts chapter 1 we have the um, details that's not given to us in the Gospels about the the sad and gory end of Judas. And in verse 20, we have Peter quoting from Psalm, um, one, uh, Psalm 109. We'll go there in a minute. Psalm 109 about the replacement of Judas. But we're told in verse 18, this man purchased a field with the reward of iniquity, which we referred to earlier, which was, you think of... Uh, having enough money extorted from the common funds, enough to buy a block of land. So he didn't just steal five cents. He stole enough to buy a piece of land. He purchased a field. So it was no small thing. It was the reward of iniquity. The word iniquity means lawlessness. He was a man that sadly was self-deceived and he had blindly allowed his weakness to overcome him and to deceive him and to take him further than he ever thought he would ever go. And so it says that falling headlong, he burst asunder in the midst and all his bowels gushed out. Why, why, why do we need to be told that detail? Why do we need to know? Why couldn't we just have the simple suicide of Judas that he hung himself? Why do we need to know that he fell headfirst and he burst asunder in the middle and his bowels splattered out on it? And the answer is found in the quote that Peter has taken us to in verse 20 of Psalm 109. Just come back to this psalm. This psalm, obviously David wrote about Ahithophel, but it also foreshadowed the replacement uh, of Judas, which, of course, Peter was guided by because it spoke about his bishopric, let another take. What do we find out about um, Judas in Psalm 109? Well, 
Well, if we take Ahithophel as the example, I think it is important for us to understand that as far as Ahithophel was concerned, it was pride and not guilt that took his life. Now, I know suicide is a very sensitive subject, and I do understand there is a lot of mental illness involved that leads people to such a drastic and tragic end as suicide. But in the case of Judas, as was the case with Ahithophel, it was pride rather than guilt that took him to his end. Peter was a man that had done almost something similar to Judas, but that recovered from that because he believed that the Lord would show him mercy, which he did. He understood the mercy of the master and the mercy of his father. And on the basis of his faith in that mercy, he recovered himself from an awful situation, a very bad fall. Judas did not. We know the story of Ahithophel. But let's just uh, look at... Let's just look at, um, uh, so verse 8, let his days be few and let another take his office. So that's what's quoted in Acts chapter 1. Just come down and just have a look at what, um, what was the uh, reason why we're told about his bowels uh, being splattered out on the ground. So verse, um, verse 15, verse 16, we can start here. Because he remembered not to show mercy. Now, in the Greek, uh, and it is similar in the Hebrew, the word bowels are, uh, the Greek word splachneon is actually used for bowels of mercy. And the bowels become a metaphor for intense emotion. And because they are rich in nerve endings and strong emotion is felt in the bowels. You know the time when the bowels of, of Joseph yearned upon Benjamin. So strong emotion is felt in the bowels. So that expression, bowels of mercy, which is common in the New Testament, or compassion and, and pity, it's all um, part of the metaphor of the bowels being used for strong feelings of mercy and compassion. And Judas had no mercy for the poor and needy man that he had persecuted. And it slayed the broken in heart. That was his bowels. He was not constrained by the blood, by the, 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 the uh, death of Christ. He loved cursing, so let it come to him. As he delighted not in blessing, this is the language of the Abrahamic covenant, I will bless them that bless thee and curse him that curseth thee, so let it be far from him. Let blessing be far from him. As he, as he clothed himself with cursing like as with a garment, so let it come into his bowels, just like water flows into the bowels and like oils and like oil into his bones. It pervaded him, cursing. He drunk it in because of his treachery. And it was poetic justice that those bowels which had showed no compassion were splattered to the ground because he had drunk cursing just like water. Just want to finish with a consideration of whether Judas could have obtained mercy. I'd like you to come with me to Acts chapter 3. We know the mercy of the Father. We know that mercy rejoices against judgment. We know that David was a condemned man twice over because of cold-blooded murder and adultery. There was no way that the law could have been read any other way than he was a dead man twice over apart from the consequences. But the Lord delights in mercy. And when David was in a strait and Nathan came to him and said, well, choose of the evils, here are the evils, he said in Second of Samuel 24 and verse 14, all I ask, I'm in a great strait. I know the legislation of Yahweh. All I ask is that I fall into the hands of Yahweh because his mercies are great. Don't let me fall into the hands of men. And that is true, brothers and sisters. Judas went back to men, to the priests and elders. You're not going to find mercy there. They said, well, 
That's not my, that's not our problem. That's your problem. You sort it out. When we're in situations where we're overcome with guilt and transgression and we're faced with the reality of legislation and the judgment that falls upon us, and rightly so, it's God, brothers and sisters and young people, to whom we should turn because David understood his mercies are great. And even if Yahweh had, by his law, judged David twice dead, David knew that mercy rejoiced, rejoiceth over judgment. And we need to remember that, brothers and sisters. Don't ever get so despondent that you're that far gone and you have messed up so badly that there is no way that you can plead to the Father for mercy because his mercy is without limits. And how do we know that? Peter learned that, brothers and sisters. And we're going to listen to Peter preaching the gospel. And Peter is going to preach the gospel, which we all know about, about a quote that we so often quote at lectures. Verse 19, repent therefore and be converted, that your sins may be blotted out. What sins was Peter talking about? Well, let's read of them. Uh, let's start at verse, um, well, this is Peter's response, of course, to the healing of the uh, lame man at the uh, beautiful gate. Let's start at verse 13. The God of Abraham and of Isaac and of Jacob, the God of our fathers, has glorified his son Jesus. So crime number one, whom ye delivered up. Second crime. Denied him in the presence of Pilate when he was determined to let him go. But it gets worse. You denied the Holy One and the just. Falsely accused him. God's only son. Promised to the fathers. And you desired a murderer to be granted to you. And you killed the Prince of Life. Wow, that is serious crime. And that's what the Jews had done. No question, that's what they had done. Yes, Peter had denied him. Yes, Judas had betrayed him. But could you imagine yourself charged with these crimes? And not just of any man, the Son of God. You've killed the Prince of Life, whom God has raised from the dead. And how would you feel if you were those Jews listening to Peter telling you where you stood before your God? And Peter says, repent and be converted and your sins will be blotted out. <laughs> blotted out. <laughs> Removed from the record. Remembered no more. Brothers and sisters and young people, never, ever, ever underestimate the mercy of God. You can be in the blackest darkest place, ashamed of your actions and face the consequences of your actions, as is rightly so. Don't go to men if you seek mercy. They will never let you forget what you've done. That's a human response. But there is a Father in heaven whose knowledge of his creation is that intimate that not one little piece of information escapes him. He knows all things. And he says, you repent and you be converted and I'm blotting out your sins from my memory and from my record. And pray God that we might learn the lessons of what Judas had failed to learn so that in that day we may be presented faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy.
we have a fight that we need to fight. Mm -hmm. And we do have a master who is a master that can bring out the best in us. And that best can exceed even our expectations. And we come this morning to a study which involves a unique man and a friend of this unique man, Nicodemus the Master. And we want to consider this morning just his journey of discipleship and what the Lord made of him. I'd just like you to come back to John chapter 2 and we'll start here as the Lord in his first Passover responds to the fame that uh, he was um, he was uh, responded to uh, with by the people at his uh, first Passover. And we read in John chapter 2 and verse 23, now when he was in Jerusalem at the Passover in the feast day, many believed in his name when they saw the miracles which he did. But Jesus did not commit himself unto them because he knew all men and needed not that any should testify of man for he knew what was in man. Our Lord was not just drawn to people just because they believed in his name when they saw the miracles which he did. He did not commit. And sometimes we say, well, you know, the question is, are we a committed follower of Christ? That's not the question. A relationship is a two-way street. It's whether the Lord has committed himself to us. And it will depend on what kind of man or woman we are. And the Lord didn't need an introduction for anybody that he met. He knew what was in man. He was given divine power and perception to be able to see through every man. And I love the way John writes this gospel. And you remember I spoke to you about the uh, Greek manuscripts, how that they were written just from left to right with no spaces even between words, let alone chapter breaks and, and verses and punctuation. And it reads just like that in John's gospel. He knew what was in man, there was a man. That's how it reads. Because we're introduced to a unique man, a man that the Lord is going to make strong for himself. So when we look at um, John chapter 2 and verse um, 18, the Lord had made it very clear to the Jews about what he knew they were going to do to him. And because, of course, they responded to the way in which he just came into the temple, took it over, drove out the tables of the money changers and them that bought and sold and took ownership of that house. And they said to him in verse 18, we want a sign of your authority. On what basis have you done this? And the Lord's going to give them the first of two signs. What sign showest thou, seeing that thou doest these things? And here's the first sign. He's looking at them and he's saying to them, destroy this body. And in three days I'll raise it up. First sign. He didn't say, I will destroy this body, as was falsely asserted at his trial. He said to them, I know what you're going to do to me. Destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. But, of course, we know in verse 21 he spake of the temple of his body. The second, if you're taking notes, is in Matthew 12 and verse 38 to 40 when certain of the scribes and Pharisees answered saying, Master, we would see a sign from thee. And he said to them, an evil and an adulterous generation seeketh after a sign, and there shall no sign be given to it but the sign of the prophet Jonas. For as Jonas was three days and three nights in the whale's belly, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. And you know, the Pharisees knew that before the disciples knew that. The disciples knew that uh, after the Lord was risen, 
The Jews knew that because they went to Pilate and they said to him, this deceiver said, he prize the third day. They knew it before the disciples. So they knew what he meant. So we have now two signs that were going to be fulfilled as the vindication of the Lord's authority. And we know, of course, they were fulfilled in exact detail. And if anyone missed the sign of the prophet Jonas, there were two massive earthquakes, one at the Lord's death and one at his resurrection, which shook the whole city of Jerusalem so no one would mistake the three days and the three nights sign as evidence that he was Messiah. And they destroyed him. And in three days he rose again. Now there was a man in verse 3, no ordinary man. He's called the master, and we'll look at this when we get to verse 10. And the Greek has the definite article, art thou the master of Israel? If ever you wanted a counterpart to the master that the Lord was, the real master, if you ever wanted a counterpart to him in Jewish standing as the master in Israel, the authority on the Bible, it was Nicodemus. He was, by the Lord's reckoning, the master in Israel. Now, so we've got two masters here, the real one and the fake or the pseudo master who thinks he knows everything and the Lord's going to challenge him. And we're not going to go into this in great detail. I would love to, but I don't have the time. We have a discussion that happens in verse 3 and verse 5 about essentially two cleansings. And you'll see the language in verse 3. The, the first cleansing enables someone to see the kingdom. And in verse 5, two cleansings born of water and of spirit enables a person to enter into the kingdom. And, of course, the Lord is speaking in spiritual language and Nicodemus has no idea where the Lord's going with this. And the Lord says to him in verse 10, I mean, you are the authority on the Bible. Don't you know what I'm talking about? Now, I'm not going to go into this in great detail, but, of course, you would understand that there is a template in the Scriptures for the journey of a disciple towards the kingdom. And it was in the way in which the Exodus was conducted that delivered the nation of Israel out of the bondage and slavery of Egypt into the Promised Land. And how many cleansings were there? How many waters did they pass through? Two. Red Sea, Jordan. So the parable is very evident. And you enter through the Red Sea, you have a vision of the kingdom set before you, but you need to go through the Jordan, which represents the reversing of mortality as the descending waters from the sea of life down to the sea of death are driven right back to Adam and incorruptibility and divine nature is granted so we can enter, verse 5, into the kingdom. So that... That the whole story of the Exodus is the substratum and our Lord Jesus Christ was going to conduct the greatest Exodus. He spoke of that in Luke 9, the, the decease that he should accomplish in Jerusalem. He spoke to Moses, of all people, and Elijah, men who, of course, um, are known for uh, conducting an Exodus and they were, they were going to achieve an Exodus for all of the faithful out of the land of sin and death into the kingdom. Nicodemus is struggling to know where the Lord's going. Well, of course, Nicodemus was uh, a no ordinary Pharisee. Uh, we're told that he was a Pharisee and the Pharisees, as we know, were separatists. However, they were self-righteous hypocrites and their separatism was not based on faithfulness to the law of God and the Lord definitely condemned them because in Matthew 15, verse 9, he says, In vain you worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. So don't ever accuse a faithful brother or sister in the truth that wants to devote themselves 100%, as faithfully as they can, to the nth degree to serve their God and to honour him as they want to in their own personal conscience and belief. Don't talk to that brother or talk of them as though they are a tick box Pharisee. That's not Pharisaism. Pharisaism 
is a man-made set of teachings and doctrines, which in Mark 7, verse 13, the Lord said, were not gods because they actually made the word of God of none effect by their traditions. They were actually breaking the principles of the truth by their traditions. These were not traditions that were there to assist the uh, manifestation of the principles of the truth. These were traditions that broke the actual laws and, and values of God. They made the word of God of none effect through their tradition. So let's define Pharisaism correctly. And let's not accuse brothers and sisters who just want to do their best for God, even to the nth degree. Let's not think that they're Pharisees. Pharisees broke the word of God by their tradition. Nicodemus's name means victor over the people. Nico, and that's where Nike um, comes from, the Greek word victory. Demas, democracy, the people, victory over the people. And he was a ruler of the Jews, which means he was a member of the Jewish Sanhedrin. Uh, the word archon, the first in rank and power, if you just come over to John chapter 12, and uh, here's what these men were like. <clears throat> this is the power that they wielded, these rulers <clears throat> of, the, of the Jews. This is John 12, verse 42. Nevertheless, among the chief rulers, many believed on him. And the word chief rulers is our word uh, ruler of the Jews. But because of the Pharisees, they did not confess him lest they should be put out of the synagogue, for they loved the praise of men more than the praise of God. And Nicodemus was both a ruler of the Jews and a Pharisee, but he was more than that. He was the master and the authority on Bible exposition. Bullinger actually says that rabbinical trans, tra tradition makes him one of the three richest men in Jerusalem. Joseph of Arimathea, Caiaphas and Nicodemus were purported to be the three richest men in Jerusalem. So this was no ordinary man. This was no ordinary Pharisee, no ordinary member of the Jewish Sanhedrin and no ordinary master. He was also a man of great wealth and great power and influence. And he came to Jesus by night. He said to him, Rabbi, master, teacher, we, not speaking on his own behalf here, we know that thou art a teacher come from God because no man can do these miracles except Emmanuel. So he makes a confession and the Lord is going to give Nicodemus an instruction about his destiny when he speaks to him about him being lifted up in verse 14. And, of course, we know that that is, of course, re a reference to his crucifixion. But I'd just like you to come back with me to Numbers chapter 9 because Nicodemus... And um, a friend of his, Joseph of Arimathea, were actually prefigured in the Old Testament. Amazingly prefigured. And in Numbers chapter 9, we have the record of certain men in verse 6 who come to Moses and they have a problem because it's Passover. So tuck that in the back of your mind. It's Passover because that's when our Lord is going to be lifted up, isn't it? Well, they come to Moses and they say to him, we be defiled, this is Numbers 9, verse 6, we def be defiled by the dead body of a man. They had just buried a man and come into contact with death, and so they were precluded from keeping the Passover that day. So they came to Moses and Aaron and said, we be defiled by the dead body of a man. Why are we kept back that we may not offer an offering unto Yahweh in his appointed season among the children of Israel. The Passover was the most important of all of the festivals of Yahweh. And these men were kept back and they, they didn't want to be kept back. You, you imagine we're going to have a Bible school and we're going to have this amazing program. And well, it's almost like COVID, isn't it? Caught COVID, you can't come. Well, in this case, they had buried a man and they couldn't come. How would you feel if you were in that place? I heard, um, I heard that Baruch couldn't come, and sadly, um, the young people uh, had to put up with um, a stand-in replacement because he wasn't able to come, poor boy. I feel for him because he would be like these men, thinking, why can't we come? Well, you're contagious. And so it wasn't a disease that they were contagious with. They were contaminated by ceremonial death. 
and they uh, were therefore infectious. So um, we're living in days very similar and we can relate to that. However, um, just on, on the side, I had an amazing night with the young people last night. I really enjoyed the opportunity of engaging with them. Uh, they even let me play basketball. It's a very strange game. You have to throw this ball. Normally with balls, you kick them and you kick them into goals, you know, but they have this tiny net. In soccer, you have proper goals, like they're a bit this wide. <laughs> anyway, that's fine. It's just, um, anyway, we had a lovely evening together and I was really impressed with our young people and their response to uh, the meditation and the discussions that we enjoyed at supper after. Um, so um, um, how, did, how did we ever get to that? Oh, that's right. Sorry, I'm tracing back to Baruch and to these men. Okay, so, but a tragedy. So Yahweh responds and says in verse 10, if any man of you of his posterity be unclean by reason of a dead body or be on a journey, he will keep the Passover. So you're not going to miss out on the Bible school. However, it's going to be kept on the 14th day of the second month it's going to be a smaller event just with those people that couldn't be part of the main Bible school. And it's going to be kept on the 14th day of the second month. So think about this. So here's men that touched the dead body of a man, could not keep the Passover, and were given an extension by grace other than that which was legislated in the law so they could still keep the Passover, but it couldn't be the Passover that was legislated on the 14th of the first month. Now we need to come to Numbers 19 because these men needed cleansing from the contamination of the defilement of death. <clears throat> and in Numbers 19, we have one of the most amazing offerings that is outside the Levitical um, uh, catalogue of offerings because this offering is totally unique. It has nothing to do with the tabernacle. It's offered outside the camp. It's once offered and could be used forever after. It has all of the elements of the sacrifice of the Lord Jesus Christ other than how the offerings and the sacrifices daily and, and, um, and annually were conducted under the Le Levitical law, and that's why it's in the book of Numbers. This is an amazing sacrifice, and we're not going to go into it in any detail. Suffice to say that this is the place where we have a cure for the defilement of death, the only sacrifice under the law that ever gave hope that death could be overcome and the taint of death could be removed. And it was the offering of the red heifer. And it was administered with water. And it was administered by two cleansings. So you can see now where the Lord is directing Nicodemus to because the cleansings of Israel's journey in the Exodus were summarized in this one offering that had two cleansings. And you'll see in verse 12 and verse 19, there was a cleansing on the third day of the water, which was mixed with the ashes of the heifer, and the seventh day, and you'll notice that the seventh day was also a cleansing. So the clean person will sprinkle upon the unclean the third day and the seventh day, and the seventh day he will be purified. But notice verse 12, if the third day cleansing has not been done, the seventh day will be ineffective. And that's interesting, isn't it? Because if the Red Sea and the cleansing of the third day, the day of resurrection, when we are risen with Christ, if we're not baptised, the seventh day when we cross the Jordan and we have the cleansing of the final removing of the taint of death will be ineffective. So it's very, very evident that we have a very clear um, uh, a summary of the whole Exodus parable in the way in which death would be removed and purification would be affected. But there's some really interesting details. Oh, actually, I missed one verse back in Numbers 9. Sorry. Oh, see, that's what happens when you don't read your notes. So in Numbers 9, just go back there because I, I had two things I wanted to point out that I had forgotten about. Uh, in verse 12... These men were also reminded that the Passover lamb could not remain to the morning. It had to be totally offered in sacrifice because Psalm 16 verse 10 said, concerning the Passover lamb of our Lord Jesus Christ, neither will thou suffer thine holy one to see corruption. 
The other thing we're told in that verse, uh, in verse 12, I've got that. No, oh, actually, uh, uh, okay, so actually that comes. I've, I've taken that from the Exodus um, record of the Passover. The other thing that's repeated here is that a bone of that um, Passover land could not be broken. And that, of course, was also um, part of the Passover uh, mm -hmm. requirements, and that's going to be fulfilled in our Lord Jesus Christ, who's the antitype. So I just missed those two slides. But just concerning the red heifer, in Numbers 19 now, so we're coming back to no Numbers 19, we have in verse 9 that the ashes of the red heifer are going to be laid up without the camp in a clean place. And the clean, uh, the man that is clean, we're going to see who that is in the gospel records, and we're going to see the clean place that was outside the camp. And, of course, we just read that in, uh, Brother Jeffrey read that for us in John uh, chapter 19, where in the place uh, where our Lord was crucified, there was a garden and there was a sepulchre wherein Never man was yet laid. It was not defiled by death. It was a clean place. Look at the prophecies concerning the burial of our Lord Jesus Christ in these two chapters. Okay, so we need to establish that. The other thing we need to establish is that we know, and we're going to deal with this in a little bit more detail shortly, we know that Isaiah 53 also made a prophecy concerning the Lord's burial, and that was, and I've got the RV here, that his grave was going to be appointed with the wicked. And the destiny of the Lord would have been the rubbish dump of Gehenna. However, he was with the rich in his death. So somehow the course of the destiny of the Lord by the Jews was obstructed and he was delivered out of their hands in Isaiah 53 verse 9. Uh, prophesize that. We're going to see how this is this is uh, fulfilled. So let's just come back to, we can come back to uh, John chapter 3. Uh, yes, John chapter 3 now. And uh, our Lord Jesus Christ really taking this master of Israel, who was an authority on the scriptures, really taking him to the limits of his understanding of spiritual concepts and helping him to understand he really needed to go back to his Bible and do some Bible study to see how all of those scriptures were to be fulfilled in Messiah. And so we come back to verse 10 in the end of this conversation about the two cleansings and their significance. And Nicodemus, how can these things be? He's, he really is lost. And the Lord says to him in verse 10, Nicodemus, you're the master in Israel. And don't you know what I'm talking about? And I think we must stop here, brothers and sisters, and just spend a minute just emphasizing the need for us to know our Bibles. Nicodemus was a master. And we have the responsibility to be teachers. If we're parents, we're teachers. We could be teachers in Sunday school. We could be um, teachers because we, we have a, a responsibility that we're being given to lead a study or, uh, or write a book or write a paper. But we are teachers and we need to know our stuff. There's no good just sitting down with our children and doing the readings and have no idea, haven't even picked up the story of the Bible or the expositor just to flick through to make sure that we've got some basic understanding of the reading so that when we sit with our children, we can actually not just read the scriptures, but we can draw out to them the message of the scriptures and instruct our children. It's, of course, the responsibility of parents. But... This is a very important thing. We're not given the Bible for no reason. And Israel's history is a, is a testament to a lack of knowledge. And this is Hosea 4 verse 6, one of many scriptures we could go to. But lack of knowledge destroyed the ecclesia. It destroyed the ecclesia. Because they rejected knowledge. They rejected knowledge. So when someone stood up that was a spokesman on God's behalf, ah, listen to him go on about Bible exposition. and Why do we need to know this stuff? Like, honestly, I mean, Old Testament stuff too, by the, by the way. We're not living in Old Testament times. Please just tell me some 
like really encouraging things. Tell me that Jesus loves me. It tells me, tell me if I have Jesus in my heart, I'm saved. That would be really encouraging. Don't bore me with Bible study. And we have to be very careful, brothers and sisters, that we are rooted and grounded in the knowledge of the truth. And we don't despise good, solid exposition of the scriptures. Here's the Lord saying to Nicodemus, if you are teaching people and you're a teacher, you should know your stuff. Get back to your Bible and read it. And why was that important, brothers and sisters? Paul gave an exposition in Hebrews to the Jerusalem Ecclesia, and we sometimes struggle to even understand his arguments. Why was it important for him to explain the atonement to the Jerusalem Ecclesia? Because it was a matter of life and death, that's why. Because AD 70 was coming. And Paul feared that these brethren in the Jerusalem Ecclesia had not understood that Christ was the fulfilment of all that had preceded him. And they could not be justified by the law apart from Christ. And that was a matter of life and death. They needed to know Paul's exposition of the atonement because the Lord had said, you didn't know the day of your visitation and the things which belong to your peace because they're hid from your eyes. And I'm going to bring the Romans and they're going to decimate you and destroy you. That's how serious Bible knowledge is. And Nicodemus was in the same predicament. And so we need to know our stuff. And the Lord then proceeded to talk to Nicodemus about the, uh, the serpent in the wilderness from Numbers 21. We're not going to go back there either. But, of course, you know how beautiful the whole allegory of the serpents in the wilderness and the brazen serpent that was lifted up. And the, the Lord said to Nicodemus, now, listen, I'm telling you, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. Now, I'm going to skip a little bit of the story of the development of Nicodemus's faith, but if you want to just make a note of John 7, verse 45 to 53, you'll see how difficult it was for Nicodemus amongst his own group, and he was still one of them, we know uh, from that record. He found it very difficult. He tried to speak up for the Lord, but he was just absolutely intimidated by his colleagues. And it was very difficult for him to actually step out of the darkness of this interview and step into the light. But just before we leave John 3, have a look at verse 21. Because the Lord says to Nicodemus, you know this discussion about men loving darkness rather than light because their deeds are evil. But he says to Nicodemus in verse 21, he that doeth truth comes to the light that his deeds may be made manifest, revealed, in, in the open, that they are wrought in God. And that's what's going to happen. Come to John chapter 8. Nicodemus is going to see this message of the Lord being lifted up. John 8 and verse 28. Jesus said to them, when ye, he's talking to the Jews, when ye have lifted up the Son of Man, then ye shall know that I am he, and that I do nothing of myself, but as my Father hath taught me, I speak these things. You know how John chapter 8 finishes. Um, they took up stones to um, murder our Lord Jesus Christ. John 9 verse 16, we also know that the Jews were divided over the Lord Jesus Christ. Some of the Pharisees said, this man is not of God because he doesn't keep the Sabbath day. Others said, how can this man be a sinner uh, and do such miracles? And there was a division among them. John chapter 12. Verse 12. Uh, John 12. Oh, sorry. Verse 12 to 19 is our Lord's entry into the city of Jerusalem. Um, and I'm just going to just come to verse 32 just to save time. Um, well, verse 31 is a reference to uh, Caiaphas and the judgment that would come upon the head of the ecclesia because he was, of course, the high priest. 
the prince of this world is going to be cast out. And I, he says, if I be lifted up, there's that same expression, from the earth I will draw all men unto me. This, he said, signifying what death he should die. And then what happened as Nicodemus stood at the foot of the cross? Well, let me summarize. He had said to the Jews, destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. He said to Nicodemus, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. He said to the Pharisees, when you've lifted up the Son of Man, then you know that I am he and that what you see me do is not of myself, it's of my Father. And he said to the same group of men in John 12, if I be lifted up from the earth, I will draw all men unto me. And he said to the Pharisees, as Jonas was three days and three nights in the heart of the earth, it was in the whale's belly, I beg your pardon, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Now, who knew about the plans of the Jews in John 19 and verse 31? Who knew what their plans would have been? And what were their plans? Well, we know these, so we're not going to go into it in detail. The Jews, therefore, because it was the preparation, and he is the master of Israel, Nicodemus, who's a member of the Sanhedrin, a Pharisee and the master, he would know absolutely what the normal procedure would be and what was planned. So what was planned? Well, they wanted his legs broken and his body taken away. And this was, of course, regarding the Lord Jesus Christ. And you and I know that that could not happen. And uh, Edashim tells us the practice was that because normally crucified victims uh, lingered on the cross for up to a week, in cases where uh, Jewish execution was conducted because there was a requirement that they be buried before sundown, this was not just any sundown because the Passover Sabbath, the most important holy day of the year was upon them, they would have a procedure called crurifragium, which is a Latin expression, which is the breaking of the legs of the victims by clubs until they're smashed and they can no longer keep themselves up and they die, they die of excruciating pain and asphyxiation. And it's interesting, well, it's not interesting. It's actually quite hard to read that that happened to one of our brethren in verse 32. Then came the soldiers and break the legs of the first. And of the other, which was crucified with him. And we know who that was. That was a man that the Lord delivered from the jaws of death itself. The thief on the cross to whom he said, I say to thee today, you will be with me in paradise. And this, this man was crucified with Christ. Well, they missed the Lord out. And then, of course, John records how um, the, the spear thrust fulfilled scripture concerning the blood and water that oozed out of the Lord's side. But so why do we read such a strange thing that they went to the first and they walked past Jesus and they, they broke the legs of the other to bring about an early death and then came to the middle and found that the Lord was dead already? And I'm going to suggest in the, uh, in the brief time that we have to us that this is the story of the interception of the Jews' plan and the rescuing of the Lord's body from their hands in order to fulfil scripture at a very critical time when there was nobody else. There was no man among the 12. Well, among the 11. Like this was so critical. There were so many scriptures hanging on our Lord being delivered from the intention of the Jews and being buried, as we have just considered from the Old Testament scriptures, in a clean place by a clean man. His grave appointed with the wicked. He couldn't be thrown in Gehenna. He couldn't have a bone broken. Who was going to rescue the Lord Jesus Christ? And, of course, it was a man. 
and it was not Nicodemus. It was Joseph. And, you know, sometimes we, uh, we, um, we think, oh, wow. So it was Joseph that went into Pilate and craved and begged the body of Jesus. And all the records tell us um, that that was the case. And we sort of think, oh, wow. Okay, so we expected, you know, there was a man that it would be Nicodemus. And the discussion that the Lord had had and, and Nicodemus trying to stand up for the Lord and Nicodemus now seeing all of these things that the Lord said fulfilled. And the man, well, Luke says, behold, there was a man. This is Luke's record. So if you're taking notes, Luke 23, verse 50 to 52, we'll probably come back to, uh, well, no, we'll stay in John. There was a man and his name was Joseph. He was a counselor and he was a good man and a just, a righteous man. The same consented not to the counsel and deed of them. He also waited for the kingdom of God. He was a disciple of Jesus. And he went to Pilate and begged the body of Jesus. Mark says he craved the body of Jesus. He went in. And we would have loved the story if we were a Hollywood scriptwriter. We would write this beautiful story about Nicodemus's bravery. You know, because we've set up this, this man and we would expect that he would be the one. And, you know, brothers and sisters, I think we need to understand that God doesn't deal with nice stories. He deals with real life. And sometimes Caleb's need a Joshua and sometimes Barak's need a Deborah and sometimes Jonathan's need a David. And that's what God provided for this man. And John records that for us in verse 38 of John 19. And after this, Joseph of Arimathea, being a disciple of Jesus, but secretly for fear of the Jews, and Nicodemus might have been one of those uh, at, at one point in his life, he besought Pilate and Pilate granted him the custody of that body. And, of course, we know if we combine the records that when, Nick, when uh, Joseph rather came into Pilate, Pilate was surprised that he was even dead and he had to go and get it checked. So that, if you align that in the chronology, that could not have happened after the legs were broken. The custody of the body was given to Joseph before the crew fragrium and the Lord, therefore, was to, the soldiers were told not to break his legs. He's already dead. And the soldier, of course, out of curiosity, wanting to just check that, that was, the report was correct, fulfilled scripture in the piercing of his side, as we know. What an amazing thing for this man. And he went in. Remember, we read in the uh, record of the trial of the Lord Jesus Christ, the Jews would not go in to the judgment hall, lest they should be defiled, but that they should keep the Passover. And Joseph goes straight into Pilate because he knew he was precluding himself from the Jews' Passover. He'd already made that decision. He wasn't interested. He knew the real Passover lamb. And he chose an extension by grace other than what was legislated because he knew that that was God's Passover lamb. And he was personally involved in taking our Lord, and laying him to rest. And then John records, there came also Nicodemus, which first came to Jesus by night. Here's two unlikely heroes come out of nowhere, not even in the ecclesia, not even part of the apostles, not privileged to all of the things that the apostles were privileged to hear about the Lord Jesus Christ in greater detail than they heard. And here's a secret disciple who's too fearful to come out into the light to make manifest that his deeds are wrought in God. And here's Nicodemus who first came to Jesus by night. In broad daylight, they come to the foot of the cross so that all of the thousands of people that had flocked the city of Jerusalem and overflowed the city 
including international guests that had come to the Passover. The city was brooming and overflowing with people. These men in broad daylight made their allegiance known. He was their master. And they were going to risk their lives to pay their respects to him and fulfil scripture in the most daring and courageous move. Do you know how how open their their allegiance to Christ was. If you just come back to John chapter 19 and verse 20, look how close the site of crucifixion was to the city of Jerusalem. This title, John says, read many of the Jews, for the place where Jesus was crucified was nigh to the city. So in other words, the place where Jesus was crucified was that close to the city that you could read the words that Pilate wrote on the sign that he placed upon the cross. These men came out in public view, frightened, fearful, not wanting to be open about their discipleship, too scared to speak up. Why? Well, not because someone might laugh at them if they speak about the truth at work. because they were taking their life in their hands. We know the end of the story. I mean, the Jews took over the custody of, uh, of Joseph's sepulchre, took it straight over. It became public property. They set a guard. They set a watch. And these men are never spoken of ever since. We don't hear anything about them. But look what they did. John 19 and verse 40. Then took they the body of Jesus. Mark 15, verse 46, they took him down. They did it together, yes, but it was Joseph. And there also came Nicodemus. They took him down. Jesus said, the Son of Man will be lifted up. And they took him down. And you imagine what these men did. We haven't got time to detail the story of the burial, but you know the story. You imagine them having to remove the nails from the hands and the feet of the Lord and remove the crown of thorns and wash that body and anoint that body and wrap that body and place it in the sepulchre, so rescuing our Lord Jesus Christ from the destiny that was determined for him by their once colleagues. What an amazing thing conviction of Christ can do. Two unlikely men. And, you know, brothers and sisters, there's a, a beautiful, uh, beautiful fulfillment of the words of our Lord Jesus Christ to Nicodemus, which he said, he that doeth truth cometh to the light, that his deeds may be made manifest, that they are wrought in God. God was at work in these two men. Amazing, amazing what they did as a result of God working in their lives to achieve what nobody else apparently could do. So we fi finish in Jeremiah chapter 32. And this is a really encouraging scripture, brothers and sisters and young people. We look at our own lives and we think about how limited we are and we think about how frightened we might be and we think about the challenges and the obstacles and we think to ourselves discipleship is too hard but there's one thing that we know when we come to our god brothers and sisters and we allow him to work in our lives we find as jeremiah says i am yahweh and I am the God of all flesh. Is there anything too hard for me? I guarantee you, if you had talked to Nicodemus and Joseph at the beginning of the Lord's ministry and described where they would finally end in their discipleship, they would have said, no way. And we might too, brothers and sisters, because we might think, no, I, that, no, not me. He was a disciple secretly for fear of the Jews and a man who could only come to Jesus by night. 
And look what God could do with those men because they were convicted of Christ. There's nothing too hard for God, brothers and sisters. All we need to do is get our heads in the Bible and understand the scriptures and allow the power of God, who is the God of all flesh, to work in us and we will see that Christ is all in all in thee. So this study is really only for a small group of people. Um, it's only for those people that have ever been driven by circumstances of life to doubt. I don't know if there's anyone in this room that's ever been in that situation. Put your hands up if you've ever doubted that there is a God. I'm being honest. Put up your hands if you're an honest person. <laughs> the scriptures deal with real things that happen to real people. And, you know, the circumstances that overtook the apostles were, if I use the term unprecedented, it's an understatement. Like if you could put yourself in the position of Thomas and of the apostles, we sometimes do really doubt. When life throws challenges at us, we've recently lost a young seven-year-old girl. And that is hard. And it's hard to believe that there is a God and the God that we know exists in the scriptures. Of course, when everything goes well and when the kingdom's here tomorrow, we're, we're fine. But as soon as our world comes crashing down around us, Sometimes we do doubt. And Thomas was one of those people, as human as we are. And I think the story of his life and his journey is representative of us all. But I want to start in Ezekiel 37, if you just come back um, to Ezekiel 37 with me. And I know this might sound like an obscure place to start a study on Thomas. It'll become evident later uh, because uh, this is uh, just as important uh, a story about resurrection as the Lord's resurrection in which Thomas was involved. But we know, uh, we know these chapters, Ezekiel chapters 37, 38, and 39, and very often we refer to these uh, as, uh, and our brother Dan is just, just so difficult. Oh, he is, he is. Our brother Dan led us in uh, some exciting references to the fulfilling of Bible prophecy uh, that we are seeing, and we're very focused in on Ezekiel 38, of course. But I think it's really, really important, and I don't want to um, just simply say it's important. I wanted to really stress it's really, really important that when we are looking at this section of Ezekiel's prophecy, and I could have started earlier, but just say, for example, just these chapters, because chapter 37 is the, the resurrection of dry bones. But chapters 37 to 39, this is not, brothers and sisters, the story of Armageddon and God's judgments. And yes, it is. I shouldn't say it isn't. It isn't merely. This is the story of the resurrection of the nation of Israel. That's the story. And we know the story. But that's the story of the resurrection of the dry bones that continues through chapters 37, 38, and 39, until they are resurrected in every sense, not just politically, but also, of course, spiritually. And it's a process, and it's taken several years. And if the resurrection of Israel were a play, and bear with me because it isn't a play, but if it was a play, say, say it's a play and we're going to depict a play, where does the play start? Well, let's say it starts in 1897 because that's when the Zionist Council was held in Baal, Switzerland, and the Zionist movement was given some formality. 
and World War I and the liberation of Jerusalem from the Ottoman Turkish occupation and the San Remo Resolution of 1920, which then became uh, formalised in the League of Nations mandate of the, of the nation of Britain's uh, um, supervision over Jewish emigration into the land of Israel, which of course continued, uh, and we know the aftermath of World War II forced the United Nations to find a solution for this people that were almost destroyed and almost burnt to cinders. And then we had the, uh, the nation that was proclaimed uh, on the 14th of May, 1948. In 1967, Jerusalem back in the hands of the Jewish people. And in more recent months with the annexation of the West Bank and the Trump peace plan and the Abraham Accord and uh, the peace that has been brokered. This is the story of the resurrection of Israel. So we are not expecting the Lord's return as a standalone event that's going to start something. Because that something has already started. The resurrection of Israel has well and truly started, brothers and sisters. And you know that you and I are going to enter into the work of the angels who have overseen the commencement of this play and the resurrection story of Israel, we're going to take over at some point and we're going to be part of the completion of those chapters of Ezekiel 38 and 39. We are. And we've got the script and we're going to spend time with the director at Sinai brushing up our parts so that we are going to then enter in onto that world stage because that stage is a world stage. The whole world has seen what we are seeing, except they don't have the eyes that we have enlightened by Bible prophecy to know exactly what's happening because they have no idea what's happening. And it is important for us, brothers and sisters, to see the reality of the evidence of resurrection that God has mercifully provided for us to help us to know that there is certainty. God does not expect blind faith. And we're not waiting for an event, the Lord's return, to start the process of the establishment of the kingdom of God. That has already started. The play is in progress. And very soon we're going to be taken and prepared to stand on that stage and finish that sequence of chapters. And let us not forget, brothers and sisters, that our faith which is important, is based upon evidence. And we need to reach out and we need to touch that evidence. And that evidence, brothers and sisters, is not going to be found in news articles. The evidence is here. That's what our fingers need to touch, to reach out and touch the vindication of Bible prophecy that gives us certainty in the times of doubt how many times when I have doubted and looked for evidence, you can't go past Israel. You cannot go past Israel. The evidence, worldwide known evidence, is there for us to establish, to build, and to confirm faith. Why is faith important? Faith is important because, as we know, it's the basis of hope. If you're writing notes, Hebrews 11, verse 1. Hebrews 11, verse 2, by faith, the elders obtained a good report in the sight of God. They obtained his approval. Without faith, it is impossible to please God. Hebrews 11, verse 6. And our Lord Jesus Christ, our master, is the author and finisher of faith. Hebrews 12, verse 2. So faith is important. Faith for Thomas was going to be a big issue. Well, when we um, come to John chapter 11, we have Thomas in the record of the raising of Lazarus. And we know this record very well, and we're only going to briefly look at Thomas's involvement. Uh, and I'm going to assume, um, and I know I have justification for that assumption, it's a well-known record 
that we all understand the resurrection of Lazarus and how, of course, um, that beautiful expression that we read in verse 18, that Bethany was nigh Jerusalem. The things that happened in Bethany were amazing. And the things that happened in Bethany were going to be repeated in Jerusalem not many days hence. All of the things. And what an amazing experience the Lord was given in this experience to actually be part of a story which is full of what was going to happen to him, the son that God loved. And God gave him an amazing opportunity to actually walk through the circumstances of his own death, burial and resurrection but in his father's place to actually see what his father would see when he was unconscious. Amazing record, a beautiful record. And Thomas is involved here because as we know, when the Lord said, okay, so after abiding two days, still in the place that he was in verse six, after that, he said to his disciples, let us go into Judea again. And his disciples say to him, Master, the Jews, last time you were there, sought to stone thee. And are you going back there? We know that, of course, Judah was enemy territory. And the, Lord's, uh, the, the Lord was a wanted man, and that was publicly known. So the Lord knew that he was stepping into enemy territory in going to rescue a friend who was in the grips of death. And we read then in verse um, uh, in verse um, 9, the Lord's uh, continuing uh, response, are there not 12 hours in the day? If any man walk in the day, he doesn't stumble because he sees the light of the world. But if a man walk in the night, he stumbles because there is no light in him. And those words are going to be very important to all of the disciples because the reason why they stumbled in their faith is because they weren't focused on the light of the world. Our Lord Jesus Christ, the word made flesh and the illumination of the certainty of Bible prophecy that he had given them all. And they would stumble. But as we know, they uh, were men who were able to rise again after they had fallen. Now, in verse 15, the Lord says, Now I'm glad for your sakes that I was not there to the intent that ye may believe. Nevertheless, let us go unto him. And those of you who have looked at the word believe uh, in the Gospel of John, you'll find it recorded 97 times. And we read at the end of um, that chapter, John chapter uh, 20, um, yes, that the purpose of John's Gospel and the purpose for the eight signs that he highlighted was that people might come to belief and on the basis of their belief, achieve life. So here's our Lord Jesus Christ um, now wanting them to understand the whole purpose of how he responded to the death of Lazarus was so that they might come to faith. You know that the word faith and belief is exactly the same Greek word. So every time you read faith uh, or believe, belief is the same Greek word this. So Thomas's response is in verse 16. Actually, I just missed one. Uh, okay, so sorry. I just want to step back. The verse um, 16, isn't it? Okay, so we're here. I just wanted to, um, uh, and I thought I had missed this. Oops. It is verse 16. Thomas, which is called Didymus. So the word Didymus means a twin. And uh, I don't know if you've thought about who Thomas's twin is. He does have a twin in the scripture, and we're going to meet Thomas's twin uh, towards the end of our remarks. So Thomas, whose name means the twin, said to his fellow disciples, let us also go that we may die with him. Now, Thomas was no coward. Thomas was not a person who you would say was uncertain about his commitment to Christ and his preparedness to die. If that was what journeying to Judea to rescue Lazarus would, would, um, would mean for the Lord and for them all, he not only was prepared to die with the Lord if that was the outcome, here he is exhorting his fellow disciples. Come on, brethren. Yes, we are facing death, but the Lord said we're going. Let's 
rise and go, and if death is the outcome, we die with him. What an amazing man Thomas was. A man when he was certain, was certain and loyal to death. So we must not think that people that come to moments of doubt are people that don't have, when they have conviction, courage on the basis of their conviction. But their courage is on the basis of conviction. And Thomas here was absolutely certain that the master was in absolute control and having called them to go, Thomas was prepared to go even to death if that was what was required. So it is important for us to understand that Thomas was not one of those people we sometimes call him doubting Thomas or Thomas the doubtful as though he wasn't a genuine disciple of Christ. When he was certain, he was so committed to the truth. Of course, our Lord Jesus Christ here gave himself the title in verse 25, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever lives and believes in me shall never die. Those words that the Lord spoke to Martha. And we're going to uh, consider the story of resurrection and how Thomas is involved in the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. It's the basis of life, anastasis and zoe. There's the process of resurrection. I am the one that will raise the dead to life, and I am the one that's going to grant life, divine life, egyro, elevation to immortality. I'm the one. I'm the anastasis and the zoe. Thomas is going to come to absolute concrete belief that that statement was true despite the fact that our Lord himself would die. So we come to John 14, and we come to the discussion that the Lord had with his disciples in the upper, well, not in the upper room, after the Last Supper and the continuation of this, this discussion. Well, actually, it is in the upper room because in verse 31 of chapter 14, then they arise and leave the upper room, and from chapter 15 onwards, that discussion happens uh, on the way to the Garden of Gethsemane. So apologies for um, slipping up there. So we're still in the upper room, a discussion that continues uh, during the Last Supper, or after the Supper, but in the upper room. So the Lord in um, verse 1 is at pains to prepare them for what is coming. And he says to them, I don't want your heart to be troubled. And he knew that they were going to eng be engulfed in a storm that would test their faith. You believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many abiding places. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. Now, we know John's language. We understand the language that John is using. And, of course, the language of our Lord Jesus Christ uh, through John's gospel, inspired as it is, takes us right back to Numbers chapter 10, because here is the basis of the Lord's discussion about where he's going and why. So if you want to leave a finger in John 14, we'll come to uh, Numbers chapter 10. Now, we know that the ark represents our Lord Jesus Christ. We're not going to uh, go into the basis upon which we uh, understand the type of uh, that ark, which represented our Lord Jesus Christ, but um, it represents our Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, our Lord Jesus Christ's mortality was a, a timber structure and it was clothed with uh, um, or um, uh, uh, it was covered with gold, the gold of faith, and within it were the things that uh, summarised his life. He was obedient, and so we have the Ten Commandments inside that ark. He was perfectly obedient. Inside that ark, we had Aaron's rod that budded, and that was the symbol of the Lord Jesus Christ as the divinely appointed high priest, and that was signified by Yahweh when that um, almond blossom um, brought forth fruit as well. Our Lord Jesus Christ, by his resurrection, would become Yahweh's appointed high priest. And the manna, which was the incorruptible manna, was our Lord Jesus Christ, who achieved divine nature. 
He was incorruptible and it was placed in the ark. And those three things characterized our Lord's mortality. And he was going to go to a place where he would become the mercy seat. And that mercy seat, of course, was his place in the heavens, not the heavens, not the holy places made with hands, but into heaven itself there to intercede on our behalf. And out of that would be born the development of the cherubim, the saints in glory as themselves being born out of the Lord Jesus Christ, Christ's manifestations of him. And there's a picture of the kingdom. So here's our Lord Jesus Christ as the ark, a promise of the future glory of the saints in Christ. And in verse 33 of Numbers 10, they departed from the Mount of Yahweh. Now listen, three days journey. Three days. He was going to be gone for three days. And where was he going? He was going to prepare a place for them. And, of course, that was going to be secured in the three days he would be absent from them. And the Ark of the Covenant of Yahweh went before them in the three days journey to search out a resting place for them. Hebrew word is exactly the same word as an abiding place. The Hebrew word Menachar, a place of abode, a place of dwelling. And this, of course, we see from uh, verse 35 and 36, foreshadowed in verse 35, when the ark set forward the victory of Yahweh over his enemies. This is Genesis 3.15. This is Hebrews 2.14. And when it rested and it had accomplished its mission, Yahweh was going to return to the families of Israel and abide with them. Revelation 21, God will be with them. Tabernacle language, the tabernacle of God will be with men and he will dwell with them and he will be their God and they will be his people. And this is where the Lord was going. And for three days, he was going to secure a place for them, an abiding place with the Father. It's a picture of the kingdom and a beautiful foreshadowing of the words that the Lord summarizes in John 14. Of course, the disciples may not have understood this at the time, but this is one of the scriptures that the Lord would have expounded to them, which we'll consider also at the end of our study when he went back to the scriptures and spoke to them and expounded to them all of the things that were written concerning himself. So we come back to, hopefully you've left a marker, but that's okay. We'll come back to John chapter uh, 20. Oh, sorry, we're in John 14, I beg your pardon. Now, Thomas, um, uh, in, in verse, um, uh, sorry, let's just finish. So we, we finished in, in verse um, 3. So the Lord says in verse 4, John 14, Whither I go ye know, and the way ye know. So the Lord expected them from the discussions that he had had with them, for them to understand this. Whether they did or not, uh, Thomas obviously didn't fully understand. He didn't know why the Lord was going to depart for three days and come again and where he was going and for what reason. And that's why in verse 5, Thomas says to him, Lord, we know not whither thou goest, and how can we know the way? And here's Thomas. Well, you know, the Thomases in our group, when we have discussions like these, when the speaker stands up and says, of course, brethren and sisters, we all know X, Y, and Z. And one brother gets up and says, no, I'm sorry, I don't actually know. None of us want to be that person, but very often we are that person, but we don't want to actually own up to say, Lord, I know that it should be obvious, and I know that we should all know this, but I don't. Please explain. And we sometimes think, oh, those people are just <laughs> a nuisance to have around. Very often the questions they ask are on behalf of all of us, and we are thankful, silently thankful, that they ask the question so that we can be given more explanation. Thomas is not a person that is just a nuisance in asking persistent questions. Thomas is a person that wants to be certain. He wants to know. He doesn't want to just be a person that just coasts along in the truth 
and thinks, okay, so we're all supposed to know this stuff, that's fine. Lesson number two, lesson number three, that's fine. And gets to the examination. Oh, how do you answer these questions? And we should be thankful in moments of crisis, particularly you think of an airline pilot and the, you know, one engine has died or you think of a, a surgeon who's performing heart surgery. Wouldn't you want in that situation a person like Thomas who has actually stopped to make sure that he's got all of the necessary pieces of information so that when that exam comes or that crisis comes, he is on solid ground and he knows what to do. That's Thomas. He's not a man that just doubts for doubt's sake. He's not a, a protagonist. He's not a devil's advocate. He has genuine questions and he wants to be certain. And it is a good attitude to have. It is a great attitude to have. And we commend Thomas for what he has uh, said in, in that question because the Lord Jesus Christ gives a beautiful response to Thomas's question. We don't know where you're going, so how can we know the way? And the Lord says, how often do we quote this? This is an answer to Thomas's question, a beautiful scripture, a comforting scripture. It was an answer to a question that Thomas asked. Jesus said, I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. Follow me. Trust me. Give your life to me and I'll lead you to the Father. That's <laughs> tabernacle language, isn't it? It's outer court. It's holy place. It's most holy place. The way is the outer court. It's the way by cleansing of the scriptures and baptism that we start our journey towards the Father. The truth is our life in Christ, being enlightened by the lampstand and partaking of the table of showbread with the wine and having our prayers ascend to the Father through the incense altar. And that brings us to the veil where there is life eternal, where there is the kingdom and where there is eternal fellowship with the Father, still in tabernacle language. And what a beautiful thing to know that the Lord was confirming in answering Thomas's question. You can trust me. You follow me. You believe me. You give your life to me, and I will give my life to you, and I will bring you to the Father. If you'd known me, you would have known my Father. Verse, um, verse 7, and from henceforth ye know him and you've seen him. And Philip says, Lord, if you could just show us the Father, that would suffice us. We would not need to see anything else. Just show us the Father. And Jesus said to him, haven't I been so long time with you and yet hast thou not known me, Philip? He that has seen me has seen the Father. How sayest thou then, show us the Father? And, you know, in that, uh, in that expression, and the Lord goes on in a similar vein, he wants them to understand the principles of God manifestation and that the father that the Lord was going to lead them to was perfectly manifested in the son that they had seen. And we're going to come to see that of all of the apostles, Thomas understood the principles of God being manifest in Christ. We'll see that in his exclamation. Uh, when our Lord appeared to him. I am, he says, he that has seen me has seen the Father. I am the perfect manifestation of the Father. Believest thou not that I am in the Father and the Father in me? The words that I speak to you, they're not my words, but my Father which dwells in me, he does the works. Believe me, I am in the Father. The Father is in me, or believe me for the very works sake. Thomas understood that. And he could see that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself. So we know the story of the resurrection. We're not going to go through the details um, of the actual resurrection and the visitations, but I just want you to come to one reference, and it's actually in Luke 24 and verse 38. On the first visitation of the Lord to the uh, to the apostles, uh, Luke twenty four 
and verse 38. Um, so when the Lord revealed himself to, to, the, uh, to the apostles in the upper room, verse 36, they were affrighted, verse 37, and they supposed that he had been a spirit. And he said to them, why are ye troubled and why do thoughts arise in your hearts? Now, that word thoughts, the alogismos in the Greek, we get our English word dialogue from that word. It actually can mean doubtful disputations. So Thomas wasn't the only one that doubted. And therefore, we have that expression in Acts chapter 1, that the Lord <laughs> appeared to them and he provided for them many infallible proofs until they came to really believe that it was him. And, of course, he says in verse 39, look, handle me and see, for a spirit hath not material flesh and bones as ye see me have. And so it was not easy for them to actually believe that the Lord was physically risen. This We read this and we're so familiar with the record, we would not be able to, I don't think, really appreciate how these men, having experienced the disorientation of their hopes and dreams being completely dashed. Actually, just come to... Uh, to the Lord's, uh, let me just find, I thought I had it in my notes. Okay, now that it's coming. So I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna miss this, um, this little point. But just the disorientation of an unexpected event, which was the Lord's rejection and crucifixion, a public event that happened at a religious festival, the religious festival. It'd be like, so we're having the Bible school. It'd be like during the Bible school, a brother is dragged in, in, into our a brother who's at the Bible school is dragged in front of us and paraded as a criminal and convicted by all of us and is executed out there on the oval on a cross while the Bible school's in progress. Like it would be a traumatic event, a terrifying event, apart from the fact that the disciples would have been totally decimated by this trauma and this unexpected event. And it's only three days, and he's appearing in the midst of them, risen from the dead and in divine nature. Like, what words? When had ever this happened in the history of mankind? This was an incredible event. It took them some time. He even ate food to prove to them that he wasn't a ghost, that they weren't dreaming. So if we just come to... Um, John chapter 20. Are we are no, yeah. Come back to John chapter 20. Because John records the first visitation of the Lord as well. And it's in uh, verse 19 onwards when our Lord appeared to them, the doors being shut. There he is. <laughs> he doesn't open the door and comes in. They're in a room. They're fearful because the Jews who had murdered Jesus. And the Lord had rescued the, uh, the 11 from the Jews who would have taken them and they would have all met the same fate. So they're in fear. Doors are shut, locked and barred. And all of a sudden, there he is. He just appears in the middle of the room. Peace be unto you. Because Thomas wasn't there in verse 24. Thomas, one of the 12 called Didymus, was not with them when Jesus came. Thomas was not there. And why wasn't he there? Just come to Luke chapter 18. And this is the prophecy that Jesus gave concerning what would happen to him. Luke 18 and verse 31. Then took he then he took unto him the twelve and said to them, Behold, we go up to Jerusalem. And all things that are written by the prophets concerning the Son of Man shall be accomplished. He'll be delivered to the Gentiles, be mocked, spitefully entreated, spitted on, they will scourge him, they will put him to death, and the third day he will rise again. 
And Luke says, they understood none of these things. This saying was hid from them, neither knew they the things which were spoken. And Luke tells us why. In Luke 19 and verse 11, as, and as they heard these things that Jesus was spoke, speaking, he had to actually add something in to his discussion. He added and spake a parable because he was nigh to Jerusalem and because they thought that the kingdom of God should immediately appear. They had made a mistake. Their expectations were not based on an understanding of Bible prophecy. The Lord gave them an amazingly detailed prophecy. If you're taking notes, Matthew 20 and verse 18 to 19, we have more detail. We have six things in the prophecy. Betrayed is the first one. He will be betrayed to the chief priest. This is Matthew 20, verses 18 to 19. They will condemn him to death, deliver him to the Gentiles, mock, scourge, crucify, and the third day he will rise again. And they were so fixed on an expectation that the kingdom of God was about to appear and that that's what was going to happen as the Lord entered into Jerusalem, they missed a critical Bible prophecy. And we can be the same, brothers and sisters, and that's why Bible prophecy is important that we understand. Otherwise, events can happen that can spin us out of control. That's where the focus should have been. But Thomas was looking at things from a natural perspective. Having not understood because of a wrong understanding of the Lord's purpose and mission of his entry into Jerusalem, because he didn't understand the things that were written by the prophets that the Lord had spent three and a half years teaching them. And he probably concluded, as you would conclude, well, Yes, he's the resurrection and the life. But, I mean, he's also dead. So how can he raise anyone if he's dead? He was the way, the truth, and the life. He was going to go somewhere and prepare a place for, for them and then come again. Well, he couldn't go anywhere if he was dead. Where would he go when he was dead? And if Jesus was the king of the kingdom of God, now how could there be a kingdom now that the king of the kingdom was dead? And if we reason like that, brothers and sisters, when five of the six prophecies had been fulfilled to the very letter, we will also doubt. Just come to Luke 24 and the Lord's words to the two on the road to Emmaus. You know these words very well. And the Lord extended this discussion. Uh, sorry, that slide also relates to the previous um, discussion, but that's fine. In Luke 24, I'm oh, really getting this out of control. So, so if you give me uh, marks for presentation, that's a fail. Uh, never mind. So Luke 24, verse 25, and you know this. Here's how the Lord addressed the two on the road to Emmaus as he was talking to them about the scriptures that they should have known. He said, fools. Fancy being called a fool. And slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Ought not Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory? They were the keys of the kingdom that he gave to Peter and to them all. And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expanded unto them in all the scriptures, the things concerning himself. How important is it for us to be Bible students and to know Bible prophecy? It is important. And we are blessed to have brethren, as we've experienced at this camp, like our brother Dan, who can help us by taking us to the scriptures and helping us to see the word of God vindicated. That's where our faith is solidly founded. But Thomas, of course, we go back to John chapter 20, was not there. 
And there's a powerful lesson for us, brothers and sisters, in his absence. Because if we stay away from the ecclesia, we will always miss something. Look at what Thomas missed. So the other disciples, verse 25, therefore said to him, they went and found him. And what a wonderful thing it is for these disciples to know that he was missing. And so should we, brothers and sisters, when we come to the meeting, we should know that someone's missing and that someone needs probably some encouragement to come back to the meeting. And his fellow disciples went and found him and they found the state that he was in. And they said, Thomas, you should have been at the meeting. We've seen the Lord. And the Lord is always at the meeting, brothers and sisters. And when we're at the meeting, our Lord who stands in the midst of the ecclesia, where two or three are gathered, can convince the gainsayers, can resolve all doubts, he can speak through even the most incapable speaker or reader or presiding brother or organist, or organist who leads us in worship and praise to dispel our, doubt, our doubts and to convince us that there is a Lord and that he is coming and that he has prepared a place for us and that he will come again, that where he is, we may be with him also. But he said, he said, except I shall see in his hands the print of the nails and put my finger into the print of the nails and thrust my hands into his side, not, not, I will believe. And the expression he said is in the imperfect tense in the Greek, which means he kept on saying, and you can imagine this discussion as the apostles were saying, Thomas, we've seen the Lord. I've told you and I'll tell you again for the 50th time, unless, and he kept on saying, and in the double negative, not, not, I will believe. And, you know, brothers and sisters, he was just crying out for a reason to believe. Whether he knew it or not, his Lord had heard his words because the Lord always does. And he repeated those words back to him. And the Lord would do that in life, brothers and sisters. We'll have doubts and questions and the Lord will answer them. We might pick up a book and read it. Someone might speak to us. We might come and hear a study. He hears everything we say. And he repeated it back to Thomas in exact word for word verbatim in verse 27. But thankfully in verse 26, they managed to get Thomas back to the meeting. What a wonderful thing that he was there with them. After eight days, Again, his disciples were with him. And isn't it beautiful to read? And Thomas with them. What a beautiful thing when a brother or a sister can be recovered from their position of doubt and they be brought back to the place where the Lord can work. And the Lord did work, brothers and sisters. The doors were still shut and there he was. And the first person he addressed was Thomas because he can leave the 90 and 9 and seek to save the lost. And the first thing he does after he addresses them, peace be unto you, he said to Thomas, verbatim, reach hither thy finger, behold my hands, reach hither thy hand, thrust it into my side, and don't be faithless but believing. There is evidence, brothers and sisters, God does not require blind faith. But we need to reach out and touch the evidence for ourselves. And Thomas was given that opportunity. And look at his response. Verse 28. He could see in the master, God manifest, my Lord 
and my God. He understood John 14, absolutely understood it. The Father is in me and I am in the Father. He that has seen me has seen the Father. And look at his amazing exclamation. He addressed his master and his master's father, his God, my Lord and my God. Now let me introduce you to his twin. Let's come back to Zechariah chapter 13. And this is a story that um, I'm not going to uh, um, outline. I'm sure you have a picture of this scene as much as I do when our Lord Jesus Christ manifests himself to his people Israel who till this day are in blindness of Messiah because they did not get the Messiah that they expected. They are expecting a Messiah that will establish the kingdom. They did not have the keys to the kingdom. They did not understand the purpose for which Messiah came. And Isaiah 53 is a script of what they will say when they finally are converted and finally see that he was bruised for our iniquities. And the chastisement of his peace is upon us and by his stripes we are healed. And how are they going to know that, brothers and sisters? Because they'll see the same as what Thomas saw. And when they see Messiah, one will say unto him, what are these wounds in thine hands? And he will answer those with which I was wounded in the house of my friends. Those marks are there to confirm that our Lord who was crucified is our Lord who was risen. And what would the effect of that be, brothers and sisters? Just come back to, and young people, come back to Zechariah chapter 12 and verse 10. Yahweh will pour upon the house of David and upon the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and of supplications. And here's Yahweh speaking. So let's not mistake this. Yahweh says, they will look upon me whom they have pierced and mourn for him, my Lord and my God. They will understand that God was in Christ and that the Father and Son went both of them together and that God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself and that will be the moment of their conversion. Here's Thomas's twin. And they will mourn as one mourns for his only son and be in bitterness for him as one that is in bitterness for his firstborn. That's the conversion of Thomas's twin. And when we come to um, John 21, Here's Thomas back in the meeting, back in the ecclesia, a restored brother. John 21 and verse 2. There were together Simon, Peter, and Thomas, called Didymus. And Peter always is the per person that is first in all of the lists of the apostles, and this is no exception but we don't read Peter, James, and John or Peter, James, and John and Andrew. It's Thomas called Didymus. He's there. He's in the ecclesia. Acts 1 verse 13, he's there again. This is in the ecclesia that we described earlier as the ecclesia gathered together in the upper room. Here's Thomas amongst the apostles in Acts 1 verse 13, a wonderful restoration. And Jesus said to Thomas, just come back to John 20. And these words are for us, brothers and sisters, words of our Lord Jesus Christ spoken to Thomas and spoken in the hearing of the apostles. Jesus said to Thomas, Thomas, because you've seen me, you've believed. Blessed are they that have not seen and yet have believed. And that belief 
comes, brothers and sisters, from the word of God, which we have come to consider this weekend. That's where faith comes. That's where Thomas had gone wrong. It wasn't just the events that happened. He lost his footing. He doubted because he took his mind off Bible prophecy, off the words of the prophets, of the words of the Lord Jesus Christ. They were given words which were vindicated and validated by their fulfilment, and they are there to build faith. And that's why we, who having not seen our Lord Jesus Christ, can come to the same belief as Thomas. If we have faced a personal crisis, family or ecclesial crisis, a world crisis maybe that has rocked our faith, doubt can grow. And the total devotion we once had to the truth can just totally vanish. It can happen. It does happen, sadly. And if unchecked, it can affect our relationship with God, our relationship with others, our marriage, our family, our ecclesia. It can stop us from coming to the meeting. It can stop us from reading the scriptures. It can drain every drop of oil in our vessel. Doubts will always come. But God does not expect blind faith. And Israel in the land is as sure and certain a sign for us that the Lord is risen because he is presiding over the very resurrection of that nation, just like he worked in the life of Thomas to dispel his doubts and to lead him to faith. And that's how Ezekiel 39 finishes with a conversion of a nation and the whole world will know that God is the God of Israel. So as we bring our studies to a conclusion, we have looked at discipleship, have we not? And we remember the words of our Lord Jesus Christ, our master who said to us, if any man come to me and hate not his father and mother and wife and children and brethren and sisters, yea, in his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. Jesus has to be everything. And he has to be above everything if we want to be his disciple. And whosoever does not bear his cross and place himself behind me cannot be my disciple. They're the keys of the kingdom. No strange thing happens to us when we suffer for Christ's name. It's not a reason to think that he's not there. It's a reason to believe that he is there. Because that's the path he trod. And if we come behind him and follow his steps, he will lead us along the same path of suffering before the glory, the cross before the crown. So likewise, whosoever he be of you that forsaketh not all that he hath cannot be my disciple. And we come to examine ourselves, brothers and sisters, because the call of the master that he gave to those disciples and apostles that followed him is the call that he makes to us. And that and much more is encompassed in those words when he reached out his hand and said, Come, follow me. Thank you for joining us. We hope you found the episode helpful. Don't forget, 
Most of these episodes are also available as videos on our video channel, cdvideo.org. So head over and take a look. If you have any comments or questions or suggestions, please get in touch or leave us a voice message. We love to hear your feedback. You can email us at btf at cdvideo.org. If you enjoyed the episode, then please share it with others. Until next time, may God bless you in your studies and your walk towards God's kingdom. Amen.